This is Audible. Tantor Audio, a division of recorded books, presents Cry Wolf by Charlie Itara. Narrated by Eric Bloomquist. We are not the same persons this year as last, nor are those we love. It is a happy chance if we, changing, continue to love a changed person. W. Somerset Mom. Prologue There should be a word for it. That feeling of sitting across from someone you'd thought you'd never see again. The specific scramble your brain made to pull memories that had already let fade and align them with the real thing. Wondering if time had transformed your perceptions, or if you'd never actually seen the real them at all. Cooper Dayton leaned back in his chair, arranging his hands on the smooth, sterile table, the perfect picture of relaxation. Across from him, Dr. Emily Freeman mirrored his position and continued to say nothing. For someone who had voluntarily surrendered herself into custody and demanded to speak to Cooper, and Cooper alone, she was being awfully quiet. I feel like we should be playing chess or eating fava beans, Cooper said. Isn't that how these dramatic interrogations between arch nemeses go? I'm not your enemy, Mr. Dayton. I want to help you. Cooper smiled pleasantly. That's funny. I just got back from this whole counseling retreat thing. Long story. The point being, I'm fully on board with the getting help thing now. Less sure on how you can do that for me, though. He shrugged, and his clothes felt sticky and damp. Although it had still been morning when he'd made his way over to the trust, the swamp air of D.C. in July was operating at full blast. That, and he'd been... nervous. Cooper glanced compulsively past Freeman at the two-way glass where he knew his partner, Oliver Park, and their boss, trust director Margaret Cola, were watching them. At least he hoped they were watching and not fighting. Again. It had been a solid week of arguments over whether Cooper should agree to Freeman's request to meet. Cola didn't see the downside. Park disagreed. I'm not saying he never talks to her. I'm just saying we need more information first. Freeman had gone from quirky witness to vulnerable victim to cold-hearted accomplice who'd spent four months on the run with a pocket full of biological samples ripped right out of a dead man's mouth. You had to admit, the woman had range. It didn't surprise Cooper that this request to meet with him was making Park nervous. We have no idea what she's been up to or what she wants now. In the end, Cooper had decided he didn't want to wait, and though Park had furrowed his brow, he'd held his tongue because he respected that it was Cooper's choice. Too bad. Having a little more information in his back pocket was sounding pretty good right about now. Yes, Maudit Falls, I heard all about that, Freeman was saying. Another pretty feather in your cap. You're really building quite the reputation for yourself. Is that what you want to talk to me about? My reputation? In a way. She leaned closer, walking her thin, pale hands across the table, like pink spiders. Someone's got a crush on you. She said in that up-and-down, sing-songy voice reserved for children and serial killers on primetime TV. Cooper laughed. He couldn't help it. My condolences. Who is it? You? Freeman shook her head, looking vaguely disgusted. Someone very interested in the work you're doing. The potential you've shown. Someone with big plans for you. And how do you fit into these plans? Me? Not at all. She shifted in her seat. Just consider me a good Samaritan. Okay, thanks, but why the sudden change of heart? I thought you had plans of your own. The next big scientific breakthrough? The woman who discovered werewolves? We both know I was never going to be allowed to do that. And it's not a particularly pleasant life... 
being the fox in the hunt, followed by a pack of dogs. She paused, studying him for a reaction. Cooper kept his face amused. Skeptical, a little bored, and Freeman's eyes narrowed. But I'm not the only one at this table being hunted. And the enemy of mine enemy is your friend, or a bargaining chip. Her expression turned serious. Intent. I'll tell you who's coming for you, but I want the hunt called off. I want out with time served. Time served? Cooper repeated. You haven't even been tried yet. True. But I will soon enough. And what exactly will the charges be? She tilted her head. Making a false statement? Breaking and entering? Accomplice to several murders? Stealing samples off a dead man? Cooper suggested. Stealing samples of a dead man? I wasn't an accomplice, Mr. Dayton, Freeman said in a painstakingly patient voice. Marcus Park murdered those poor people, including my own beloved husband. Then he intimidated me into lying for him. An honest-to-God werewolf? What was I supposed to do? I was terrified, and I made a mistake I'll have to live with for the rest of my life. She paused. But there is a saying I believe in very strongly. From the greatest mistakes come the greatest discoveries. I've discovered wolves aren't something to be frightened of. I've discovered the woman I really want to be. She smiled at him. See, I'll get less than two years. All right, Cooper said. Let's say that's true. Then what do you need me for? It's what happens after that worries me, Freeman said. If I've learned anything about these creatures, it's that they're a network of information and rumors. I'm safer in here than out there. Why else do you think I turned myself in? She smiled. But when I get out, I want protection, a new identity. And will Dr. Beeman make a miraculous werewolf discovery three years from now? How do you expect me to do that with your furry friend strategically placed in every profession across the globe, poised to efficiently silence any whisper of their existence? This time Cooper couldn't help the flicker of surprise that crossed his face, and Freeman noted it with interest. You really don't know very much at all about the creatures you're in bed with, do you? Why do you think they like to keep you in the dark? A whole new life is a big ask, Cooper said, ignoring that. They've done it before. They can do it for me, too. But I'm guessing you don't know about that, either. Since I'm so clueless, maybe you should talk to someone higher up the food chain. Ignorance and influence are rarely as unrelated as they should be. You have a lot more power than you think. I'm not the only one who's noticed. Freeman sat back in her chair and let her eyes drift shut, as if already dismissing him. You don't realize the danger you're in, Mr. Dayton. But when you do, come back and see me. I'd love to talk. Chapter One Three Months Later There were more werewolves here than he'd expected. More vampires, too. Even a simply sheeted ghost or two among the more contemporary or clever costumes. Apparently, there was still an appreciation for the classics at Halloween. Cooper Dayton leaned back against the outdoor cafe table as another mob of screeching, giggling children swarmed past. The National Zoo in D.C. was hosting its annual holiday event, inviting guests to stay past regular hours, don costumes, sing spooky songs, and roam the decorated paths between animal exhibits and treat stations. Off the top of his head, Cooper could not imagine a place he'd less like to be. Fortunately, his own costumed niece, 11-year-old Kayla, seemed similarly skeptical of the proceedings. They'd managed to avoid the carousel, and Cooper shuddered. Kid Karaoke Station. 
in favor of the quieter areas where Kayla could point out various animals to Cooper and tell him everything she knew about them. What she knew turned out to be a lot. She'd known the exhibits like the back of her hand ever since her mother, Sophie, an expert in all things reptilian, had been asked on as a temporary consultant for some kind of conservation video series the zoo was developing. Meanwhile, Cooper's brother Dean had left his old job and started working from home, so he and the animal enthusiastic Kayla would drive to D.C. with Sophie once a week to spend the day at the zoo together. They tried to convince Cooper to come along many times, but it was Cooper's father, Ed Dayton, who had shown up at the house this morning, insisting that the whole family was going in costume, and if Cooper didn't pin this sunflower to his head and join them for boo at the zoo, he would break Kayla's heart. More like coo at the zoo, Cooper thought, pulling off the too tight headband with the big plastic flower hot glued to the top as his father waded through a particularly contentious pileup of children with ease. Ed sat on the bench next to Cooper, sighing heavily in the way of old, tired men, and people who had just stood in line for a cup of zoo ice cream so small it was finished by the time you made it back to your table. Ed was both, and Cooper felt the brief, alarmed pang of recognizing your parent as mortal and unfamiliar. Ed had changed a lot while Cooper wasn't looking. To be fair, Cooper had purposefully and determinedly spent many years not looking. He didn't know the soft, slow-moving man with a hint of ice cream in his gray mustache and half a dozen ping-pong balls glued to his t-shirt to represent butterfly eggs. The stage of the metamorphosis cycle Kayla had assigned him for their themed family costume. It was an unheard-of display of playfulness. When Cooper was a kid, his mother already dying, Ed had sent him and his brother out in whatever they could find in the house and use without destroying. More than one year, Dean had thrown a sheet they weren't allowed to cut holes in over Cooper and left him to stumble around the neighborhood alone while Dean hung out with friends. Now, Ed handed him a small cup of melting ice cream. They didn't have your favorite. Cooper blinked at the unexpected offering and tried to remember ever having a favorite flavor. He supposed he must have as a little boy. It was strange what you remembered and what you didn't. Stranger still, the things your parents held on to as critically important information, and what they let fall away as bygones, ghosts of the past. Too bad your Oliver couldn't make it, Ed said for possibly the eleventh time that hour. Dad, Cooper sighed, I told you, he's out of town. Maybe if you'd called ahead like a normal person instead of banging down the... Ed held up his hands in the universal... I don't want to fight, but I'm also about to say something that's going to piss you off, Jester. Did I say that? I just think it'd be nice for your family to get to know him before the big day. Oh my god. Cooper muttered under his breath and shoved a spoon of melty vanilla ice cream into his mouth. Truthfully, he was grateful Park was currently visiting his own family's estate. He should not have to be subjected to this forced bonding experience that Cooper was beginning to suspect hadn't been Kayla's idea at all. Ed's attitude toward Park was difficult to figure out. When they first met in the midst of a murder case last year, Ed had liked Park a lot. The revelation that he and Cooper were dating was equally positive and honestly went a long way toward soothing some age-old tensions between Cooper and his father. The revelation that Park was a werewolf, that werewolves were indeed a thing, at all, had been a bit more challenging. Maybe Cooper was a little to blame for that. He'd done his best to keep Park and Ed's interactions to a minimum ever since the big revelation, running interference at Dean and Sophie's wedding so that they could only interact at the most superficial level, and only agreeing to a handful of short dinners in the last year. At all of them, he'd enlisted the help of Dean and Sophie as buffers, the two got along fine with Park and seemed to have just rolled with the existence of a supposedly mythical being. But Ed had struggled. He wasn't antagonistic at all. Rather, he was too interested. Wanted to be too involved. Wanted to show he cared too much. It had gotten worse when Cooper told him he and Park were engaged. Now Ed typically brought Park up seven to eight times during a phone call. Was Park fully recovered from his gunshot wound? Had he bought the scar ointment Ed had suggested? Did he like the smell? 
Were they going to have a catered wedding? What kind of food did Park like? Did he have any allergies? Basically asking everything about Park except the things he most wanted to know. What was being a werewolf like? What did it mean for the son whose life was dedicated to them? One way or another. In an effort to dissuade the questions, Cooper had started teasing rather than answering seriously. Yes, Oliver is very happy with the new house. Plus, once he's done digging out the hibernation tunnels, we'll finally be able to shift the last of these pods out of the foyer, just in time for hatching season. No, we can't drive down for dinner tonight. Do you think blood moon rituals can just be rescheduled willy-nilly? That didn't seem to be working at all if this sudden, almost desperate trip to the zoo was any indication. The only flaw in Ed's plan? Park wasn't getting back to D.C. until tomorrow. Lucky bastard. There they are. Ed waved at the rest of their crew. Dean was wrapped in some translucent green cloth to represent some kind of larvae or something. Sophie looked like she'd just walked off a runway, in a black and neon green turtleneck jumpsuit striped like a caterpillar, curls styled into two large buns. And Kayla, the main event of their little cycle, had her face painted in monarch colors, white beads popping against her braids, orange butterfly wings streaming out from under her arms. Cooper and his dad stood to join them. Don't forget your costume, Ed said, grabbing the sunflower headband. Oh, no, Cooper said with heavy sarcasm. What a loss that would have been. Kayla was very anxious you wouldn't feel included, Ed said meaningfully, and Cooper shoved the hideous thing back onto his head. Lucky for you, Oliver wasn't here after all. What was he supposed to be, my stamen? Ed flushed, shook his head, and wordlessly joined the others. Hopefully that would ward off some part questions for a little while at least. He didn't want to have to pull out the obscene pollination joke he had ready, but desperate times and all that. For the next hour, Cooper managed to avoid his father, and chatted with Kayla, which mostly consisted of listening to her read the informational placards to him at every exhibit, peppered with what he could only assume were completely made-up facts, like the beaver's incisors keep growing all his life and his favorite color is purple. That makes sense was all Cooper ever seemed required to say, and Kayla would nod as if satisfied at his gullibility. Sadly, his guard against adult conversation eventually skipped ahead to walk with Ed and Sophie, and Dean immediately fell back to join Cooper. Funny kid, Cooper offered to his brother. She's awesome, Dean said, vibrating with pride for his stepdaughter. She could be the next great zoologist if she wants, Make bonkers, discoveries, change the world, you name it. Sweet as it was, Cooper couldn't help but think of the last great zoologist he'd known and the discoveries she had wanted to use to change the world. True to her word, Dr. Freeman had maintained her stubborn silence after the trust refused to give her a deal, not even speaking to Cooper the two times he'd visited. The first month after that meeting with Cooper, Park and Cola had been on high alert for any whisper of a threat. The second month, only Park had remained vigilant, side-eyeing anyone who got close to Cooper and coming up with excuses not to leave him alone. Now, after three months without anything more dangerous than a paper cut, even Park had to agree her ominous warning act may have been nothing more than that. An act meant to manipulate him one last time. After all, who on earth would have any reason to be obsessed with Cooper, of all people? Dean nudged him out of his thoughts. What's with the look? Is my parental bliss giving you ideas? Might there be little Park Daytons in your future? Cooper snorted. I think not. One afternoon seemed far too little time to decide parenthood wasn't for you. On the other hand, it had been a long afternoon. He liked Kayla a hell of a lot but awkward Uncle Cooper was about as much energy as he could currently imagine putting into all of that. You never know, Dean said teasingly. Two years ago, I wouldn't have predicted you'd be getting married, but here we are. Big day, just around the corner. Corner? What corner? Cooper protested. We haven't even set a date yet. There's no game plan, no decisions made, no reservations booked, no guests invited, and definitely no corners approaching or otherwise but at least you're handling it well. 
Dean said brightly. Cooper shot him a look, and Dean patted his shoulder sympathetically. Listen, you've just got to start with the easy stuff. Figure out who you want there first. When you know how big an event it is, you'll know what sort of space you'll need, and that'll tell you what date to pick. Bam, wedding plan, my fee's in the mail. Cooper groaned. Who's coming is the hardest part. Well, there's us, of course. What about Oliver's family? You're going to invite them, right? I see you've been speaking with the voice I hear in my head at 3 a.m. while paralyzed with anxiety. Good, good. Dean frowned. Does his family suck? Is that why you're not up there visiting with him? He leaned closer to Cooper. Do you want me to fight someone for you? Cooper rolled his eyes. They're fine. I like most of them fine. His siblings have been really nice to me these last few months. They're partners, too. Well, they'd been cordial, anyway. Ever since he and Park had compromised and bought their weird little house on the woodsy property outside of D.C., the Park Pack had taken it as some kind of signal and accepted Cooper was here to stay. Even Park's grandmother, Helena, had called him out of the blue to extend only mildly reserved well wishes on their recent purchase of his sweet little territory. Cooper still wasn't sure what the appropriate response to that was supposed to be, but his nervous guffaws of laughter probably hadn't warmed the matriarch's heart toward him much. Of course, what Helena hadn't known then was that in a month or so, that sweet little territory was going to dramatically expand. Cooper and Park were currently in the process of finalizing the purchase of the Maudit Falls Mountain Retreat. By the end of November, the retreat would be protected from territory-hungry neighbors and could remain a sanctuary for rebel pack runaways. This was a good thing. What Cooper hadn't expected, but should have, was just how much politics was involved. After years of keeping his head down and leaving his past as the shepherd behind, Park was essentially putting himself back on the board in a big way by claiming territory directly between two powerful packs, one of which happened to be his own family and the most powerful pack on the eastern seaboard. Park wasn't just visiting his family. He was on a diplomatic mission of goodwill. It was an extremely sensitive matter. Considering that Cooper was responsible for at least two family members' arrests, both he and Park agreed he could sit this visit out. Goodwill and sensitivity were, alas, not his strong suits. It's not that I'm opposed to inviting them, Cooper finally said to Dean with relative honesty. I just don't even think they'd come. Weddings aren't really a thing for people like them. I don't know if it's really a thing for people like me, either... Sometimes I think it would be simpler to just not do it at all and pretend we did. Dean whistled. Don't tell Dad that. He's been working on his speech practically since the day you told us. Cooper stopped in his tracks, horrified. A speech? No, absolutely not. If you care about me at all, you won't let that happen. God. Dean shrugged easily. If that's what you want, I've got your back. And God knows Soph is always down for some covert sabotage. He hesitated. But... Cooper prompted. But I don't see what the big deal is, Dean said. He's proud of you. Happy, you're happy. Obsessed with Oliver, which is, yeah, annoying, but we're working on it. Honest. What's the harm in letting him do his little speech... Hell, let him say he loves you and knock the grand sum total of that rare event up to four per lifetime. He smiled sheepishly. Mmm, ignore any projecting at the end there. But you're getting married, Coop. Aren't you... Well, I mean, aren't you excited? Cooper looked away from Dean and studied his own feet as they approached the next exhibit. They'd lagged farther and farther behind as they'd spoken and the others were already disappearing down the American trail with some speed, Kayla eager to see the sea lions feeding. He wasn't sure he could explain how he felt. Not even to himself, never mind to his brother, for whom life had always been fairly, well, straightforward. But Dean was looking at him with such genuine curiosity and patience, his dark eyes so like those of their mother's, 
that Cooper had to give it a try. I'm excited to be married. I'm not excited to get married, he said finally, then shook his head. I don't know. Every time I think about it and try to settle on some kind of plan, I feel guilty. Dean looked confused. Guilty that we're doing it all for me, Cooper explained. That if it was Oliver and another... and someone else like him, they wouldn't be doing any of this at all. Because werewolves don't get married, Dean said. Keep your voice down, Cooper said, glancing around, a tad uncomfortable. But the only person around was a lone woman with a peroxide blonde buzz cut standing a good 30 feet away at the next exhibit. Even as he eyed her, she turned her back to them and walked swiftly away. I was aiming for a little more discretion, Cooper murmured, watching her disappear down the trail. But yeah, that. I know Oliver wants to be helpful, but he just keeps looking at me like, this was your idea, this is your kind's ritual, what do we do now? And I don't have a clue, because before I met him, I never once thought about it. I never once imagined this would be my life. But now this guy, who doesn't give a shit about marriage, has agreed to marry me because he loves me, so I better think of something good. I keep researching weddings, but most of the blogs and articles and goddamn mood boards aren't made for me either. No brides here. Groom's party? I don't have two friends to rub together. Choose a location significant to your relationship? Most of ours are crime scenes. Cooper realized his voice had steadily gotten louder and more panicked. He took a deep, steadying breath. Then another. Everyone wants their wedding to be perfect, Dean said gently. But they never are, and that's okay. Just make a couple of romantic gestures and keep the alcohol flowing and it will be fine. Cooper shook his head. Maybe that was true for Dean and lots of other people too. But Cooper didn't have that luxury. Whether he wanted it to or not, Park agreeing to marry him was making a statement. This is what Park was choosing instead of another wolf. A human ritual, tying him to a human. People were going to notice. People were already starting to take notice. The thought of trying to explain that to Dean was exhausting, though, so Cooper just let it go. I'm just not cut out to be the center of attention like that he said instead. Dean snorted, a loud, disbelieving sort of sound. One of these days, you're going to have to accept you're really not the shrinking wallflower you claim to be, he said mysteriously as they walked up to the next animal exhibit. Cooper frowned. What's that supposed to mean? Dean didn't answer, just buried his hands in his pockets and shook his head as if chastising himself for speaking. Seriously, Cooper added. I'm not trying to fight. What do you mean by that? Seems like a lot of people spend a lot of time bending over backward to make you happy, Coop. Dean shrugged. Maybe sometimes it'd be kinder to let them. Stunned, Cooper opened his mouth to protest, but Dean cut him off. Look, forget I said anything. You've obviously got a lot going on, and I wasn't trying to make light of that. If there's something I can do to help, just let me know. Okay? Then, to Cooper's shock, Dean reached out, pulled him into a half-hug, and ruffled his hair. But for now, try not to worry quite so much, huh? Cooper nodded, still processing, and Dean moved toward the next animal exhibit. Speak of the devil. Letting him change the subject, Cooper glanced at the informational placard and realized they had made their way to the zoo's wolf enclosure. A low metal railing indicated the end of the pavement, and a few feet past that, an extremely tall chain-link fence cordoned off the habitat itself. Nothing more than a smallish dirt hill that curved out of sight behind strategic greenery, probably disguising where the zookeepers came in and out. There were a couple of trees on the hill and some artfully placed rocks, but that was it. 
Honestly, it looked more than a little depressing for an animal whose natural territory could be more than a thousand square miles in the wild. But the morality of zoos was complicated, and frankly, Cooper didn't know nearly enough about the subject as a whole. This zoo in particular, or what had brought this specific wolf into captivity to voice an opinion one way or another. They spotted the animal of the hour quickly enough. It was hard to miss, sat somewhat daintily under the tree, watching them. It certainly looked healthy, anyway. Its pitch-black fur was almost absurdly shiny, and it looked sturdy in size and exponentially more alert than the beavers had. In fact, Cooper felt pretty confident it was studying them, making note of every small movement. It says here there should be a single female gray wolf, Dean said, reading out loud. Doesn't look gray to me, Cooper said comparing the wolf to the illustration on the placard. No, I think she's that one. Dean pointed to a second wolf that Cooper hadn't seen. It was a good deal smaller, had dirty whitish fur, and seemed super tense. Crouched down in the very back of the exhibit, practically curled up to the fence, all of her attention was focused on the black wolf. It says gray wolves can be any color, typical scientific tomfoolery, Dean went on. But it doesn't mention the big guy. He must be new. Cooper hummed an acknowledgement, but couldn't tear his eyes from the black wolf. Admittedly, he couldn't say the last time he saw a wolf that was an actual animal and not a werewolf in fur. But he didn't remember them looking this... aware. Knowing. What's wolf language for come closer and introduce yourself, please? Don't be a dick, Cooper said. What? Doesn't Oliver ever get furry around you? Sure, and miraculously, he doesn't lose the ability to understand English. I didn't say he did, Dean protested. But doesn't he, you know, communicate as a wolf, too? I mean, he's not just a human who happens to turn into a wolf a la Lon Chaney Jr., is he? He's a fully different species. I forget it. Never mind. He clicked his tongue and pitched his voice a little higher. Come here, cutie. Come here. The black wolf stood up and walked purposefully toward them, not stopping until it was directly at the fence. It sat again with an annoyed little sniff. Holy fucking shit, Dean breathed. Did I... Did I do that? Is this my Dr. Doolittle moment? I can't believe Sophie's missing my Dr. Doolittle moment. Shh, how about some Dr. Do less? Cooper said tensely. He stared at the wolf, and the wolf stared back. Up close, its eyes were a light, silvery blue. Suddenly, it winked. Beside Cooper, Dean choked. Hello, Cooper said tentatively. The wolf jerked its head to the side, as if gesturing them over. Then it stood and walked along the fence to the corner behind the brush where the employee access presumably was, and disappeared. Cooper exchanged looks with Dean. I can't believe you were giving me shit about not speaking wolf, Dean whispered. You literally just booked a date with one. Ignoring his brother, Cooper glanced around to make sure they were still alone and hopped over the short railing. Wait, you shouldn't, Dean protested. Cooper hurried along the fence in the same direction the wolf had disappeared. He scrambled through the brush, hearing Dean curse and follow behind him. About a hundred feet later, the carefully placed foliage cleared, and he found the access point to the habitat. A double door system in the fence where one door needed to be closed before the next opened in order to prevent escape. Cooper only noticed that in periphery, distracted as he was by the pile of concrete slabs outside the fencing, on top of which sat a very naked man. A very naked man Cooper had met before. Chapter 2 Eli Cooper said as Dean crashed to an astonished stop beside him. In the flesh. Eli flourished his hand and crossed his legs. 
as prim and elegant as a tea party. And the fur. And not much else, Cooper noted. Eli dipped his long, dark eyelashes in a come-hither look Cooper would not have dared try himself, even if he wasn't lounging around stark naked at a zoo. But somehow it worked on him. Cooper had forgotten how depressingly good-looking Eli was with his blue-black hair and scruff kept just long enough to look like a rakish pirate without dipping into Bunker Man territory, and his body's muscles and fat combined to look powerfully sensual. His eyes were as mischievous as Cooper remembered them when they'd met back at the Park Pack's estate after the death of Park's grandfather. But under the careful air of amusement, they flickered with exhaustion and were adorned with dark circles and crow's lines that hadn't been there before. There was a slight tremble in Eli's arms, too. And as Cooper followed them down, he noticed his fists were clenched in his lap. Undress me with your eyes any further, and you're going to hit bone, Eli said wryly. Er, so to speak. Cooper looked away and hoped the flush he felt in his cheeks wasn't too noticeable. You two know each other? Dean demanded. The thought of introducing Eli as Park's ex-lover and current active and honored member of his family's pack was laughably unappealing. Yes, we've met, Cooper answered shortly. A technically true statement, if characteristically lacking in flair, Eli said archly. Antony and Cleopatra met. Romeo and Juliet met. It's what happened after that's become the stuff of legends. This day is certainly shaping up to be a tragedy, Cooper said, so maybe you're on to something. Dean was looking between the two of them curiously. Do you work together? Well, we've both dedicated long, long hours to the betterment of man. One man in particular, so yes, I think you could say we've collaborated on a project. No, you could not say that. Cooper protested quickly. We are definitely not saying that. Eli, my brother, Dean, this is Eli. He's a friend of Oliver's. Eli twitched an eyebrow, but for once kept his mouth shut. Not that it mattered. From the expression on Dean's face, he could add one and one to get a couple just fine. So that was you back there, right? Dean asked. I mean, you were the... He gestured in the direction of the fence. You know. Eli leaned back in his hands provocatively. What's the matter? Don't you recognize me? Cutie. Ah, uh, <laughs> Dean's voice was a little higher pitched than usual, and a blush spread up his neck. Eli's smile widened. The more pressing question, Cooper said meaningfully, is what the hell are you doing here? Just dropped into town to see an old friend. Hotel's all full, Cooper said sarcastically. I was more wondering what you were doing here as in here in the zoo under cov... Fur? Eli gave him a vaguely disappointed look, which Cooper figured he deserved. Yes, I see how you might be confused, he said briskly. And I'm endlessly empathetic to it. Ask anyone and they'll say Eli is empathy personified, but this really isn't a good time, so I don't suppose you'd be a couple of dolls and tootle off back down the mountain to play with the pandas and forget this ever happened? Funny, Cooper said flatly. Now what's going on? He hesitated. Are you okay? Did... No one forced you into this, did they? Eli's expression softened slightly. No, not like that. He shifted a bit awkwardly on the concrete slab, and Dean stepped forward, taking off the long green cape that was his Halloween costume. Can I... Dean hesitated, then took another cautious step forward, holding it out an offering. Eli stared blankly at the cape, looking uncharacteristically lost for words. I'm a pupae, Dean said, then stuttered. From the metamorphosis life cycle, butterflies. That's always been my favorite stage, Eli purred, accepting the fabric. Cooper momentarily yearned for the end of his own life cycle. Anyway, he prompted. 
You're really not entitled to the private ins and outs of my life, you know, Eli said evasively, taking his time to drape the pupae costume into a sort of toga, somehow managing to look even more pretty and ethereal when he was done, like a fae they'd stumbled across who was about to ruin their lives. Entitled, no, Cooper said, but consider me curious. You know what that does to cats. Good thing their exhibit isn't close by then, Cooper countered. Eli pursed his lips. I understand you're pathologically nosy, but it really is critical that no one knows I'm here. No one. Broadcasting my affairs to every busybody and his brother who barges into my business isn't exactly conducive to that, wouldn't you agree? Cooper opened his mouth, but Dean spoke first. If it's so important no one knows you're here, why did you reveal yourself to us in the first place? Yes, I can see now that was my mistake. Eli sighed. To be brutally honest with you, I thought Cooper had recognized me. But I'm beginning to understand this whole glaring, staring, nostril flaring thing is less. I know that wolf and more of a permanent feature of his face. Dean snorted and Cooper shot him a betrayed look. Well, he's not wrong, Dean muttered defensively. Eli jerked his head to the left suddenly and stood. Someone's coming. I need to go. Wait, Cooper protested. We'll be seeing each other soon. Just buy me some time, please. Eli pleaded, already fetching a pile of clothes that had been hidden behind the concrete pile. You could have been dressed all along? Cooper asked. At the same time, Dean said, We've got this. Go. And good luck. Eli blew a quick air kiss in their general direction and hurried deeper into the brush with the long, green, shimmery fabric trailing behind him. Come on. Dean tugged Cooper in the opposite direction, toward where even human ears could hear the approach of another person by now. We need to cut them off before they can get closer and risk seeing your friend. You certainly jumped on Team Eli pretty fast, Cooper said, even as he followed quickly. Obviously, I'm Team Eli. A wolf just turned into a man and asked for our help. There couldn't be any more of a quest if he'd unfurled a scroll that said this is a quest on it, Dean hissed. Which is why I keep saying you need to get into gaming. Your literal job is helping werewolves. You have got to start being cooler than... Excuse me! Hey! You! You can't be back here! An extremely tall young white man was approaching them from down the dirt path, about twenty feet into the brush from the paved trail. He wore a zoo employee uniform of gray polo shirt tucked into unfortunate cargo pants and, more strikingly, had brown, fuzzy, pointed animal ears sticking out of his shaggy blonde surfer hair and whiskers painted on his face. Sorry, guys, but this is not open to the public. He looked between the two of them suspiciously, and then over their shoulders as if searching for other ne'er-do-wells. He had a remarkably deep voice for someone so lanky, and though the kid had to be a decade younger than them, at least, Cooper felt a bit like a teenager caught sneaking around by his dad. Dean just waved a greeting, and in the amiable, unconcerned voice of someone who didn't often experience consequences, said, Sorry, man, we got carried away following one of those wandering peacocks. Cooper hoped Eli heard that. The zoo worker was still scanning the trees and took a step closer as if to walk past them. Is anyone else? Just us. Dean cut him off. Well, us and the peacock. I've always wondered why you guys let them roam loose. Aren't you worried they'll fly away? Or wander into a wolf's den? He gestured at the exhibit. Nah, they're just big, fancy chickens, really, the man said, turning his attention safely back on Dean. If any of them ever do get brazen enough to fly straight into a predator's den, well, let's just say those aren't the ones passing any grand ideas to the next generation. Hear that, Cooper? Dean said cheerfully. I think we're politely being told to keep to the path or natural selection is going to get us. No, no. <laughs> the man laughed. Much more relaxed now. Dean had a knack for putting people at ease with his simple, easygoing nature that had both bewildered and filled Cooper with jealousy when they were kids. That's not quite how it works, not for people, anyway. The man winked at Dean. I've seen you picking up Dr. Odell before. You're her... Her husband. For now. Dean laughed. 
She might change her mind if she finds out I've forgotten my fifth grade science. I won't rat you out. We've just got to be careful, you know? Lots of kids running around today and parents who think the perfect photo op outranks safety. He looked at Cooper curiously. My bad, this is my brother, Cooper, Dean said. And sorry, remind me of your... Ryan. Ryan Basque. They all shook hands. I'm one of the curators here. That's like a head zookeeper, right? Cooper asked. Yeah. Well, kind of. I oversee a couple of the exhibits, Ryan said. He rolled his shoulders back, clearly proud. Sounds like a cool job, Cooper said, and Ryan grinned. He had a very friendly face now that it wasn't furrowed with suspicion. Beyond boyish. Puppy-like. The coolest. But I've always been in the animal business. I grew up on a farm, led tours abroad. Is this lady one of the exhibits you oversee? Dean asked, gesturing toward the wolf enclosure. Nah, not my specialty. I was just driving by when I saw you running into the woods. He reached up and tweaked one of the furry ears on his head. Ryan the lion is giving tours this afternoon. You guys want to sign up? Get to ride in the jungle cart. I don't, Dean interrupted Cooper to his dismay. Sounds great. Ryan clapped his hands together excitedly. Awesome. Get ready to take a ride on the wild side. What happened to that thing you were saying about people bending over backward to make me happy? Cooper murmured to Dean as they followed Ryan back to the paved path where a large black and white striped golf cart was parked. Just so you know, this doesn't make me happy. But complaining about it sure does. Along with helping your friend, Dean said knowingly. The path to happiness isn't always the most direct. Ryan honked the horn and a sound like an elephant's trumpet rang out. And sometimes you've got to take the zebra-striped jungle cart to get there. That evening, as Cooper was pulling down the driveway of their new house, the first thing he noticed was a waist-high rectangular box on their front porch. And here, to kick off the third act, he thought, getting out of the car, on top of the day he was already having, Cooper really should have expected this to be the day it arrived. The emblem of his and Park's interior decorating conflict. The keystone of their very healthy adult relationship compromise. A floor vase. Four umbrellas? Cooper guessed when Park had pointed it out to him at a market. No. For decoration. In the foyer. You don't like it? Over three feet tall, handmade, ceramic, and glazed in a wash of deep blues and greens, it was... pretty. And pricey. What if you lose something in there? Cooper had complained. How the hell do you get it out? It's too long and narrow, too heavy to turn upside down easily. Park had shaken his head, bewildered. What the hell are you talking about? What are you losing? Boogie? My sense of self? My core values? Eventually, Cooper had convinced Park to leave the vase behind. But the squabbling over house decor had gotten so bad that they'd established a rule that each person was allowed one non-arguable purchase every two months. To Cooper's dismay, Park had immediately and smugly doubled back for the vase, which was clearly his plan all along. That's cheating, Cooper had protested. Or is it the brilliant stroke of strategy that wins the war? Park had said, bowing with a flourish before running his hand suggestively up his thigh, frisky with victory. Check and mate. You'll be checking if you still have a mate if you keep that up. Cooper had snapped. Things had escalated pleasantly from there, and shame of shames, he had, in fact, agreed to the vase when he was feeling significantly more amenable for, uh, some reason or another. The package weighed a ton, and he nearly dropped it, wrestling into the foyer. And then did drop it when Boogie snuck up and tried to help. If it's broken, you're taking the blame, Cooper said to his cat. Boogie's expression said fat chance, and sadly, she was right. He left the vase in the box and settled down in the living room with wine and his laptop to check some emails. 
Boogie prowling for a prime position on the couch with him. It was just after eight, but he was exhausted, and though he'd never admit it, a tiny bit lonely, too. After the excitement of the day, it felt anticlimactic and strange to come back to the house alone and sit in silence with Boogie. An absurd and embarrassing thought. Park had only been gone for six days, and here was Cooper, as restless and horny and lamentful as a Tennessee Williams woman. Cooper enjoyed being alone. Even if Park was in the house, Cooper might choose to spend time by himself. But knowing Park was there, that Cooper could debrief the day, hear his opinions, intersect his orbit at whim, was, well, something he'd come to depend on. What stage of love was it when another person became a habit? How quickly had the mere background hum of another person's life become such an essential fixture of the house that its absence felt like a robbery? Like their home had been gutted, and he was left drifting around the remains with the non-valuables like giant ostentatious floor vases. Except for you, you are priceless, Cooper murmured, turning to Scratch Boogie, who purred briefly and then immediately regretted it jerking away from him sulkily. She definitely blamed him for her favorite roommate's unusual absence. He'll be back tomorrow, Cooper said ostensibly to Boogie. But hell, he needed to hear it himself. Park was coming home tomorrow after a week of successful negotiations that helped secure their future, and Cooper couldn't even settle on a season to get married in. He opened his laptop, determined to get something done. Start with who you want to be there, Dean had said. Well, okay, he could do that. Twenty minutes later, Cooper had listed his family. His old boss, Santiago. His current boss, Cola. His preteen cat sitter, Ava. And had drawn a blank. If that wasn't the bleakest dance card, he didn't know what was. A loner to his core, Cooper had always been bad at maintaining friendships but starting work for a top-secret agency dedicated to an entire world he couldn't talk about directly after experiencing a violent attack he wouldn't talk about had pretty effectively withered any lingering relationships. What he now understood to be PTSD-related drops into depression hadn't exactly helped either. It seems like a lot of people spend a lot of time bending over backward to make you happy. Dean's words had immediately rubbed Cooper the wrong way because of how long he'd been on his own, looking after himself. But things were different now. Park was determined to make him happy. Perhaps even too much so. Cooper wanted to get married, so they were getting married. Cooper suggested a compromise on the house decor, so they were compromising on the house decor. It's not that he was hoping for drama, but in moments like this, he wondered if they were supposed to be this compatible if perhaps things were a little too easy. Cooper glanced uneasily at the cupboard across the room where he'd shoved the research he'd stolen from Modded Falls. Did it count as stealing if the research was performed on him and Park without their knowledge? Or was it just taking back something that they'd never agreed to give? Regardless, after everything that happened three months ago, their engagement, Park getting shot, Freeman popping up out of the woodwork to groan, beware, like a specter of the night. Cooper had never bothered to get his alpha quotient retested and still didn't know what his actual score was. The last two times he'd taken it, he'd completely screwed up, getting impossible test results. Not exactly surprising, considering the hijinks the bastard administering the test had been getting up to at the time. Cooper's new therapist a stone-faced wolf with an almost painfully gentle voice named Dr. Rapodi, had offered to retest him when he felt ready. But so far, Cooper had rejected the idea. Frankly, he was fine never knowing. It was only times like this that, well, he worried. His go-to emotion, really. Park insisted it was fine. He was a big boy who could stand up for himself and say no, even if he did see Cooper as his alpha. He swore he was getting something out of this, too. Cooper just had no idea what. He wanted to be able to do something for Park. Something tangible. Something to make him as happy as he made Cooper. He wanted Park's family to murmur amongst themselves, that Cooper sure does bend over backward to make you happy. 
because he would for Park. He'd bend his body backward around the entire world if it made Park smile. He just didn't know how. Cooper stared at his laptop screen, heart beating just a little faster. He opened a search window and typed good alpha behavior, face flaming even as he hit enter. The first couple of links were specific to animals, and he skipped over them. Then came pages and pages of links that were geared toward people. Cooper tried one hesitantly. It listed long, detailed descriptions of what it claimed were the top traits or characteristics of an alpha. It was... rough. Intensely misogynistic, cis-sexist, heteronormative, for starters. It also didn't sound like Cooper at all. Not a worrier? Can shoot the shit? Be able to walk away from hot girls? Well, he supposed that wasn't inaccurate, per se, but it certainly wasn't relevant to his situation. He couldn't think of a single person who should be reading this, honestly. He clicked through a couple more links, growing increasingly dismayed and was just about to try new search terms when Boogie jumped off the couch top and scrambled into the arm. Cooper slammed the laptop shut, startled and guilty. Just the thought of being caught looking at one of these sites by someone... Anyone, a passing squirrel, Michael Myers, made him want to curl up and die. But he didn't hear anything. Still, Boogie's head was held alert, ears and tail twitching with concern. Her pupils were enormous and unmoving, staring toward the large picture window that faced the front yard. Cooper followed her gaze, half expecting to see someone standing, watching. But of course there was no one there. What is a killer? He whispered to Boogie. Worryingly, she didn't even react to his voice. Cooper turned off the small lamp by the couch, tipping the room into darkness. He made his way over to the window and carefully pulled back the curtain to peek outside. Nothing. Porch, driveway, yard, empty. The only movement was one of Park's two pitiful attempts at the common man's holiday decor, a hideous plastic skeleton hanging from the porch eave, shifting slightly in the wind. Cooper relaxed against the sill with a sigh. Boogie wasn't the only one having a hard time adjusting to a home outside the city. It was so quiet here, interrupted by sounds louder and more brutal than anything he'd ever heard in D.C. At least it seemed that way in their unfamiliarity. Cooper had grown up in the suburbs, but it had been almost twenty years, and he had long since forgotten the screaming, screeching sounds of the cycle of life coming to a bloody end, or a bloody beginning, just outside his window, and the way a squirrel suddenly possessed the weight and gait of a full-grown man when it found its way into your attic. They'd only been moved into the house for less than a month, and Cooper was still waking up most nights positive they were under siege, only to have Park roll over still half asleep, and identify the attackers for him. Just a fox. Same owl as last night. Come back to bed. Frogs. Yes, I'm positive. Yes, that one too. Cooper didn't remember nature being this loud. Partly it must have something to do with being in a new house he hadn't quite relaxed in yet. The numerous large windows and wood floors seemed to complain noisily whether someone was touching them or not. Relatable. And while it was nothing like the temples of greed Park had first taken him touring, the house was still too large for one man and his cat alone at night. Cooper shouldn't complain. Overall, they were both happy about some things, unhappy with others. They'd mostly landed on the place for the property. A half hour out of D.C., the house was set back from the road and nestled on the edge of an animal preserve, ensuring lots of privacy for Park to run around in fur. Cooper was the one who had championed the house itself. A unique labor of love, the realtor had called it. Some failed architect's personal testing ground, was what Park said. But the mishmash of classic styles with uh, daring new takes at modernity that had never quite taken off for undoubtedly good reasons, amused Cooper. It made the house a whole lot less architectural digest, more livable, and this time Cooper heard the noise too. 
a thud and creak from the back porch. The living room was still dark, but he could make out Boogie's silhouette on the arm of the couch. She was arching her back slightly, tail twice its usual size. Cooper made his way to the kitchen where there was a door to the outside, grabbing a poker from the fireplace as he went. Holding it up like a baseball bat, he peered out of the back door window. Again, he saw nothing. Empty porch, empty yard. The dark tree line was uninterrupted by looming figures, axe-wielding or otherwise. Carefully, he opened the door. His heart was pounding hard. He tried to remember what Dr. Rapodi had said. Is this a useful emotion? Well, if he was about to be attacked, he would never hear them coming over the sound of his own rushing blood, so no, it wasn't particularly useful. Now, what could he do to calm down? They hadn't talked about that bit yet. Cooper stepped out on the back porch, scanning the yard for any trace of movement, for any shadow that was a little too dark, a little too still. Knocked to the bottom of the porch steps was Park's second attempt at holiday decorations, a jack-o'-lantern he'd carved last week without any tools he didn't already have sprouting from his fingertips. He'd done it purely for his own amusement, as their house was too far set back from the road to actually display them. Now it had split open and its irritated expression, Parks attempted Cooper's face, he swore he was going for thoughtful, but he couldn't even get the lie out without laughing, had morphed into a gaping sort of scream. Cooper took another cautious step forward, it almost looked like something had been digging at it. Another animal? A loud, violent buzzing broke the silence, and Cooper jumped and bit his lip hard. Shit. He hastily went back inside and locked the kitchen door behind him before heading back to the living room. Boogie was nowhere to be seen. His phone vibrated again, obnoxiously loud against the low wooden coffee table. Cooper answered it, snapping. What? There was a second of silence. And here, I was thinking my fiancé might be happy to hear from me. Park's droll voice was an instant balm, as little sense as that made. Cooper let out the breath he'd been holding. Sorry, who is this? Just a hot single in your neighborhood looking to chat. You busy? Cooper snorted and put the poker down, leaning against the table. Busy pining for the lover who abandoned me. Hmm, he sounds like a fool. You can do better. Are you better? For you? I better be, Park murmured. Cooper laughed, poured himself another glass of wine, and relaxed back on the couch. Even with just the sound of Park's voice in his ear, the house felt fuller, more familiar. Speaking of finding better men in your life, Cooper filled Park in on the events at the zoo and Eli. Part of him was hoping Park would just laugh it off and say, oh, that's quintessential Eli, wait till I tell you about the dog sled story. But instead, Park sounded deeply disturbed, far more than Cooper had even anticipated. And he really didn't say anything at all about why he was there. Park questioned yet again. I told you everything, word for word. He had. What he hadn't said was just how exhausted Eli had looked, the real note of urgency in his voice when he asked them to buy him time. Look, don't mention this to your family, okay? He was really adamant about no one knowing he was there. They're his pack. They probably know more than we do. Maybe they're not anymore, Cooper suggested. Maybe he took a page out of your book and left, too. Eli wouldn't do well without a pack, Park said firmly. Yeah, he seemed to be doing super well when I last saw him wandering around naked and panicked in the zoo, Cooper said sarcastically. Maybe I'm wrong, but you said yourself it was weird he was out of town when you visited and Helena wouldn't say where. I thought it was because... Park cut off. Cooper waited. I thought maybe he heard about us getting married from the others and didn't want to see me. Park mumbled eventually. He sounded embarrassed, and Cooper wondered why. He waited a beat, hoping Park would elaborate, but he changed the subject instead. 
Everyone says congratulations, by the way. Or something like that. They don't get why we're doing it, really, but they think it's hilarious. I live to make others laugh, Cooper said wryly. How's it going up there? He listened to Park catch him up on various family gossip, relieved to hear it wasn't going nearly as badly as he feared. When his eyes started to drift closed, the pleasant rumble of Park's voice in his ear, Cooper grabbed the last of the wine, his glass into the poker, and went upstairs to their bedroom. Are you going to bed now? Park asked. Yeah, I'm beat. I'm in bed too. Park said in an odd tone, almost like Cooper was forgetting something. All right, so we're both bringing shame to our age group. Cooper set the poker up, leaning against the nightstand. I've been thinking about you a lot today, Park was saying. I wish you were here with me right now. Cooper snorted. <laughs> In your family manner? while you tell your traditional relatives all about how I'm Lady Macbething you into claiming key pack territory? With my arsenic allergy? Hard pass. I'm good here where only Boogie can judge me. All right. Then I wish I were there too. With you. Not the cat. The cat's downstairs. Is she? Cooper asked, nonplussed. He realized he hadn't seen Boogie since coming back inside when Park had called. A trickle of anxiety started down his throat. Had she followed him onto the porch somehow? She'd never shown an interest in nature before, but this was a new house, a new outside. He abandoned his wine on the nightstand and went back downstairs, turning on all the lights. He searched her favorite lounging spots, only half listening to Park now and getting increasingly tense when he didn't find her. Is something wrong? Park was asking. You sound off. Cooper flicked on the laundry room light. Finally, Boogie sat in a basket, nesting in a pile of Park's clothes, looking supremely annoyed to be disturbed. Seemed like he wasn't the only one missing their third musketeer. Cooper scratched her head, relieved. Just jumpy, I guess. Overtired. I can think of one way to relax you. Been there, drank that. What do you think I am, an amateur? Park sighed very gently, sounding almost disappointed. What, what's the matter? Cooper asked. Nothing. Park said. I'm just... I'm looking forward to seeing you tomorrow. Me too. Cooper said, and the raw honesty in his own voice made his cheeks heat. Soon after, they said their goodbyes and hung up. Cooper put the house to rest once more, went upstairs, and got ready for bed. It was near embarrassing how much more settled he felt after talking to Park. His body was warm, relaxed, and lingering on the edge of a tingling sort of awareness that could tip into simple excitement for Park's return the next evening or into full-blown arousal depending on which way he pushed it. He stripped down, watching himself absently in the bedroom's full-length mirror. A big, brass-trimmed, freestanding antique that Park had brought with him from his old place so Cooper couldn't even veto it on sight. That hadn't stopped him from proclaiming the mirror was a cursed heirloom that would kill them in their sleep, of course, though secretly he'd grown a bit... fond of it. At least it was ostentatious and useful. Cooper scratched at his belly and let the touch shift into a lazy, ticklish brush of fingertips over skin, hair. Such a simple, silly pleasure to know the one you missed missed you. Was thinking about you. Wanted to be in your bed like you wanted them in your bed. Had said so. Voice gravely with desire. Cooper froze and blinked at himself in the mirror. You fucking idiot, he said. He lunged for his phone and called back. What's wrong? Park asked immediately, voice tense. Nothing's wrong, I just... 
Cooper searched for the right words, feeling suddenly inexplicably nervous. Were you trying to start something? Something on the phone before with the I'm in bed and the wish you were here and one way to relax you stuff? Cooper winced. Hearing it all together, yeah, okay, so he'd been distracted, all right? He could practically hear Park smiling fondly. Don't worry about it. I'm not worried about it, Cooper retorted. I just... Do you still want to do something? Christ, I sound like a 10th grader. He blew out a noisy breath and sat on the upholstered bench at the end of the bed. Do you want to get each other off over the phone? Well, don't ease me into it too subtly, Park said wryly, then added, Yeah, I want to. But only if you actually want to, and not just because you think I want to. Because I'm fine. I'm fine too, you're fine, we're all fine, now that's settled, can we do the sex now? Park laughed. Okay. There was a long silence. Cooper fetched some lube and left it beside him on the bench for later. The silence continued. He checked the phone to make sure he hadn't accidentally disconnected the call with all the soundless opening and closing of his mouth he was doing. They hadn't done this before. He felt clumsy and awkward and slightly out of sync with Park in a way they hardly ever did anymore in person. The newness of it. The unfamiliarity had Cooper vacillating between excitement and self-consciousness. Are you hard? Cooper asked finally. At the same time, Park asked, Are you lying down? Then startled, added, Whoa, okay. Cooper felt his cheeks heat in a way that had nothing to do with arousal. I'm sitting, he said quickly. But I could move, if you want. Nothing fancy. I think I pulled something, lugging that artisanal vessel for your ego inside. My vase came? Park asked, sounding delighted and frustratingly adorable. How does it look? Please tell me you didn't fill it with umbrellas. I didn't even take it out. I haven't taken anything out yet. Cooper added pointedly. What honeyed words you whisper, Mr. Dayton. I can only work with what you give me here. And what is it exactly that you want me to give to you? Park teased. Your mouth? Cooper guessed doubtfully and wondered if the word mouth had always sounded unerotic or if that was a recent development. And your fingers? Am I hot or cold? Park sighed. Unfortunately, not in an, oh, Cooper, the skeptical tone you use when talking about my body really does it for me way. You've been hotter. We suck at this. We? Park repeated innocently. No individual grades on the group project, Cooper protested. They drifted into silence again, and he shifted uncomfortably, staring at himself in the mirror. He suddenly felt ridiculous. He looked ridiculous. Alone in a too big, too bright bedroom, his boxers rapidly deflating, a phone pressed to his ear. It was strange to feel so utterly, shamefully shit at this. Cooper was a grown man hurtling toward the end of his thirties. He had a varied and solid amount of sexual experience under his belt, plus a knowledge of both his and Park's sexualities and how they worked together that went deeper than any other relationship in his life thus far. And yet, somehow, there still existed unforeseen pockets of sexual bewilderment and awkwardness, waiting in the shadows to trip him up and send him spiraling flat on his face. Who knew? What are you doing right now? Be honest. Park added swiftly. Don't act like you've rigged yourself up to the headboard with a couple of dildos and a blindfold or whatever. Cooper snorted. So that's what does it for you, huh? Honestly, right now I am sitting on your bed bench thing, 
looking at myself in that big haunted mirror of yours, trying to remember if I've ever actually had sex before, and if so, did I like it? You have. You did. I did too. Park's tone was very conversational. Like they could be talking about anything. In fact, you were very good at it. So much so that sometimes it's all I can think about. The way your scent changes when you want to fuck. The way you look at me across a room. Like I belong to you. Like you know all you have to do is crook your finger and I'll come running over. Begging for it. The satisfied little grunts that turn to whimpers when you just start to lose control. The way you taste right before you come down my throat. Cooper exhaled a little shakily. In the mirror, his reflection was wide-eyed and clutching the phone now with both hands. Park still sounded completely unbothered. Sometimes I can't stop thinking about it. Like in the mornings, when I wake up before I go on my run and you're still asleep next to me. And you smell like sex. And you're making these needy little noises and rubbing against me. All I want to do is roll you over and rut into you. I think about it so much I have to get up and jerk off in the bathroom instead. I have to bite into my own hand so I don't wake you. You could do that, Cooper said. His voice cracked and he had to clear his throat. I mean, I give you my permission to fuck me awake sometime, depending. He clamped his mouth shut from adding any more qualifiers or technical concerns. This was a fantasy. If they actually wanted to experiment with any of that, they'd have a much more in-depth, clear-headed conversation about it later. Right now, Cooper's skin felt too tight. He was hyper-aware of the heat of the phone against his cheek, the prickling of sweat in the crook of his elbows, the damp brush of fabric where his cock head pushed against his boxers. But he didn't touch himself yet. Just enjoyed the slow build of pleasure as his hips started to make unconscious, abortive little twitches into space. Yeah. Would you like that? Park was sounding a bit more affected, too. It seems like you would. The way you grind up against me all night, humping my leg like a dog in heat. You're very demanding. Even when you were asleep. Did you know that? How horrible for you. It's hell. Park agreed. Someday I'm going to snap and give you what you're so clearly desperate for. Is that what you want? Yes. Cooper whispered. I want it. Tell me. It would be some early morning after we already fucked the night before. So you're still a little sweet and soft and open for me. I could put you on your side and work my fingers into you easily enough that you'd think you were still dreaming. I would let you use me how you like. Let you rock on my fingers while my other hand would stroke your body, tease you, touch you everywhere except where you need it. And when you try to reach for yourself... I'd trap your hands behind your back. Cooper made a soft, involuntary sound. Why? Because it's my turn to do whatever I want. And what I want is for you to wake up hard and wild and desperate for it when I finally work my dick all the way into your tight little hole. So far gone already that the only thing you can do is lie there and take it as I wrap my arms around your body, trap you against my chest and grind deep and slow. Yes. 
Yeah. Cooper choked. Fuck, Oliver, I need to touch yourself now. Cooper fumbled with the phone and managed to free himself. Underwear pulled awkwardly down to his thighs. He cried out softly with relief when he gripped the shaft and heard Parks answering groan and murmured encouragements to get the lube out and slick himself up, to watch himself in the mirror while he stroked. That was an unnecessary suggestion. Cooper was already watching, couldn't look away. His reflection was absolutely wanton, sprawled half on the bench, half on the bed, wild-eyed and thrusting into his fist noisily, dripping over his fingers. I can hear you. Park growled in his ear. God, you sound good. I want to stay inside you all night. Let you keep my cock warm until I feel like fucking you again and again until you're so full, you... Cooper's orgasm fell to ripped out of him. He came on himself so suddenly and intensely that his leg kicked out and then got caught hovering in the air for the millisecond his non-essential muscles all froze and tightened as one before recoiling with a ferocity that knocked him on his back and forced his hips off the bench as if trying to fuck the very sky itself. Somewhere by his shoulder, where he dropped his phone, Park made a series of guttural sounds Cooper recognized well, and he knew Park was coming too. He listened intently, still riding the aftershocks, and imagined the mess Park was probably making. Imagined how if he was there, Cooper might lick it up just to watch Park's eyes flutter back again. Maybe coax a little extra out. Eventually, Cooper's heartbeat slowed, and the last sexual edge to his thoughts dulled to nothing. He drifted into a content blankness. Enjoyed the silence and stillness of his own mind while Park caught his breath and went through his own recovery process of murmuring Cooper's name and some soft, silly affections. Fortunately, Park was familiar with Cooper's customary distancing post-orgasm and didn't push him to express tender truths or speak in full sentences at all. Just checked that he was okay. Talked him through a basic cleanup. Told him he'd see him tomorrow and said goodnight. After hanging up, Cooper crawled into the bed and, thanks to Park, dropped off into a relaxed, easy sleep, completely wiped out. So it was, of course, Park's fault, too, that he didn't hear the intruder's approach until the pillow landed on his legs. Chapter 3 Cooper sat up, grabbing the poker as he went, wielding it over his head like he'd brought a goddamn broadsword to a pillow fight. The bedroom lights were back on, and all the way across the room, lingering in the open doorway, stood Eli. What the hell are you doing here? Cooper gasped. He felt disoriented with sleep, caught between emergency mode and a dream state. His grip on the poker loosened slightly but he didn't put it down. Eli, dressed this time, thank God, leaned against the wall casually, not even seeming to notice the makeshift weapon, much less care. I did say I'd be seeing you, and yet I didn't take that to mean you would be breaking into my bedroom in the middle of the night, Cooper hissed. Darling, it's not even 11 p.m. You're embarrassing us both. That doesn't make it okay, Cooper said as he rubbed his eyes roughly forcing himself into a more alert state. This is extremely not okay. I could have been... busy. Eli pointedly eyed the poker and the bottle of wine abandoned on the nightstand. Yes, I've obviously interrupted a thrilling evening. He held up his hands defensively when Cooper started to sputter. I did knock, you know, quite loudly, and for a very long time I could clearly hear you were in here. What if you were incapacitated by some villain... Tied to a running table saw or in a glass box slowly filling with water. All while I stood outside twiddling my thumbs because of some outdated human capitalist construct of personal property. Think of the guilt I would have suffered. It would have killed me outright. How would you feel then? Pretty bad since I'm apparently also dead a la 80s spy thriller, Cooper said. But he put the poker down and didn't ask Eli to leave. Irritation losing ground fast to curiosity.
I know the hour is unconventional, but I'm in a rather time-sensitive situation. One might even say an emergency, Eli said, moving closer. He made as if to sit on the bench at the end of the bed before sniffing the air delicately, and briefly twitched a small moo of distaste. Cooper flushed an awareness of what the bench probably smelled like to a sensitive nose. That's what you get when you barge into someone's bedroom uninvited, he said, refusing to feel ashamed. Did I say anything? Eli protested. Did I even breathe a complaint? As you're living with one of us now, someone ought to teach you basic werewolf etiquette. Lesson number one. Never draw attention to others' private sense. Even when the seat your host offers you stinks like a cum rag, he added in a mutter. And for just one moment, his sharp, hyper-enunciated speech slipped into a broader rural accent. Something northern, certainly. But from where exactly, Cooper couldn't tell with so little to go on. The unexpected crack in Eli's usually controlled persona, along with all the other obvious signs of exhaustion he'd noticed that afternoon, made Cooper reluctant to kick him out. Clearly sensing weakness, Eli widened his eyes pitifully and spoke in a gentle, broken voice. Will you really turn me away? Now, in the very darkest hour of my need? Cooper sighed. Fine. You can tell me about your emergency downstairs. He made to stand up, then realized he'd already used his boxers as the cum rag in question and passed out naked. He adjusted the sheets self-consciously in his lap. Er, could you give me a minute? No need to trouble yourself, darling. This will do fine. Eli said, immediately sounding like his old self again before leaping up and over the bench in a distinctly inhuman manner to land gracefully in the bed. Cooper squawked. You can't! I'm not dressed! Werewolf etiquette lesson number two. The naked body is not inherently sexual and should never be treated as such unless explicitly invited to do so. Well, excuse the fuck out of me, Miss Manners, Cooper said. Eli adopted another absurd pout. You don't really mind, do you? Of course I'll leave if you say you do. It's just that I'm feeling awfully emotionally fragile today, and this room is so soothing with all its... Eli cast his eye around. Tarnished brass detailing and crushed velvet upholstery. Oliver decorated, Cooper murmured defensively. Mmm, yes, I rather did think I detected his reclusive Fifth Avenue heiress touch. Eli and Cooper exchanged knowing looks, and they both laughed some of the tension easing. All right, fine, stay if you're staying. What's this emergency? To be honest, I'm in a bit of a pickle. Eli faltered and fell silent. It was so out of character, Cooper didn't realize what was happening until a full minute had passed. What, uh, what sort of pickle? He prompted. Eli cleared his throat. I'm... Well, you see, I'm being blackmailed. He glanced quickly at Cooper and then away. Okay, Cooper said calmly. By who? I'm not sure I can properly explain without giving you a coveted peek into my origin story. Eli hesitated, then settled delicately into Park's spot, over the covers and sitting up against the headboard. It was awkward for Cooper to look at him like that being side by side, but from the way Eli turned his head slightly away and avoided eye contact, Cooper guessed that was intentional. You see, I was not always the sophisticated wolf about town you know and love so well. Cooper raised an eyebrow, but let that go. I believe I once told you that before the Park family took me in, I was involved with a rebel pack out west. Has Ollie told you anything else about my past? No. Cooper replied honestly. He said rebel packs are unpredictable and cruel with an obsession for submission, but that your story is yours to tell. Eli rolled his eyes. How endlessly morally superior of him. He tapped restlessly at his own thighs, and Cooper noticed his nails looked slightly longer and pointier than one would expect, and shrank then grew again, never quite fully becoming claws. 
Of course, Cooper was plenty familiar with shifts by now, but he had never seen a wolf play so delicately with her own transformation before. The degree of control necessary to keep the changes infinitesimal, never becoming fully nails or fully claws, it was almost mesmerizing. Cooper got so lost in watching he jumped a little when Eli finally spoke. I became involved with the rebels as a very young man, still a child, really. For reasons best left in the past, I was a terribly vulnerable and naive creature. Not that any child should be expected to be savvy, but I was very new to everything and desperate for connection to my own kind. The Alpha of the pack was a man named James. He found... found me. Eli stuttered slightly. I thought he was the cleverest, worldliest person I'd ever met. I practically begged him to let me join. Eli's eyes flickered, and he pulled his cell out of his pocket, swiped through it, and then showed Cooper a photo of a man clearly taken covertly at a distance. The image was zoomed in, blurry, and the man was wearing sunglasses and speaking into a phone, face half-hidden. Beyond being an older white guy with a pretty tattoo of leaves and flowers covering his bare forearm, it was hard to determine anything about him. In some ways, you could say he was the first werewolf I'd ever met. He was definitely the first alpha of a pack I'd met, Eli said. He took the phone back and studied the photo himself. The Cooper got the feeling from the speed with which he'd pulled it up that Eli already had it memorized like the back of his hand had spent hours staring at it. I was desperate to prove my worth to him, whatever it took. His expression turned wry, and he put the phone away. Of course, that went about as well as it always does. Cooper winced, Eli's words striking a little too close to home, but quickly pushed the thoughts back, not trying to steal focus. What happened? Eli looked at Cooper, assessing. I have a somewhat uncommon talent. I don't suppose Ollie has mentioned that either. Actually, Cooper said, remembering a conversation they'd had directly after meeting Eli for the first time. I think he did say something about you having valuable assets, but didn't explain what that meant. He was acting unsure, but he remembered the conversation clear as day. The exact wording had stuck in his brain because he'd been a little, uh, jealous at the time and had repeatedly wondered what said assets were, exactly. Hmm, Eli said, studying Cooper's expression. Undoubtedly, I'm equally talented at whatever you're imagining right now that's put such a dazed look on your face. But I was actually referring to one of my non-sexual gifts. Have you heard the term slipping? Cooper shook his head, and Eli explained. It's basically being able to shift specific parts of your body without triggering a full change. As I'm sure you've noticed, most wolves can slip their eyes. Eli's irises expanded so that the white disappeared. Or their claws. He flipped Cooper an excessively sharp bird. It can be intentional, instinctual, or tied to our emotions. Same as fully shifting, right? Cooper asked, oddly invigorated to be talking about this so openly. Park rarely brought it up, and Cooper didn't feel right pushing him to. But Eli seemed very comfortable talking about the subject, far more relaxed than when speaking about James. Oliver once told me that poor emotional control can lead to someone losing control of their shift as well. Eli tilted his head. That can be true, yes, but shifting is a highly individualized experience. I suppose none of us can truly know what it feels like to anyone else. I've often heard Ollie describe his shift as ripping off something that stuck to him. A pleasurable pain. Immediate. Freeing. For others, it's a methodical and agonizing reorganization of their very bones. Many, many more exist somewhere along the vast expanse in between. Cooper nodded, all of this aligning with what he had observed himself. The thing is, Eli continued, I've never quite understood what they mean. 
the description of transforming from one thing to another. I don't experience that. You don't shift? Cooper said, confused, and immediately kicked himself. He'd literally seen Eli and Fur that afternoon. But for once, Eli didn't mock him. It's more that I never quite stop shifting, he said thoughtfully. If most of us board a shuttle between two distinct stops, my body decides to go on a walkabout, see the sights, wander as far or as near in any possible direction that I desire. He shook his head. The point is, this makes me unusually good at slipping. Like what you were doing with your claws before, Cooper guessed. Yes, but not just with claws and eyes. Eli reached up and ran his fingers through his own dark hair and pulled a chunk of it upward. Except it wasn't hair. It was a single, pointed, furry wolf's ear, seemingly just plucked from the top of his head. As soon as Cooper registered it, Eli was tugging the ear flat to the scalp and let his hand keep falling, smoothing down the side of his face to reveal his usual human ear. Had that disappeared when the other one had appeared? Presumably so, but Cooper hadn't even noticed. Am I drunk? He wondered. Possibly, Eli said cheerfully. But you saw what you saw. I can slip most any part of myself to most any degree. It can be quite the horror show, I'm told. I think it's the most amazing thing I've ever seen, Cooper blurted out. Sorry, I'm just... That was incredible. Eli eyed him beatily. Yes, well, I don't know what to do with this earnest, Cooper. Kindly return to your usual irritating self, post-haste. Cooper cleared his throat. No, I mean, yeah. So this is what you told James? Eli hummed confirmation. He definitely saw my worth, then. Under James's leadership and with my abilities, the pack became, well, rather prolific thieves. Just because you can slip? Cooper asked, confused. I think you're underestimating how advantageous it can be to bend your joints forward and backward at will, change your face just subtly enough to look completely unrecognizable, or shrink your body to half the size while retaining use of your thumbs. Never mind being able to covertly and publicly pull up a whole other set of senses that work infinitely better than those of even other wolves in skin. That made sense. Point taken, please continue. We stole from other rebels, the humans, even the nearby ruling packs. We accumulated quite a lot of money and quite a lot of enemies in a very short amount of time. The water, as they say, was getting hot. Eli fell silent, and Cooper waited as patiently as he could, though he was fascinated to know the story. It was a long couple of moments before Eli spoke again. I'm not sure what made James do what he did exactly. If something happened, or if he could just sense our luck was running out, he always did have a knack for staying ahead of the shitstorm untouched. His eyes closed and he took a deep breath. To make the long story short, a group of humans became aware of us, or thought they were anyway. We had no one to turn to without admitting our own guilt. James told me he had a plan. He just needed my help, my trust, and we'd all be fine. Of course he was lying. He'd made his own deal with the humans. His safe escape, with half the fortune we'd acquired in exchange for... Me. A very, very slipped me. Humans have an easier time believing the only monster in the room is one that looks monstrous. James didn't look like a monster, so he could convince them I was the only unnatural thing there and just... Walk away. He left me, trapped with people who kept me in fur on a chain like a guard dog. 
a yard pit. Eli opened his eyes, but didn't quite look at Cooper. Even still, I thought it was all part of one of his clever plans, and that he was coming back to get me any day now. I don't remember when I finally realized no one was coming. I don't remember a lot about that time in the usual sense. When Ali and his uncle found me, I'd been in fur for quite a long time. Jesus, Cooper murmured, feeling ill. Hmm. The park pack did what ruling packs are good for. Bought silence, pulled strings, sent lives, hurtling towards certain disaster. I wasn't really tuned in for that. Afterward, they took me in. Gave me a chance to heal, the choice to stay with them if I wished, and a promise that they would never force me to use my slip. And James? In the wind. Later I found out James had betrayed the rest of the rebels as well. Everyone was dead. And he just walked away scot-free. The humans were evil, hateful creatures, but it was James I was most angry at. He was my pack, my kin, my kind. He knew what it would do to me to be treated like. Like that. He knew. Eli's voice cracked a bit. He pursed his lips and shook his head as if to keep the words inside. The silence lingered on, growing increasingly tense and painful. Not between the two of them, but between Eli and himself. Like a dark, malignant thing within him had heard its name called and awoken from a long slumber. Are you okay? Cooper asked. Eli squinted in the middle distance, then shook his head slightly again. A small, fragile gesture, all the more painful because small and fragile just didn't suit Eli's personality at all. Right. Cooper nodded. He wondered if he should reach out and touch him in comfort, but quickly dismissed it. Cooper sure as hell wouldn't want to be touched right now, and he had a sense Eli was more like him in certain ways than not. Do you want a drink? He asked instead. Eli's expression turned surprised and briefly unguarded. I could use a tipple. Cooper leaned out of bed, grateful he'd left the wine bottle here to deal with in the morning. He only had the one glass, but poured generously and offered it to Eli, who held it in both hands and swirled it gently, less like a sommelier and more like he was grateful to have something to do with his hands. Something to focus on. I never could decide if I should go looking for him or not, Eli said abruptly. People like to throw around words like closure and forgiveness, but I've long suspected that's because they don't want to admit how often healing is cruelly arbitrary. Some things just hurt until they don't anymore, and no one can tell you why, so they pretend you must have gotten closure. He sighed. Regardless, the decision was taken out of my hands. A month ago, I got a letter. He found me. James is blackmailing you? Cooper asked, not sure if he was more astonished or repelled. Hadn't the man done enough harm? Eli shrugged, looking exhausted. He has a recording. Incontrovertible proof of what I can do and what I did do. He wants payment or he'll send it to those big packs we stole from. But wouldn't they come after him as well? What's more valuable? Revenge for money lost or a brand new key to the bank? Anonymity is the only thing protecting me right now. Cooper nodded. I tracked him down here to D.C. He works as a zookeeper. Rest assured, the symbolic resonance isn't lost on me. Eli's mouth twisted into the semblance of a smile, and he stared at the swirling wine. It always felt he was out there still, 
But there's a difference between knowing someone's alive and seeing them living. Breathing air. Drinking coffee. Existing. Like he still has that right. What did you do? I followed him. Eli admitted. I started following him a lot. To kill him? Cooper asked. Eli held eye contact. Would you? If you were me? Cooper tried to imagine being in Eli's shoes. Realized he couldn't even begin to. Eli didn't wait long for an answer. Just shrugged and looked away again. All I knew was I wasn't going to let him control me like that. Not again. Not after what happened last time. It's money now, but what happens if he wants something else later? I just want this to end. I can talk to Cola, my boss, Cooper said. She can... The statute of limitations is long past in all states we stole within, Eli said hastily. So if you're thinking of turning me in, of course that's not what I meant, Cooper snapped. The thought had honestly not even crossed his mind. Even if Eli could still be charged, a child on his own manipulated into stealing by the closest thing to family he seemed to have, abused, abandoned, and tortured, now being blackmailed 20 years later, so let's send him to prison? What the fuck was that supposed to do? I meant Cola can help you with the blackmail, Cooper said. No, I can't. Eli was shaking his head as close to panic as Cooper could imagine him looking. You don't understand how close the trust and the ruling packs work. Your boss and the park pack have been allies for a long time, but your other colleagues belong to other packs. The werewolf community is smaller than you understand, and gossip travels. You get the trust involved, and you might as well send that recording out in a chain email to every pack on the continent. I can't take that risk. Cooper nodded, because unfortunately... Eli had a point. What about the park pack? Isn't that the whole appeal? They're supposed to take care of you. Eli looked down at his hands, tugging restlessly on his thumb so that it almost looked like it was infinitesimally gliding up and down his wrist. With a fresh wave of amazement, Cooper realized that it might actually be what was happening. Helena and I... Don't see eye to eye on this particular matter and how best to approach it. If at all possible, I would like to handle this on my own. Cooper frowned. On the one hand, he couldn't believe that was the whole story. On the other, he was hardly the poster boy for wanting to get Helena involved in things or felt like encouraging anyone else into feeling beholden to her. The only option is to find that recording, Eli continued. I searched his house but couldn't find anything. He must be storing it somewhere at the zoo. He must. He doesn't go anywhere else. He's far too controlling to bear being separated from it for long. The zoo is a big place, Cooper said. Yes. The recording is probably stored on, what, a phone? Or even something smaller? The speed with which deductions are flying around this room is truly dizzying. I'm just pointing out the difficulty of the situation, Cooper said. It would be less difficult if I could get closer. Find out where he spends his time, Eli said, sounding frustrated. But I can't risk James scenting me before I can find the recording. I was shifted today, trying to get locked in overnight out of pure desperation. He smiled. But then a new friend of an old friend dropped by and presented a better solution. Cooper frowned. I don't understand. While I've developed a great deal of skills over the years, I am rather dismal at sticking my nose in other people's business. But as I stood there wobbly-kneed and teary-eyed under your cruel interrogations this afternoon, a thought struck me. You, my pretty little whippet, are very good at being nosy. In fact, it's your entire job, and I want to hire you. I'm not a private detective. That's fine. I wasn't planning on paying you anything. Will you help me? Look, Cooper said. 
I want to. I do. And I don't even object to the idea that finding the recording and destroying it is very possibly your best option, but I'm not the right person to do that. You're a morally gray, perpetually meddlesome human who turned his back on his own people's own unjust system of law to work for a secret werewolf agency that exists solely to investigate violent crimes against werewolves. You also seem to be unusually adaptive and unmanipulative, as you've spent the last couple of minutes watching me pull my own thumb off without a single hint of disgust or calculation toward personal gain. Yes, clearly none of this is applicable to my situation at all. I'll go ask someone better suited. Meddlesome? Cooper protested weakly, but he was wavering. All I'm asking is for you to drop by and take a peek around, find out his routines, where he spends his time, ask a couple of questions, hell, narrow it down to five possible places, and I'll do all the actual searching myself. Cooper started to argue, but Eli interrupted. Please. I can't. I don't know what to do. I need help. Just... One try. Cooper bit his lip, but it was clear Eli was desperate. His need was real, and Cooper hated the idea of him taking this on alone. What options did he have? All right, I'll go back to the zoo tomorrow. Take a look around. No promises, though. Eli grinned. Oh, you are lovely, really just an angel, not a bit like the rumors. He toasted him, took a sip of wine, and wrinkled his nose immediately and coughed. <laughs> Ghastly! Ollie bought this, didn't he? He's such a snob. Cooper shot a pointed look at Eli, who rolled his eyes. Darling, surely it's obvious by now that this... He flourished his hand dramatically. Is just an elaborate defense, while Oliver was born offensively elaborate. He's not... Cooper defended. He's just... Easily enamored with beauty, softer and more delicate inside than anyone else could ever guess from looking at him, a bit of a secret hedonist. Eli made a small noise of disgust. The dreamy look on your face right now could star in a Gilbert and Sullivan operetta. I feel ill. I don't know why I'm surprised that a man who spent the evening creeping around my bushes, scaring my cat before breaking into my house and demanding I do him an enormous illegal favor is relentlessly rude to me, but somehow I am. Eli gave him a curious look. While you may not have caught me at my best this afternoon, I generally don't engage in creeping in the underbrush or terrorizing helpless animals. Why would you think I did? I heard something... Cooper trailed off, frowned. I guess it was a raccoon getting into the pumpkin after all. Oliver would know. He's good at... Eli stood suddenly and left the bedroom. Wait, where are you? Cooper stumbled out of bed, remembered his nudity, and hurriedly put some sweats and a t-shirt on. He was just beginning to follow, poker in hand, when Eli returned. What happened? Did you just check outside? Check outside? Eli looked appalled. I think you have mistaken me for another wolf in your life. No, I merely decided it might be a good idea to secure your window, which mysteriously came to be unlocked approximately forty minutes ago. You came in through a window? Cooper asked. And landed in a charming little library of sorts with a very comfortable-looking couch that should make a perfect bed for tonight. Cooper blinked at him, taking a moment to process the meaning. You want to stay here? Overnight? He looked at Eli suspiciously. Look, if you're coming on to me, I have to cut you off right now. Ah, yes, laying bare the worst traumas of my life to my ex-lover's new boy toy, Seduction 101. Eli rolled his eyes so dramatically that Cooper wondered if he was slipping again. My God, read the room. The couch isn't very long, Cooper warned. If you were paying any attention at all, you'd know I can get a lot shorter. Besides, I've slept on worse. Speaking of whom, if Ollie finds out it potentially led trouble to your door and then left you undefended, you'll have two crimes on your hands. The way the last 24 hours had gone, Cooper would not have been half surprised to wake up to Eli perched on his knees or rooting around in his underwear drawer. Fortunately, he woke alone and much later than usual. Without even getting out of bed, he could tell it was a beautiful day. 
The air had that still, bright, and clear quality. The sun shone through the windows, and Cooper could hear crows angrily berating something or other. He could also hear the TV on downstairs, and remembering his house guest, wondered if he might need to revise the prediction of a beautiful day. Still in sweatpants and a t-shirt, Cooper didn't bother getting dressed before going downstairs. Concern for what Eli was getting up to unsupervised outweighed any desire to feel a little more put together when facing him. Formality seemed a moot point anyway after they'd polished off the rest of the wine bottle last night. Both two hopped up on adrenaline to go to sleep right away. Eli had seemed determined not to reveal anything else about himself, and kept the conversation focused on prying into Cooper's past relationships. His romantic and sexual histories were normally not things Cooper would share with another person. He mostly avoided thinking about them himself. But if there was one thing about Eli's situation he could easily empathize with, it was how gross it felt to expose so much of yourself. To be so known by someone without learning anything in return. The inequity of it. The vulnerability. The paranoia that the other person was laughing at you. Pitying you. Opening up had obviously been hard for Eli. Cooper didn't want to make it worse. So he'd talked. He'd talked about his first girlfriend, Sophie, now married to his brother. Incestuous! His first boyfriend in college of one short month, who had been sweet, if a bit stiff, and very vanilla. Are you absolutely certain you weren't dating a waffle cone? He'd even told him about his first partner in the FBI, who was older. Much older, someone intended to be a mentor, who had been a mentor as a successful queer man and undercover. He just also liked Cooper's dick a lot at the same time. Eli hadn't quipped about that one. Maybe beneath Cooper's light words, he could sense a glimmer of the darkness. If only just the part that reflected his own story. The joy and loyalty of recognizing someone like you that led to letting down certain guards, twisting certain hurts even deeper. Eventually, when the conversation seemed relaxed, Cooper had tried to do some digging back, but after Eli started telling him about how the son of an oil tycoon he'd been having a tumultuous affair with had driven off a cliff, developed amnesia, and been given facial plastic surgery by his identical twin, Cooper finally realized he was just patching together old dynasty plot lines and kicked him out for the night. Downstairs, he found Eli looking frustratingly fresh-faced. He was sitting cross-legged on the living room floor eating eggs out of a mug, watching what looked like some other soap opera while wearing nothing but boxer briefs and one of Park's sweatshirts filched from the laundry room. Boogie was purring in his lap and barely cracked an eye open in acknowledgement when Cooper walked in. Unbelievable. Find everything you need, okay? He asked sarcastically. I left you something hot in the kitchen, Eli said around a spoon, not looking away from the TV. Should probably go check on it before it boils over. He waved him away dismissively. Cooper just rolled his eyes, unwilling to spar before caffeine, and made his way into the other room, then froze, astounded. Oliver? Park was standing at the stove poaching eggs. He looked up and smiled. Finally... I was beginning to worry. Cooper walked right up and hugged him. Park cut off, clearly surprised. He felt wonderfully warm and wonderfully solid. Basically just the ordinary qualities of any living person, so it was a mystery why holding him felt so goddamn extraordinary. Why Cooper, not much of a cuddler, felt compelled to hold him tighter. Park seemed bewildered by the sudden urgency of his affection as well and held very still as Cooper buried his face in his neck, breathing in and out. When Cooper kissed the skin there, Park shivered and let out a small, pleased sound so sweet that Cooper felt it resonate in his core. If you're buttering me up to break the news about your overnight guest, it's too late. The jig is up, Park said a little brokenly as Cooper delicately nosed along the tendon of his neck. 
Don't be ridiculous if I wanted to butter you up, Cooper said, kissing the hollow of Park's collarbone. I do something more like this. He dragged his lips up his throat until he could mouth at the soft, vulnerable spot below the chin and felt Park go boneless against him. Cooper kneaded his hands gently up Park's back, enjoying the play of powerful muscles there, the obvious strength docile and trembly beneath his hands. I didn't think you'd be home until this evening. Took an early flight, wanted to surprise you, Park murmured. Thought you might be... He inhaled sharply when Cooper nipped him. Lonely. Bored, without me, should have assumed you'd pick up another case. Another man? Cooper pushed him back against the kitchen counter and kissed him for real, enjoying Park's obvious eagerness. His unguarded pleasure, a slightly less controlled edge to his kiss and touch and body. Cooper felt briefly tempted to go to his knees, an unbelievable power rush to know you could utterly wreck someone with a simple stroke, squeeze, suck rhythm. To be privy to the unique code that unlocked every last one of their defenses. The very thought of Park, vulnerable and begging as Cooper took him apart with his mouth, sent a heat wave through his veins. But they did have a guest in the next room. Cooper pulled back, putting some space between them, and waited until Park's breathing evened out and his eyes fluttered open before speaking. I don't have a new case. Or man. He added, though it hardly seemed worth saying, since Park was clearly being facetious. Park cleared his throat. <clears> throat> yes, Eli filled me in he said in his most tightly controlled, emotionless voice, but Cooper still caught the dark expression that passed over his face. He said you promised you'd go to the zoo again today. Try to help. That was... kind of you. Cooper shrugged, uncomfortable. It only seems like common decency. Decency is not very common... Park said, turning back to the stove. I'm coming, of course. Cooper smiled. Of course, he said, noticing a package on the counter. It wasn't too large, about five by eight inches, and the usual anonymous cardboard. So I couldn't help but notice you apparently haven't bought a single grocery since I left last week, Park said, changing the subject. Make me a list of what you want, and I'll go, Cooper said, picking up the package and turning it over in his hands. They'd fallen into a habit of Cooper shopping and park cooking, since if left to his own devices, Cooper often went weeks uninterested in meals that required more than three or four steps, his relationship with food having changed a lot since his gut had been torn up and he'd spent months not being able to eat real food. Okay... But in the meantime, I was thinking we could go out for dinner tonight, Park said, still futzing over the stove. Hmm, sure, that sounds nice, Cooper said distractedly. Did you bring me home a present? What? Park jerked around abruptly, looking alarmed before he saw what Cooper was holding. Oh, no, that's not me. His face relaxed and he went back to scooping the eggs from the water and adding them to onions, tomatoes, and bell peppers. Basically, just everything Cooper had been letting go untouched in the fridge during Park's absence. I found it on the porch this morning. I thought it was something you ordered. Yes, because between the two of us, I'm the online shopping enthusiast. Cooper muttered as he exchanged the box for the bowl of breakfast Park handed him then watched as he popped a claw and made quick work of the tape and pulled off the top layer of packing paper. Park paused. What? Cooper asked. What is it? He leaned closer. The box was lined with dark green tissue paper and full to the brim with roses. Just the heads, though. 
All their stems had been clipped. They were all a pretty sort of pinkish-orange color and tightly closed, though that probably had something to do with how they'd been cut. Cooper pulled one out, manipulating it in his fingers. There wasn't even the barest hint of a stem left below the bud. Strange. And a bit wasteful. He doubted they'd live longer than a day like this, though he supposed all cut flowers were doomed in that regard sooner or later. Digging in the pile, Park found a small note card and read it out loud. To the moon and back again. From your family? Cooper snorted. Two dozen customized roses and an embossed card? What kind of Grey Poupon people do you think we are? Speaking of, what about your family? They're fancy like that. He suggested. Odd enough, too, but he left that bit implied. Park shook his head, scooping out a few buds. I feel like they would have mentioned it. He rolled the flowers between his fingers, dislodging a few petals that twirled prettily onto the counter. Coral. That's what color the roses were, Cooper realized. Looks like all those hours spent on wedding blogs weren't a complete waste of time. I emailed my... Daisy. A couple of weeks ago. Park said, still looking at the flowers. Cooper tried not to look surprised. Neither of them had seen or heard from Park's mother, Daisy Bedillion, since she'd saved Cooper's life in Cape Breton that February. Dropped Park's wounded grandmother off at the hospital and promptly disappeared. I told her we'd got this place and were getting married just in case she wanted to. Park shrugged. I don't know, come visit or something. She hasn't written back yet, he said hastily. But maybe she sent this instead. Maybe, Cooper said gently. Because what else could you say? Park and his siblings had spent years thinking their parents, Daisy and Benjamin, were dead only to find out they'd been lied to. That their parents had left them when they had gotten even more involved in the Wolf Independence Party, those fighting for the end of the powerful established packs like the Parks. Whether they had left to protect them or just because they couldn't afford the liability of carting around six children while on the run was unclear. But it was only six years ago when Park's father had been murdered that he and his siblings had learned the truth. In a strange way, it was the only reason Cooper and Park had even met. It was the catalyst for Park leaving his family pack entirely, for him giving up his life as a professor and joining the trust in exchange for Cola's help in tracking down Daisy's contact information. She'd also been the one to tell Park how his father had really died. One of the members of their small WIP faction at the time had betrayed their group, resulting in an explosion that had killed many, including Benjamin, and ironically the man who had sold them out. By sheer luck, Daisy had escaped, but still had no interest in reaching out to any of her children. If tragedy hadn't done it, Cooper doubted an email informing her of some silly human ritual would. You think I'm being delusional, Park noted, studying him. I didn't say that. Cooper said. I'm just not sure what makes you think this is from her. Park nodded. That's fair. But there's an old story she used to tell us growing up. The moon and the last abstraction of wolves. One of the lines in that was, Fallen flowers that could never again stand proud in the sun. We were definitely hanging out in different sections at the children's library, Cooper said. It's a wolf folktale, all about the irredeemably bad, flowers who couldn't return to the light, and how one day the moon would step out of the sky and punish the wolves who had hurt their packs for personal gain, thus restoring balance. Park shrugged. It sounds a lot less dark when you're a kid. Does it? Cooper asked skeptically. Sure. 
All you had to do was make sure you never, ever hurt the people you loved most in the world, and you'd be safe. Easy peasy. Park smiled wryly. Anyway, it was just the usual fear-based mythos used to regulate any community behavior. But the heads of flowers is heavily associated with that story, and the card mentions the moon. And Daisy sent this in order to say... What, exactly? Cooper asked and immediately regretted it when Park's face flickered with pain and he looked down, hiding his expression. It was true, what Park had said. It was so much easier to hurt the person you love most in the world than Cooper could ever have fathomed as a child. I'm sorry, he said softly. Really, I am. I speak and I think, but never the twain do meet. Park shook his head, still studying his feet. No, you're right. The worst part is I know I'm being ridiculous. I don't know why I keep... I'm reaching for someone who doesn't want to be reached. Every time... And I don't even need her, so I don't know why I keep trying to. Just to feel this humiliating. He cut himself off, biting viciously at his lip. Cooper wrapped his arms around him and pulled him into a hug. He ran a firm hand over Park's hair and down his back, and made some soothing nonsense noises. It was strange how someone Park's size could feel so much smaller like this his nose tucked into Cooper's hair behind his ear, breathing deeply. They stood like that for a while, but eventually Park pulled back to rest his forehead on Cooper's shoulder instead. Two hugs in one morning, you are spoiling me, he said. I must have missed you or something. Maybe I should go away more often. Cooper squeezed him. You can try... Park chuckled and was about to say something else when Eli sauntered into the kitchen with Boogie at his ankles, eyes sweeping over them both. I hate to interrupt this sentimental tableau, but might I remind you someone I hold very dear is being blackmailed. And while nauseating me to death is certainly one way to put a stop to it, I was rather hoping for something a bit more impressive from the Trust's top two private dicks. Is everyone you've ever dated an asshole? Cooper groaned. Park just shrugged. Maybe I have a type. Cooper was quiet as he and Park walked through the zoo a little later that day. He had called Sophie long ahead of time and asked if she'd mind giving them that informal tour she'd been offering. He'd given her a very loose explanation of what was going on, too. While Cooper didn't want to violate Eli's trust... He also didn't feel right about dragging Sophie into this without her full knowledge of what he actually planned to get up to. She'd agreed anyway, and told them when she had a spare hour, excitedly offering to introduce them to some of the staff for optimum snooping, which was nice of her. Cooper knew he didn't deserve it. Not after he dodged so many previous invitations, olive branches, and built bridges, when his family had needed to practically drag him out of the house yesterday just to spend time with them. For the years of his life when he wasn't out to them, that protective distance had made sense, and he couldn't say he regretted it. But now that they knew about him, about Park, hell, even about werewolves, and Cooper was still holding that distance, well, part of it was out of habit. But part of it was Cooper simply liked his space. He'd never been one to crave a big, close family always in each other's business or, you know, the presence of others in general, as his attempted guest list last night had more than demonstrated. That just wasn't him. Park, on the other hand, more than wanted love and connection. He needed it. Whether that was a wolf thing or if it had something to do with his early abandonment the conditional affections of the grandparents who raised him, or the fact that most of his own kind were terrified of him and his past as the shepherd, was a question best theorized by the likes of Dr. Rapodi. 
But what Cooper did know was that for someone who so yearned for easy, plentiful affection, Park had certainly managed to hitch his heart to the wrong horse. That didn't mean Cooper had any doubts about the relationship. Park was a grown-up and had shown time and time again that he wanted to be with Cooper. Who the fuck was Cooper to tell him he was wrong? What he did wonder, though, was as a partner, as a fiancé, as a husband, what was his responsibility in stepping out of his own comfortable habits and healing some of that hurt? What about as Park's supposed alpha? As far as building a pack went, Cooper had contributed Boogie, and though she certainly doted on Park, that wasn't exactly the same thing, was it? There's Sophie, Park said, breaking Cooper out of his thoughts. He turned to greet his sister-in-law. Hey, you made it, she said waving as she approached. I was surprised to get your call. Surprise does seem to be de rigueur this season. I really appreciate you agreeing to show us around, Cooper said. Are you kidding? I practically had to lock Dean in the bathroom to keep him from coming along too. He's been whining about being voted off the quest all day. Although I'm not clear exactly on what you expect to find. Information, mostly, Park said. How long James has been working here, if he has an office, where he spends the majority of his time... If Eli was correct and James was stashing the recordings somewhere here at his work, their best bet was to trace his steps as quickly and thoroughly as they could before he was alerted to their presence. Cooper pulled out his phone and showed her the picture of James he'd had Eli forward both him and Park this morning. Ever seen this guy around? Sophie squinted. I think so, but you'll have better luck talking to one of the other keepers. I can find someone for you to ask. She led them down the trail. You're the vet on set for some kind of video project, right? Cooper asked as they walked. Sophie laughed. Not exactly. The zoo already has a great medical team here, but they're hugely busy and my research back in the day specialized in the effects of stress on captive reptiles. Because the crew was primarily handling those, I was brought in to consult. She shrugged. Honestly, I was kind of surprised to be asked, but it's been lots of fun. What is it exactly that they're filming? Park asked. The zoo is partnering with a conservation organization to raise money. Wild nature conservation. The director of the org is some ex-TV star, so they've been filming a series of quick little shorts with her for the website as an educational campaign and kicking it all off with a big fundraising party tomorrow. She grinned. It's a haunted Halloween gala, actually. There will be a couple of keepers on site with some of the more manageable animals. Tickets are eight fifty a pop. Dean and I are getting in free. Eight fifty as in eight hundred and fifty dollars per ticket, Cooper choked. Well, I didn't mean eight dollars and fifty cents. It's a charity gala, not a lemonade stand. Sophie said, amused. And that's just the single ticket prices without any of the perks. If you want your name listed as a friend of the zoo in the next newsletter, you're dropping five grand or more for a table reservation. A thousand dollars isn't friendly enough? Cooper murmured. You want to come? Sophie offered. I can try to finagle you some tickets. We could wrap you in a feather boa and call it a joint bachelor party. I would rather you wrap me up in boa constrictor and call time of death, Cooper said, than attend a haunted Halloween gala, my God. Sophie turned to Park. You know, it's never too late to call off this engagement. You're a catch, you'll find someone. Park sighed. I was cursed by an old witch to find him charming. That's some dark magic, Sophie said then pointed to a building off the trail tucked back, away from the public curiosity, behind the Andean Bears exhibit. The crew's scheduled to be filming in here today. She swiped her card across the electronic reader to unlock the sturdy metal door marked Zoo Personnel Only. This space primarily contains a medical bay, small lab, containment pens, and a kitchen for food prep, she continued, 
leading them down an industrial sort of hall with floor-to-ceiling cages on one side, a bit like a prison cells, but much larger. Cooper noticed two of them were separated not by a wall, but metal mesh that appeared latched. That's a howdy door, Sophie said when Cooper pointed it out. It's used for safe, no-contact introductions between the animals to see if they're receptive to mating or not, that sort of thing. Could have used a howdy door once or twice in my life, Cooper muttered, glancing at Park to share in the joke, but Park was distracted, gaze fixed down the hall. It soon became clear on what. One of the pens was occupied. Male Andy and Bear, Sophie said as they all stopped to look. Inside was a bear with black fur and a white pattern around its eyes and nose sat on the floor, grooming its paw. I think they were supposed to be filming with him today. A door at the end of the hall opened, and a woman walked through, arguing with none other than the interrupting curator of the day before, Ryan the Lion. I have the B-roll, the woman was saying. I can't shoot any more B-roll. What I don't have is one goddamn primary... Ryan caught sight of them and startled, nearly dropping the clipboard in his hands. Dr. O'Dell, he greeted Sophie with surprise. And Cooper, right? What are you doing here? Don't tell me you chased in another peacock. <laughs> he laughed, and beside him, Cooper could practically hear Park's eyebrow raise. Cooper is my brother-in-law, Sophie said smoothly. He had such an amazing time on your jungle tour yesterday, he insisted on coming back today with his fiancée, Oliver. Cooper bit back his knee-jerk reaction of unhinged laughter any time someone called Park his fiancée. Yeah, it was really, uh, something. I hadn't been to the zoo since I was a kid. You know, you get different stuff out of it now. Ryan looked bashfully pleased. Really? Sophie leaned in a little conspiratorially. I was saying to them I might be able to hook them up with a behind-the-scenes tour. Oh, yes, yes, we can do that, Ryan said, glancing at the woman next to him. Have you met my colleague, Nico Hirano? We spoke over the phone, actually, Sophie said. Ms. Hirano was who asked me onto the project. Hirano nodded a bit stiffly. You came highly recommended. We are happy to have you. She appeared to be a middle-aged woman of Japanese descent, with dark hair cut bluntly above the ear on one side and shaved to the scalp on the other. She had very dark, sharp eyes that seemed to be cataloging every phrenological detail about Cooper and Park. Her gaze intense and... Expectant? No, that wasn't right. But Cooper couldn't quite place his finger on the right word. Ms. Hirano is on the zoo's board of directors and heads up all of our educational and publicity initiatives, Ryan explained for Cooper and Park's benefit. She's the point person overseeing the video series. If there's going to be a series, Hirano said, I can't keep scheduling a film crew to wait around on the off chance that Crane acts like a professional and shows up to her own damn shoot. We're having a bit of a missing talent problem today, Ryan explained apologetically to the rest of them. We're always missing talent, Hirano muttered, whether our self-proclaimed star shows up or not. Genevieve Crane is a star, Ryan started, of one ridiculous TV show that's been off the air for a decade. Hirano finished like this was a conversation they'd had before. For someone on the board of directors, she was certainly dressed very ruggedly in her dark green khakis and a matching shirt unbuttoned halfway down her chest to reveal a ribbed white tank top. Cooper could almost imagine her trekking around the wilds if not for the thick-rimmed, very expensive designer glasses that she was cleaning with a lens cloth, sporting the same designer's logo. It looks like one of your actors is ready to go, Cooper said, gesturing at the bear that was now hunched a bit defensively across his pen watching them. Where else is he going to go? She pointed out sharply. Before this job, I had a whole career in nature documentaries, tracking animals across hundreds of miles of terrain, species like fisher cats and timber wolves who have been fine-tuning their stealth for millennia, and not one of them was as much trouble as this one woman. 
Hirano put her glasses back on and did a slight double take when she saw Park. She pointed at him, lens cloth dangling from her hand like an old fashioned handkerchief. You done any extras work? Reenactments? Park looked unusually wrong footed. Oh, no, I'm not an actor. What about ads? She demanded. Have you done any spots I might have seen? Park shook his head and Cooper intervened. Nature documentaries sound like cool work. Frankly, he didn't know jack squat about them. His preferred movie genres usually involved a lot more dialogue and hard drinking than the average panda got up to. But he figured if he wanted them to buy that, he was the sort of person to find the jungle tour thrilling enough to come back for seconds. He'd best show a little enthusiasm here as well. Do you usually film in zoos? God, no, Hirano said. Filming a wild animal free in its own habitat is the only way to get a true representation of their natural behaviors, social dynamics. She gestured at the Andean bear, who had started pacing his cage. The only true thing footage of this guy tells your average viewer is that his species is in trouble. Not really what I expected to hear from the zoo's primary publicist, Park said wryly. On the contrary, after twenty years in the field, I believe in supporting our commitment to conservation research more than ever, Hirano said promptly, then added, Plus, my partner's not too keen on me going on six-month stakeouts in the wilderness just in the hopes of catching that perfect shot of moose bucks sparring or wolf pups emerging from the den. After my accident, I promised her no more. Now the most frustrating part of my job is trying to track down flighty philanthropists who commit to filming and then don't show. She squinted at Park. I swear I've seen your face before. Modeling? Porn? Park smiled. I'm flattered, but no. Maybe we crossed paths in the wilderness sometime. Beside him, Sophie laughed, which she quickly turned into a cough. I should probably be getting back to work soon, she said, glancing questioningly at Cooper, who nodded, grateful for her help. No problem, Ryan said, checking his watch. I'd be happy to give you guys a tour as long as you don't mind waiting while I do the sea lion feed. Behind them, the bear suddenly slammed against the cage, startling everyone, and let out a deep, lowing sound. That's odd, Ryan said, frowning. He's normally pretty disinterested in people. I've been dealing with reports of atypical behavior all day. Animals know when something is up before you do, Hirano said, looking grim. Who's on shift today? James? Cooper carefully didn't react. No, Ryan said, checking the clipboard in his hand. Selena, though I'm sure James is around somewhere. It is a filming day, after all. He chuckled, and even Hirano looked briefly amused. Come on, then. Ryan clapped his hands. The sea lions get grumpy if they don't keep to their schedule. After that, I'll give you the deluxe behind-the-scenes tour. They said their goodbyes to Sophie and Hirano, and followed Ryan around as he collected a bucket of fish and led them out of the building. He kept up a steady stream of informative chatter as they went, apparently taking his duties as tour guide to heart, and it was a while before Cooper got an opening to casually turn the conversation back toward James. I hope we're not putting you out... Showing us around like this, Park said. Things seemed a little hectic before. Oh, not at all. I think we're all just a little wound up, Ryan said, cheerfully swinging the bucket as they walked. Cooper couldn't help but wince at the slapping sound the dead fish made against the sides and the intensity of the smell wafting up at him. Nico, ah, uh, Ms. Hirano, has put a lot on the line to make this happen. Add to that a film crew, THE Genevieve Crane from Labyrinth of Love, and the gala tomorrow night. Well, it's the most excitement we'll see around here for a while. Sometimes it feels like more work keeping the staff out than the animals in. <laughs> Is that what you meant before about one of your keepers showing up on film days? Is he hoping to get discovered? Cooper asked brightly. Dreams of Hollywood? 
Ryan laughed as they approached the sea lion exhibit. It was sort of an arena-shaped exhibit with two levels. One where you could sit on cement benches and watch above ground, and the other where you could follow the trail into an artificial cave where a huge glass viewing window revealed a snippet of their underwater world. Discovered? No, no, I don't think so. But James is one of the most talented handlers I've ever known. Animals just listen to him and do whatever he says. I think Ms. Crane appreciates his presence. Cooper could hardly hear what Ryan had said as they walked up to the pool, because the sea lions were barking so loudly. A cacophony of angry, sonorous yelps that reverberated in your throat. Do they always do that? Park asked, gesturing around them. Or is this what you meant by getting grumpy if they're not fed on time? Cooper added. But Ryan wasn't looking at him. He was frowning straight ahead, listening as they walked downhill into the artificial cave and below water viewing area. Up ahead, the bright blue glass was the only major source of light, and Cooper's eyes took a moment to adjust and take in the low fake rock ceilings and the stone steps directly across the cave that led back to ground level and presumably toward the back of the pool. They're raising an alarm. Something's riled them up. In nature, they use it to signal a predator is near, but... Ryan stopped short and Cooper nearly walked into him. It took a second to see it. The man drifting with utter stillness at the top of the viewing window. His arms up around his head. The laces of dark gray running sneakers floating around his ankles. For a moment, Cooper was fixated on those sneakers. How strange it was to see shoes underwater. Then Park ran past him, through the cave and up the steps, and Cooper snatched to action. Call an ambulance! Cooper shouted at Ryan, running after Park. As he'd suspected, the steps led the other side of the pool, and at the top, Cooper was momentarily blinded by being back in the sunlight, the frantic barks ringing in his ears. After a second that felt like forever, he spotted the staff entrance at the back of the enclosure standing open and hurried in and across the slick, smooth rocks just in time to see Park dive into the water. Oliver! He shouted and bit his tongue. Park had to go in. If that man was still alive, was drowning, they couldn't wait. But Cooper didn't know the first thing about sea lions. Did they bite? Could they kill? Cooper shuffled along the rocks, trying to find sight of Park but couldn't. It felt like a lot of time had passed, but he wasn't sure if that was true. He wasn't sure how much time Park would need to find the man and pull him to the surface either. The water seemed very blue, because of the way the pool walls were painted, or in reflection of the sky, probably, though Cooper vaguely remembered it actually had something to do with the way light bends, how reds and oranges and yellows get lost in deep water, how lots of things do. A dark shape shot past, too fast to be anything but an animal. Another larger shape followed it while rising closer and closer to the surface. A huge sea lion poked its head out of the water and snorted so loudly Cooper jumped, feet slipping beneath him. The creature disappeared briefly, then shot up again, heaving itself up onto the ground beside Cooper. Another smaller one quickly followed. Farther down the rocks, another three did the same. They were leaving the water more scared of what was in there than being up here with him. Cooper was vaguely conscious of the crowd gathering across the exhibit, pointing at him and talking. A couple of people cheered rowdily, thinking they were about to see something amazing. Then, finally, across the pool near the wall, Park broke the water's surface. A man held to his chest, limp and unmoving. Bizarrely, Park's jacket was wrapped around the man's head, obscuring it entirely. It was unsettling. Something about not being able to see his face, read his eyes, made Cooper feel like at any moment the man could jerk into motion and drag Park back below the surface. Their slow and awkward progress back to the rocks was torture. As soon as Park swam close enough, Cooper got on his knees and pulled the man's frigid, waterlogged dead weight up. It was harder than he'd expected. The man felt unexpectedly shaped in Cooper's hands. His hips stayed stiffly bent, legs at a 45-degree angle. Even when Cooper managed to wrestle him to his back on the rocks. An injury. Rigor mortis. 
The rest of his body didn't feel stiff, though. The cheers of the crowd had changed to shouts and screams, barely audible over the terrified barks of the sea lions as they all rolled and dove into the water once more. Park hoisted himself gracefully onto the rocks, and Cooper reached out and touched his arm briefly, needing to feel him alive and safe before checking the man for a pulse. Nothing. It wasn't impossible to come back from a drowning, though. The cold of the water might actually be helpful. He reached for the jacket covering the man's face, prepared to do CPR, but Park grabbed his shoulder, stopping him. No. Look. He tugged the man's dark shirt up, revealing four long, open gashes through the gut. He was dead before he hit the water. Cooper swallowed the wave of nausea. He felt absurdly lightheaded, overheated, and worst of all, a little bit like he might cry. Stupid. He had seen countless dead bodies before, many of them worse than this. But just because these wounds were exactly like the four thick scars on his own gut, he was on the verge of fainting. He hated it. Are you okay? Park asked. Yes, fine. What were you saying? Cooper asked quickly, realizing too late Park hadn't been saying anything. Thankfully, Park didn't push it. Look at this. He tugged the dead man's sleeve up, revealing bright greens, pinks, oranges, and purples of a garden tattooed on his forearm. Cooper blew out a long breath. James, I presume. Seems that way. Why did you cover his face? Park hesitated and glanced around as if judging how clear a view the gathering crowd had. Something's wrong, he murmured. He shuffled over slightly to block the man from view and carefully lifted the jacket just a little. Cooper still had to duck his head to see, then jerked back in surprise. Jesus, he said, glancing at Park, who looked grim. What? He leaned back in to get a closer look. James's face was not remotely human-looking. Not a werewolf either, but some stage in between that Cooper rarely saw. And never more than a glimpse as one form smoothly shifted into another. He would almost have thought someone was playing a bad joke with a particularly gruesome Halloween mask. Except for the very real way the skin pulled painfully tight over the elongated, protruding face. What's... Why? Park shook his head. I don't know. But it's bad, Cooper. Very, very bad. Chapter 4 I understand. Yes, I'll tell him. Of course. Cooper stepped out of the bathroom and lingered in the bedroom door, toweling his hair dry. He watched Park talk to Cola on the phone. It had been a long afternoon of managing the crime scene, calming down the crowds, making sure the right people were called, and then being questioned themselves, decontaminated, picked over for transferred evidence. James was a werewolf, and had clearly been murdered, so of course the trust was taking over the case. Not Cooper and Park, though. They were already too involved, according to Cola. She had showed up on scene along with the trust agents taking over the case, looking harried and annoyed. As director, she almost never went out into the field herself, and Cooper wondered if she'd come today because of them. She'd certainly seemed to want them as far away from this as possible. Their orders were to go home and not worry about it. No small ask for Cooper. No, no word yet, Park was saying. We didn't see him. That would be Eli they were talking about. Park had texted him the news and told him to stay put, but Eli hadn't been here when they'd finally made it back home, and his phone was shut off now. Cooper was ready to call up the trust right then and there to report another victim, but Park had found a note on the kitchen counter in Eli's handwriting, promising them both that he was fine and that he was going to lie low until he could find some answers. 
the final line. I'm not going down for this. I see. Yes, all right. Let us know. Park disconnected and sat on the bed with a sigh. He'd already showered thoroughly and was halfway dressed. A nice pair of slacks, loose and undone on his hips, and an expensively soft-looking dark green button-down shirt hanging open. It made Cooper, still naked from his own intense hour-long shower, feel slightly obscene. Anything new? Cooper asked. Park rubbed his eyes and made a frustrated gesture. James Finnegan bled out from four deep lacerations to the lower abdomen. They're still waiting on toxicology. Will the tox report explain that... Cooper gestured at his own face. It must. I can't imagine any other explanation. It shouldn't be possible at all. I don't understand. He's a wolf, right? Isn't it just... uh... slipping? Park looked surprised. Eli told me about it, Cooper explained. Said he's pretty good. He's not just pretty good, Park said. He's unbelievable. I've never heard of anyone who can do what he does. I wouldn't even really call it slipping. It's too precise. Individualized. James's face, spine, and hip girdle were more traditionally slipped because everything was progressing through the normal process of shifting. Why is that impossible, then? I've seen you look, uh, slipped. Park grimaced a bit and seemed to consider his words carefully. It's like balancing on a tightrope. The body wants to fall one way or another. For most of us, it's horribly disorienting and uncomfortable and takes serious focus and fine muscle control to hold an extreme slip like that. Muscle control you definitely don't have when you're dead. You think something was keeping him that way? Some kind of drug or toxin? Something strong. He was dead in the water about an hour before we found him. An hour? How did nobody notice him? They found the remains of a sandbag tied to his waist. Seems like someone kept him weighted down, before it either accidentally or intentionally ripped. Sand leaks out slowly. Body floats up. Either way, the killer bought themselves enough time to get away while still ensuring James would be found today, as dramatically and publicly as possible. He hesitated, then said with meaning, Cola wants us to call if we hear anything from Eli. Cooper blinked. She can't be serious. He didn't do this. He was being blackmailed by the victim. He's admitted to stalking the victim. We can't account for his whereabouts at the time of death. We can't account for his whereabouts now. None of this is a good look. You can't possibly think he's guilty, Cooper protested. Park bit at the scar in his lip, contemplating that. Finally, he said, I don't think he'd get us involved if he'd planned to kill James all along. Nice, Cooper said sarcastically. I hope you stand up for me with that much conviction someday. You seriously have no idea where he might have gone? No. I mean, we did have that one conversation that, if we turned 40 and we're both still single and one of us is on the run for murder, we'd... All right, all right, point taken. Cola give you anything else? Yes. His name popped up in a recent report. There was a fire at James Finnegan's building four days ago. What? No casualties. They were able to contain it, but James's apartment... The suspected origin of the blaze was entirely gutted. 
There's an open investigation, but they were leaning toward accidental grease fire. I imagine they'll want to take a closer look now that he's been murdered. It feels like too big a coincidence not to be arson. Would, would Eli do that? Park frowned. He already admitted to breaking into James's place. If he thought burning it down was the only shot at destroying the recording, and he could be sure no one would get hurt, or that the fire would spread, then yes. I think it's possible he would. But not an apartment building like that. He wouldn't put the neighbors at risk. Four days ago, you said? Where's James been living since? A hotel. St. Regis. Cooper raised an eyebrow. Fancy pants. Blackmail must be paying well. I think most people's finances benefit from multiple streams of income, Park said carefully. You think he was blackmailing someone besides Eli? Someone set that fire, and someone killed him. If not Eli, I'd say there's a good chance he was blackmailing someone else as well. Otherwise, you're saying the blackmail and death are totally unrelated. What are the chances of that? Park shook his head and started buttoning up his shirt. I guess you're right, Cooper said, reaching for a pair of ratty sweatpants. Stopped, took in what Park was wearing again. Why are you all dressed up? Park looked down at himself and, to Cooper's astonishment, blushed. I thought, did you not want to go to dinner, then? Oh. Cooper blinked. He'd completely forgotten they'd planned to do that. No, I mean, all right. Not like we're doing anyone any good here. Where? Park was still spending way too much time and attention on his buttons. I thought we could go to that Burmese place you like. Maybe walk around after. Get a drink. That sounds nice, Cooper said honestly. He put his sweatpants back and tossed his towel on the bench, unable to stop thinking about Eli. How he hadn't been able to even look at Cooper when he spoke of James. How relaxed and safe he'd appeared sitting in front of the TV just that morning with Boogie in his lap. And now he was out there somewhere. Alone, frightened of being pinned for a murder he didn't commit and more than likely about to do something rash. I'm not going down for this. He understood Eli's paranoia. At first glance, James's death seemed good for Eli. But with the recording still MIA and the trust now in the case and more likely to find it first, things were actually a lot more dire than ever before. Instead of grabbing nicer clothes, he walked over to Park, still sitting on the bed. Park watched his naked approach with interest. Unless you wanted to just stay in tonight, he suggested innocently. That sounds nice, too. Cooper ran his hands over Park's shoulders, finding the tense spots and pressing them out, arching a little when Park placed a soft, loose kiss against his belly. Or... I was thinking, maybe we could go somewhere downtown? Park jerked back, looking briefly confused. It was not a neighborhood they normally chose to spend time in. Before understanding hit, he sighed, a ghost of a whisper against Cooper's skin. Somewhere downtown, like the Regis, maybe? Why, Mr. Park, Cooper batted his eyelashes. Are you suggesting some sort of rendezvous at a hotel? I'm a nearly married man, you know. Park stood, dragging his hands over Cooper's bare skin and leaned down to whisper in his ear. Mmm, so am I. Let's be bad this one last time and go snoop around a dead blackmailer's room. Cooper smiled. You know, no one says sweet nothings quite like you. The woman at the front desk of the St. Regis Hotel didn't even blink at their badges, 
just handed over James Finnegan's room key with a bored expression. Either they weren't the first trust agents to come that day, or the typical guest list this place attracted was no stranger to crime. Cooper bet both. You know, they do weddings here, Park said as they made their way through the lobby to the elevators. Cooper looked around the enormous room patched to the brim with red velvet, gold inlay, and animal skin footstools. So, he said. So, Park repeated, calling up the elevator. If you see something you like here, we can make that happen. We can make that happen? Cooper repeated. I'm sorry, when is your audition for Glengarry Glen Ross again? Was it, was that it right there? Park shook his head as the doors opened. They stepped into the elevator and he chose the floor. I just want you to get the wedding you want, whatever that may be. Okay, Cooper said. I appreciate it, and if I ever wake as an aging silent film star obsessed with her past, I might take you up on that, but in the meantime, I'm more likely to want to get married in the sea lion pool, corpse included, than here in this building. It's your lack of hyperbole that really made me fall in love with you. Wrote half my vows about it. Cooper started to shake his head with a smile, then froze. The elevator opened on James's floor, and Park stepped out and had to turn around and catch the door from closing before Cooper noticed. He stepped out into the hall, a little dazed. What's wrong? Park asked. You haven't actually written any vows, right? Cooper asked. I mean, we, we haven't even set a date. Park's cheeks turned a bit pink. I was just doing some research. I really don't know much about it. Some forums suggested getting started on the vows early if you weren't going traditional. He mumbled. It's only a rough draft. Cooper couldn't even bring himself to respond, stuck on the thought of Park studying wedding planning forums. Unless you did want to do something traditional, Park asked tentatively. No, Cooper said, then fell awkwardly silent again. Okay, Park said slowly. Your heart is beating a mile a minute right now. Did you want to just skip the whole vow thing entirely? Because I'm not going to be hurt. No, I want to vow, Cooper said quickly. He took a deep breath and grabbed Park's hand, looking him in the eye. I really do want to. It's just a list of things I love about you followed by some promises, right? How hard can it be? Park studied him with a skeptical, albeit fond, look on his face. For you? Cooper scoffed. I know what I love, Oliver. Right off the bat, you've got ten toes. Eight of them aren't too weird. There's eight lines right there. What's next? Your ankles? Those aren't bad either. Calves? Genuinely sexy. Okay, okay. Park said hastily, let's keep some mystery alive. I look forward to hearing your non-shallow list soon enough. He squeezed their hands together and then let them drop so that only their pointer fingers were hooked around each other. He swung their arms gently between them as they both continued down the hall. And for the record, my pinky toes are not weird looking. Mm, but are they vow-worthy, though? Cooper freed his hand reluctantly, knocked on James Finnegan's hotel door just in case, and then unlocked it to let them in. The thing about big chain hotels was that no matter how fancy the lobby, the hotel room still looked like a hotel room. Inoffensive art, offensive carpeting, neutral bedding, risky curtains. Everything always just a tad dated, if not for the phone charger hanging from the wall by the bed and the front desk's assurance they hadn't been allowed in for the last three days, Cooper would have been worried the staff had already cleaned out the room. It was that neat, that empty. Where's all this stuff? Well, the man's place did just burn down, Park said, opening the nightstand drawer to reveal a pair of glasses, Vaseline, a pack of gum, and a book on North American poisonous plants. 
but he's been living here for days. Where's his empty water bottles, used coffee cups, underwear on the floor? Cooper said, opening the desk drawer to find more of James's belongings. A laptop charger. The trust agents had likely confiscated the laptop itself already. Two more books, three pens in a row. I mean, come on, who the hell puts their pens in a drawer? Someone who likes order. Control. Park offered while Cooper searched the books, one on toxin-producing amphibians and the other on venomous snakes. I'm sensing a theme in his reading material, Cooper said, showing the titles to Park. The inside flap of each book was stamped with the National Zoo logo. They must have some kind of reading section, maybe at the visitor center. Or, Sophie said, they run a ton of educational programs and camps out of various buildings. Maybe they store these somewhere for reference and James borrowed them for some reason. Because he was intensely researching natural poisons, or because he needed an excuse to return to that space? Worth checking out tomorrow, Park said, and Cooper agreed. They made quick, methodical work of the rest of the room, finding nothing else of interest. The dresser drawers were full of neatly folded clothes, the closet jackets and shoes that had the laces tucked in. Cooper couldn't help but think of the way James's sneaker laces had floated in the pool. He shook the image out of his head and checked the bathroom. It was as painfully neat as the rest of the place, James's personal toiletries upright in a little leather bag. He didn't even need to sort through it to see there was nothing to find. Just every possible high-end hygiene product one might desire. Cooper was about to leave the bathroom when he noticed a small hotel brand conditioner bottle sitting on the edge of the tub. Why would a man who brought much nicer products, who needed to control everything, use this shit, just the conditioner no less, and then leave it out by itself? He picked the bottle up and shook it by his ear. He couldn't hear anything. Unscrewing the cap, Cooper squeezed the conditioner carefully out into the sink until it was nearly empty. He looked inside and saw a very small silver key. The sort one might use in a gym locker. Hello, Cooper murmured. In his periphery, he sensed Park come into the bathroom and shut the light off. What are you? Cooper felt Park's hand cover his mouth, and he looked up at him in shock but didn't try to pull away. Park slowly backed Cooper up and into the bathtub. He pulled the curtain carefully, halfway closed behind them, and only then released his hand from Cooper's mouth, letting it drop to hover almost defensively at his hip instead. With his other hand, he tapped his own lips with one finger. Quiet. Well, no shit. Cooper strained his ears to hear what Park did, but it was only a full minute later that he heard the hotel room door open and close slowly with the softest click. Careful footsteps moved into the hotel room. And right into the bathroom. Cooper cut his breath. The shower curtain was too opaque to see through, but it wasn't hard to track their visitors' movements through the room, searching through the same bag of toiletries Cooper just had. He looked down at the open bottle he still held in his hand, and more importantly, the key that was one movement away from rattling. Would the visitor notice the conditioner he'd poured into the sink? Would it make them suspicious? Would they take a closer look at the tub? The footsteps moved out of the bathroom toward the rest of the hotel room, and Cooper exhaled silently. When he heard the desk drawer being opened and searched, he slipped the bottle into his pocket. Park gestured in a complicated way. I'll go out, you stay here. Cooper gestured in a simple way with his middle finger, then suggested his own plan. I go, you stay, come after. Park frowned but nodded in agreement. It was the better plan, though more dangerous for Cooper. Everyone knew you sent out the pawn and kept your stronger player as the surprise weapon. Ace in the hole. They quietly got out of the tub, and while Park waited in the bathroom door, unseen but easily able to snag anyone who passed, Cooper made his way down the hall to peer around the corner. Their visitor had his back to him, searching the nightstand drawer. He appeared to be a white man, a good few inches shorter than Cooper, but much broader and very fit. 
a boxer's build. He was also wearing a balaclava and black latex gloves. Probably not housekeeping then. Cooper was just weighing his options when the man whipped around, ripping the nightstand lamp out of the wall as he spun and flung it directly at his head. It was an awkwardly shaped and clumsy weapon, easy enough to dodge, but that was clearly the tactic. As Cooper was ducking, the man was already moving forward and had one hand wrapped around Cooper's throat, silencing his shout. Meanwhile, his foot kicked out to sweep the ankles, but Cooper was familiar with this exact sequence of moves and was ready for it. As soon as the man's ankle hooked around his... When his balance was at its most precarious, Cooper threw his dead weight into the fall, knocking the man down with him. They both hit the ground hard, and the man grunted in surprise. Cooper used the moment to roll on top, sitting on the man's stomach. Too high up. The flexible, short-legged bastard swung his hips up, locking his calves around Cooper's neck, and on the downswing yanked him down, flat on his back, and the man practically straddling his head. Familiar eyes stared down at him from above the face mask. Neil? Cooper wheezed out. The eyes widened right before the man was seemingly plucked from the air, his weight disappearing from Cooper's chest and crashing somewhere across the room. In his place stood Park, looking down at Cooper and offering him a hand up. Can we please just go with my plan next time? He said mildly, not even winded. What are you talking about? Cooper let Park help him to his feet and then batted his hands away when they started searching anxiously for injuries. My plan worked perfectly. Oh? How do you figure that? Because I was too distracted to notice the stronger player come up behind me. Ace in the hole. The visitor said, picking himself up from where Park had tossed him against the wall. Park stiffened, preparing for retaliation, but Cooper put a reassuring hand on his arm. The man pulled his balaclava off, mussing his hair, and made a huge show of rubbing at his own clavicle, wincing. What a faker. Cooper couldn't help but notice how his feet were already back in fighting stance. They say the day your student bests you with your own moves, you'll burst with pride. But I gotta tell you, the only thing bursting is my shoulder right out of its socket. Cooper attempted a smile, but it felt weak and wrong on his face. Blood was rushing in his ears, adrenaline raging, and he thought it was only partially due to the fight. You've gotten slow. What happened to always assume everything's a trap? What happened to I'm never going to trust anyone enough to be their bait? The man shot back. His eyes flicked over Park with that same calculating stare Cooper remembered so well, like he was determining what part of you to eat now and what to save for tomorrow. Never always comes sooner than you think, Cooper said with a casual shrug, and Park shifted meaningfully beside him. This is Oliver Park, my partner. Oliver, this is... what are you going by these days? Still going by Brad yourself, are you? The man said without sparing Cooper a glance. He crossed the room to shake Park's hand. You can call me Neil. For now. Neil Gerhardt. Sorry about before. I hope I didn't scare you too badly. His voice was friendly and sounded genuine, if you didn't know him well enough to hear him testing Park's pride, or to catch the flex in his arm as he squeezed his hand. But you don't strike me as the skittish type. Park merely looked as amused as he always did when someone was attempting to establish a hierarchy with him. On the contrary... I'm as timid as a mouse, he murmured. Neil's eyes narrowed. Oliver, I told you I was assigned undercover for a bit with the FBI, Cooper said hastily. I worked most of my cases under Neil. He immediately wished he'd picked a different way of saying that and added, He was my supervisory agent. Now it seems like we might get the chance to work together again. Assuming that is you're in here investigating the murder of James Finnegan, not to put a mince on his pillow. Neil took them to a very well-lit and touristy bar because he claimed no one in his current undercover case would be caught dead in a place like this. Though maybe that's not the reassurance it once was, after poor Jamesy boy, he added, toasting the victim and sipping on his cider. They sat in a booth with Park and Cooper on one side, Neil on the other. 
It was difficult to say whether he'd changed in the five or so years since Cooper had last seen him. The trouble was, Neil was always changing, even back then. The darling of undercover, his ability to completely lose himself in any identity, to shift his mannerisms, personality, and core appearance so fundamentally it was unnerving, had been used as a gold standard to rookies like Cooper. To be partnered with him fresh out of grad school was an honor and a test. Or so he'd been told by everyone over and over. A test of what Cooper had never asked. Neil's hair was blonde now. Dyed, though Cooper only knew because he remembered the natural gray of his chest hair. The way it had felt springy and tough under Cooper's hands, his cheek, his lips. Neil had been almost twenty years older than Cooper then, so had to be in his mid to late fifties now. Looked it too, though Cooper would attribute that more to whatever role he was currently playing than the natural aging process. He had seen Neil look both decades younger and decades older than he did right now at various points in the four years they'd known one another. There had been a joke in the agency then. That there was no real Neil. That he was just a computer-programmed series of walking, talking skin suits the FBI trotted out for their most unethical work. The closer Cooper had gotten, the less he saw the humor in it. So, let me guess, Neil said. You're working the death. Cooper shrugged. He'd rather look hostile than get caught up in admitting they weren't working anything, just spending their free time snooping in the name of justice. A rather appalling hobby that Cooper should try quitting, or at least start getting paid for. I take it you're not? Ever hear of Genevieve Crane? Cooper glanced at Park compulsively. That woman again. For someone with a reputation for not showing up to her own shoots, she was certainly playing a leading role in multiple conversations he was having today. The name isn't big, but you'd recognize her if you saw her, Neil continued, not waiting for a response. She used to be an actress on one of those over-the-top, sexy, spooky high school shows with hot adult casts. Mom, my boyfriend's a minotaur, or something like that. Labyrinth of Love, Park said naming the show Ryan had mentioned. That's the one. After seven glorious seasons of getting erotically gored by Mikey the Minotaur and making bank on the con circuit, the show got cancelled. She did a sprinkling of guest roles here and there until she became the Ambassador of the Wild. Is that an elected position? Cooper said. Neil snorted. It's basically the pretty face some conservationist orgs paid to deliver some pleading lines in their ads. Pose with an elephant for an educational video. Drum up some money for the earth. But, you know, make it hot so people care. He twirled the bottle of cider between his fingers. Thing is, she sampled her own product, so to speak. Developed a real passion for saving the animals. Which animals? Park asked. Well, I saw her kill an ant once, but everything else seems pretty beloved, Neil said. She started her own conservation charity, Wild Nature. Makes her own educational videos now by partnering with various zoos and orgs around the world. Puts on events for her rich industry friends. Spends a few months a year organizing some auction or party. Raises buckets of money in one night. People show up in their five grand dresses and sign their one grand checks. Get a cute little tax deduction, go home knowing they've saved a turtle apiece and can rest easy until wild nature's next boozy bash. Earth, you're welcome. But at least you're not cynical about it, Cooper said. What's the FBI's interest? Same thing the FBI's always interested in, one way or another. Where's the money going? Not to the ants, I'm guessing, Park murmured. A percentage of it, sure, but this year just over three million dollars has gone the way of the dodo. Kaboof. Neil mimicked an explosion with one hand that transitioned into a little bow. Enter yours truly, J.T. Armstrong, Genevieve Crane's P.A. I've been trying to get a peek at Wild Nature's financials, but her husband Arthur sits on those like a dragon on its hoard. So, ex-actress, 
runs an embezzlement scam under the guise of a conservation charity, possibly with the help of her husband. Cooper summarized, What does any of this have to do with James Finnegan? Neil shrugged. Maybe nothing. But Genevieve has been filming this video series all over the zoo for months, doing some behind-the-scenes shit. The day in the life of a veterinarian, zoo's deadliest snakes, whatever. A month ago or so, James starts showing up at these sets. He's a keeper there, so I figure it's no big deal. Lots of the personnel get involved, help out. Arthur doesn't normally come along to those things, but one day, he swings by early to pick Ginny up and sees James. I'm telling you, I thought the guy was going to have a heart attack, just white as a sheet. He didn't say why? Cooper asked. He didn't say jack shit for the rest of the day. Just stood there like he was waiting for a bomb to drop. After that, James started coming to every single shoot. Genevieve's second shadow. He's everywhere she is. Harassing her? Park asked. I don't think so. They hardly ever spoke. And what did Genevieve think was happening? Park pressed. Neil frowned at him. I'm her PA, not her pen pal. She's not going to confide her feelings to me. Cooper bristled, feeling a surge of defensive anger for Park at Neil's dismissive tone, but tamped it down quickly, reflexively. It would be seen for what it was, a weak spot. And Cooper remembered not to reveal his weak spots to Neil at the same deep, instinctual level a soldier remembered to duck when a door slammed. What about Arthur and James? They ever talk? I couldn't catch Arthur looking at James. They acted like the other didn't exist. And aside from turning up at every shoot, Arthur went back to being his usual self. That is, until the fight. Cooper glanced at Park, surprised. Arthur and James fought? No, Arthur and Genevieve. Yesterday, Arthur just snapped. We were in the museum overseeing setup for the gala, and Arthur comes in. He's raving. I'm telling you, he's normally a really quiet guy, standoffish, but really controlled. Not then. Absolutely lost it. Said they were leaving, going back to California. Forget the fucking gala. There wasn't a moment to lose. And? Cooper prompted. And she says, hell no. She tells him she's leaving before the gala over her dead body. They scream some more, but in the end they stay. Neil tapped on the table thoughtfully. How was he killed? James. He was cut. Cooper's voice cracked embarrassingly and he cleared his throat. Lacerations to the abdomen. Neil stared at Cooper oddly, seeming to turn that information over for a long moment. Strange, he said finally. I had my money on poison. Surprised and a tad uneasy, Cooper glanced at Park, who looked utterly stone-faced. What makes you think that? Neil shrugged and shifted in his seat, eyes flicking to the side as a group of what looked like work colleagues, some of them in business attire, some in Halloween costumes, walked into the bar, bringing a draft of cool October air with them. Guess I can't imagine how else anyone got the drop on him. Man had a sixth sense for it. I couldn't tail him a block without turning the corner to find him staring at me, grinning. Hell, I had to wait till he was dead to get a look around his room. Neil laughed without humor, finished his cider, and put it back on the table with a loud clink. Some eulogy, eh? Second round? He asked, eyeing their drinks and then Park in a clear implication of who he wanted fetching them. Park turned to Cooper. Thirsty? He asked. Cooper wasn't. Desperately, he didn't want to sit here alone at the table with Neil and do anything remotely like reminiscing, as was clearly his intention. But he also thought agreeing to another round might work out some more details of the case. Because if he knew Neil, what they'd gotten was only a carefully curated 10% of the whole story. Sure, thanks, Cooper said. He carefully touched Park's foot with his own under the table and caught his responding ghost of a smile. Be right back. Cooper watched him walk to the bar, 
and turned to find Neil studying Park as well. You know, I heard you'd been scooped up by some elite, shadowy agency. That's your partner? Yes, Cooper said, painfully aware that Park was still close enough to hear them if he chose to. Let me guess. He's the strong and silent type. You don't know his type, Cooper said quietly. Neil looked at Cooper then, clearly performing surprise at his defensive tone. Fair enough, he said, raising his hands in acquiescence, supposedly unwilling to fight. Why did people always do that to him, like they were warding off evil? Cooper shook his head, irritated that he was already irritated. The FBI wouldn't send you undercover for some Hollywood embezzlement. My bright, clever boy. Neil smiled, and Cooper felt a flush of heat through his body that had nothing to do with pleasure. He leaned forward. Don't talk to me like that. Neil matched his pose, bringing their faces closer together. What's the matter? Don't like it when I stroke your ego anymore. Nah, you could never quite get the rhythm right. A flicker of something dark passed over Neil's face. It was the first organic, familiar expression yet, and Cooper couldn't stop the shiver of recognition as if his body had finally caught on to who it was sitting across from him and wanted to run away, screaming. Neil laughed, darkness gone as quick as it had come, making Cooper second guess if he'd seen it there after all, just like so many times before. The FBI suspects cartel connections, drug smuggling, you could say I was sent in to find the bigger picture. And? Have you? Oh, I found a picture all right. I'm just not sure what I'm looking at yet. Neil murmured. Cooper frowned and waited for an explanation. You've heard of conservation orgs backing paramilitary forces before, right? Getting involved in the politics of places they have no right to be, funding local violence. Sure, Cooper said. Is that what you think someone is doing here? I think James scared Arthur. Scared him a lot. Maybe whoever the Cranes are sending their embezzled money to sent a little present back to keep an eye on things. So Arthur got mixed up funding some, what, terrorist group cartel then killed his watchdog so we can take the money and run? Neil didn't answer. Instead, reaching for his cider, then seemed to remember it was empty and looked toward the bar. Cooper did, too. The group of partially costumed work colleagues had stumbled up front, and he couldn't spot Park anymore. I wasn't exaggerating when I said I couldn't get close to James, Neil said. He just... He had this way of looking at you, like he was reading your very skin, and he thought it was so very funny. His gaze was distant and his lips thin. You ever get that feeling that everyone else in the world knows something you don't? I'm not sure everyone in the world knows any one thing, Cooper said. Neil looked at him sharply. You got a similar injury to the Vicks a couple years back, didn't you? Got all cut up or something? You ever catch the guy who did it? Cooper hadn't, but his ex-BSI partner had. Caught him, killed him, and buried him deep in the woods with all his other victims. The only blood Jacob Simer spilled these days was in Cooper's occasional nightmare. Where'd you hear I was attacked? He asked. You've been building a solid little reputation for yourself, recruited right out of the hospital, jumping up the shadow ranks. At some point during their conversation, Cooper had leaned closer and closer to Neil. He started to sit back now, and Neil reached out and snagged one of his hands, tangling their fingers together loosely. There was nothing threatening about it. To anyone watching, it meant nothing more than a simple, wait, one more thing. But Cooper still felt a pulse of anxiety tinged with the usual disproportionate rage Dr. Rapodi had explained was his body releasing floodgates of adrenaline, gearing up to fight for its life. But there was nothing to fight. The only danger between them, the memories triggered by a touch too familiar, too intimate for who they were now. It should have been too intimate for who they were then as well, but that hadn't stopped Neil. 
and maybe a tiny little sliver of Cooper's rage was because of that, too. Speaking of... Neil said slowly, What's your agency's interest in poor, dead James Finnegan? If I told you, I'd have to turn in my cloak and dagger, Cooper said, and felt Neil's hand flex, squeezing his fingers too tightly for a moment. Always have to make a joke, Neil began, but applause erupted across the restaurant, distracting them both, and Cooper pulled his hand away. At one of the small tables near the back, a woman was getting up from one knee and hugging the woman seated in front of her, faces flickering between happiness and embarrassment. She was crying, the woman who had asked, while the other one kept leaning back out of the hug, laughing to thumb away the tears. Who the hell would want to get engaged in a place like this? Neil said, watching them. Cooper shook his head. He wouldn't personally. But then again, he'd proposed to Park in the hands-down ugliest bed and breakfast he'd ever seen after watching Park sleep off a near-death experience in fur and hadn't regretted it for one second. Cooper suddenly felt a bone-deep desire to be at home. To be away from here, away from Neil and in his own bed with his own fiance. I'm a woman in my late twenties, Neil murmured. He glanced at Cooper slyly. Play with me? It was a game they'd had. Putting other people's lives on like clothes. Something Neil had taught him to do. Cooper used to practice it almost compulsively to get into suspects' heads and predict their next move or to trace a victim's last steps. Not so much anymore, he realized, and wondered why. For old time's sake, Neil added. Cooper examined the newly engaged couple. Two small suitcases under the table, obviously tourists. We might have gotten into town late and didn't have time to drop them off before the reservation, or we just stopped by this place for a moment and I made a spur-of-the-moment decision to do it here. I couldn't wait. Too excited. Too anxious, Neil countered. The only appeal of this place is the views, but I bypassed the much nicer tables and chose one by the kitchen so I could sit with my back to the wall. Not comfortable in this space... I'm not crying because I'm happy. I'm overwhelmed by the attention, but I did it here anyway. Why? Cooper was getting into it despite himself. His competitive side at its worst. The food sucks. The drinks are weak, but it's pricey. Expensive still equals special in my mind. So does the novelty of a restaurant out of town. That plus getting on one knee, champagne on the table, rituals of a traditionalist. Mm. A conservative nuclear upbringing. And we all know how those do a number on you. My fiance is a fixer, though. She's been doing more soothing than celebrating. Gets off on saving someone. Then they should live happily ever after, Cooper said. Neil gave him a scornful look. They met when they needed each other most, but no one stays broken forever. I give them four good years. Seven till it's over over, which is more than they deserve for getting engaged in a bar that sells cocktails shaped like the Washington Monument. Cooper studied Neil. It was strange looking at him now. No longer through the eyes of a young adult on his first assignment with the FBI. Clay still wet and moldable, memorizing every lesson Neil taught him, believing it was a test and an honor to fuck such a clever, experienced man. He recognized so much of Neil that he had adopted into his own personality. He hated so much of Neil, too. And weren't circles the worst Venn diagram of them all? I'm getting married, Cooper said. His voice sounded calm, and it was deeply gratifying to see the look of genuine shock on Neil's face. To who? That guy? Neil jerked his head toward the bar, and Cooper nodded. He makes me happy. He considered that statement. How it didn't feel enough. I've never been happier. Well, congratulations. Neil was studying him with a slightly wary look. Happy looks good on you. Is this the part where you tell me you can't believe how much I've changed? Cooper asked. Neil laughed like he genuinely couldn't help himself. 
Cooper frowned. Why is that funny? Cooper, you haven't changed at all. You're the exact same ice-cold bastard you've always been. Don't get me wrong, it's fun. I'd almost forgotten that part. No one could ever quite keep me on my toes like you, but there's a reason they do a polar plunge and not a polar marathon. You're exhilarating in small doses. But if anyone stays in you for long, their dick's liable to fall off. Neil cocked his head, dragging over Cooper's body thoughtfully. Two, he said. What? Cooper asked numbly, still processing. I give you and him two good years, Neil shrugged. Like I said, people don't stay broken forever. Chapter 5 Park cut the ignition and they sat quietly in the driveway of their home, listening to the clicks of the cooling engine. Cooper had filled him in on the little bit more Neil had revealed about the cranes funneling money into a larger, violent organization. From what Neil described, it feels very likely that Arthur was also being blackmailed by James, Park said, unbuckling his seatbelt. The intimidation techniques... The insistence that he and Genevieve flee. Blackmailing him over what, I wonder, Cooper said. The embezzlement? Or is James the reason for the embezzlement in the first place? I think the only way to figure that out is to find what that key you found in his hotel room unlocks. We could go back to the zoo tomorrow. Get a better look around. Cooper hummed in acknowledgement. Sounds good. With the car off, the air was getting rapidly cooler, and he ran his fingers through the condensation on the inside of the window, making four straight lines down. Do you think the cranes are wolves? I don't know, Park said. I don't recognize the names. Hmm... It was well past sunset by now, but the moon was nearly full, and Cooper could easily see the tacky Halloween skeleton hanging from the porch eave, swaying in the wind. The silhouette of their house with its erratic add-ons, the unfinished porch, the shadow of a package that probably contained another absurd item Park had ordered to class up the joint. In short, their life together. The mashing together of two different people from two different worlds who had sort of just fallen into each other, wholly unexpectedly, unwillingly, uncontrollably. In some ways, their entire relationship had felt like tripping down a cliffside, shoved over the edge into the unknown, stumbling over all sorts of obstacles and pitfalls that hadn't done a whole hell of a lot to slow them down, caught as they were in the slipstream of gravity, pulled by a momentum so powerful, so inevitable, that it was never even an option to stop falling. The only concern, whether they would hit the bottom on their feet or their faces. Just two good years? No. No. Is everything okay? Park asked. You seem distracted tonight. Cooper turned to see Park watching him with concern. One hand on the car door handle, eyes collecting stray moonlight until they appeared reflective. Neil and I used to have sex, Cooper blurted out. Well, he could have eased into that with slightly more grace, but at least it was out there and he couldn't take it back. Park blinked, eclipsing twin moons. Ah... Sorry, I just wasn't sure if... I didn't want you to feel like I was keeping things from you. Is that... Okay? Cooper almost said like an idiot. Does that upset you? I don't think it's my right to be upset. Park said evenly. That's not an answer. Park acknowledged that with a tilt of his head. It's never going to bother me that you had a sex life before me. 
he said, which still somehow felt like avoiding the question, though Cooper wasn't sure why. How long were you together? Four years, more or less, Cooper said. Plus a handful of times after I left undercover, but that was, you know, nothing. Well, not nothing. What it had been was a series of mistakes once or twice a year when they ran into each other in the office. Relapses more than anything else. Then Cooper had been attacked and moved to the BSI, without any reason to run into Neil again, and a whole hell of a lot else in his mind. Cooper had just... stopped thinking of him. That was the unexpected and strange thing about traumas that changed the course of your life. They eclipsed the good and the bad parts alike. After a quiet moment, Cooper realized Park was staring at him, clearly surprised. What's wrong? Four years while you were working undercover, Park repeated. You must have gotten together very quickly. Cooper laughed. Yeah, you could say that. He blew me on my first day. Quite a welcome. He added in a mutter, remembering how shocked he'd been by the whole thing. Hours into the official start of his career, still agonizing over whether he wanted to be out at work or not, and practically the next thing he knew, Neil's hand was in his pants. Cooper shook off the memory and realized Park looked upset. He kicked himself. Sorry, too much information, obviously. That's not why I'm... Park bit his lip, cutting himself off and worried thoughtfully at the scar there. You must have been young, he said, sounding cautious for some reason. God, it feels that way now, Cooper said with a laugh. But I was halfway through my twenties already, definitely an adult by any definition. And he was your senior partner. On your first assignment, Park said, still in that strange, careful tone. Cooper caught on. It wasn't like that. He protested quickly. I wasn't pressured into anything. Park's expression didn't change. Seriously, I wasn't that new, and he wasn't my boss or anything. Distantly, Cooper recognized that if someone else were the one saying this to him, he would definitely still look as concerned as Park did. But it wasn't someone else saying it. It was his life, and he knew it wasn't like that. How could it have been when Cooper was, well, the way he was? It's not like I was much different then, you know. Probably even more of an asshole, if you can believe it. Cooper tried to explain. If anyone walked away fucked up from that relationship, it was him, as I'm sure he'll try telling you himself if we see him again. We had a lot of issues, but it wasn't, you know, whatever you were thinking it was. Park looked sad and started to say something. Don't, Cooper said without intending to, suddenly excessively irritated for reasons he didn't even understand himself. Park closed his mouth. The tender but wary look in his eye, plus his easy acquiescence to drop it, made Cooper feel impossibly fragile. He busied himself with getting out of the car, taking a moment to count his breaths the way Dr. Rapodi had taught him. The sharp October night air cooled his lungs and he felt instantly calmer, less trapped. The anger was gone as quick as it had come, replaced by shame. Behind him, he heard Park get out too. Even his silence was gentle. Cooper sighed. Sorry, I didn't mean to snap at you. You didn't, Park said. It's fine. He gestured at the house. You want to head in? You go ahead, I just... need a minute. There was a pause, but then Park nodded and headed into the house. The wind ruffled his hair and his hands were shoved into his jacket pockets, fiddling with something. Probably the house key. That was the one thing Cooper had been worried about with moving in together that he wouldn't be able to ask for space without it being a thing to be taken personally. But it hadn't been a problem because Park understood. He got it. Broken was an ugly word for people that Cooper wouldn't use, but it wasn't exactly breaking news that he and Park had met at a strange time in both of their lives. 
Cooper, still reeling from an attack that had deeply changed him both physically and mentally. Park, having just given up his whole life as a professor to root around in his own childhood trauma, only working for the trust as a favor to Cola in return for telling him the truth about his father's death and locating the mother who had abandoned him. No, neither Cooper nor Park had been two people at their emotional prime, though it had definitely presented differently. That didn't make it a wrong relationship. For both of them, the last year and a half had been as much about feeling safe enough to heal as it had been about falling in love. An opportunity neither had taken for granted. It had been Cooper's joy and privilege to see Park open to him slowly. Softly. To catch more and more frequent glimpses of the sweet, vulnerable man behind the blank mask and call him his. In turn, Cooper was trying to... God, was he trying. With the therapy and the communicating and the thinking before he spoke and the apologizing after he did. But that didn't change the fact that one of them was shedding walls to reveal literal fluffy goodness, and the other was shedding walls to reveal... well... the person Cooper had always been, he supposed. 3% less of a dick, 5 on a good day, and not one single degree warmer even at his best, even before the attack. He'd known Neil long before then, after all. What's that expression? You have a heart only a mother could love. Neil would always say to him and laugh. Cooper had laughed right along with him, why not? He could see the truth in it, under the sting. It wasn't like Neil meant to hurt him anyway. That was just how things were between them, with Cooper saying all sorts of harsh shit to him in return, both giving as good as they got. It had probably looked pretty toxic from the outside, but honestly, their relationship had been mostly uneventful. And yet for some reason he didn't fully understand, Cooper's whole being cringed at the thought of having to explain that to Park. It felt impossible to say without exposing the particular way being with Neil had made him feel bad. Not badly, but bad. Only people who don't know the real you think you're hot-tempered. But we both know you're cold inside. So cold it burns. Born empty. Okay, so maybe Neil had fucked him up a little after all. But it wasn't Park's job to fix him, nor was it his duty to wait around, possibly hindering his own growth, while Cooper floundered about, taking two steps forward, one step back, lashing out when uncomfortable, progressing, sure, but not fast enough. Cooper didn't believe anyone should have to stick out a relationship while their partner got their shit together. Not that they were going to break up. This was no longer a question of if they were going to make it or not. Nothing short of Park saying, I don't want to be with you anymore, could make Cooper leave him. Nor was he overconcerned that Park would have some massive change of heart either. Cooper knew they were in it for the long haul. Like he knew the world was round, or Mother's closing monologue of Psycho. But as someone who cared about Park, as his friend... He wanted better for him than that cold man with the hair-trigger temper that had turned Neil bitter and put the shadows in his eyes. Cooper didn't just want to make it. He wanted them to thrive. He wanted Park to feel the sort of nurtured, safe, joyful, happy that he'd given up on as an abandoned child. Cooper would get it back for him if it was the last thing he did. That was his own personal vow that had nothing to do with human matrimony rituals and everything to do with the man Cooper wanted to be for himself, for Park, for their lives together. He took one last deep breath of night air, feeling energized, purposeful, and focused in a way he hadn't in a while. Up in the sky, only the brightest stars outshone the moonlight, but were no less beautiful for their loneliness. He hurried inside, giving the floor vase still in its box a fond little pat, but found Park standing at the kitchen counter, just opening the mail. Oh, I just... Park started, quickly shoving what appeared to be an old sea captain's brass telescope back in the box. Cooper threw his arms around him, hugging him from behind. Park jerked, clearly surprised, and tried to turn around, but Cooper squeezed his arms tighter to stop him, and Park stilled. Accepting it. 
He obviously couldn't reciprocate like this, so he just continued to stand there, staring straight ahead while Cooper buried his face in the divot between Park's lower shoulder blades and breathed in and out, memorizing the smell of him, the exact level of heat his body radiated. Eventually, Cooper let go, and Park looked over his shoulder. That's the third hug of the day, you know, he said, curiosity burning in his expression. My diary entry tonight is going to be rife with exclamation marks and hearts. Maybe it wasn't a hug, Cooper said seriously. Maybe I was just patting you down for any more smuggled antiquities. He eyed the box that the telescope had disappeared into pointedly, and Park went slightly pink. That's my December purchase, he said hastily. But the auction was last week, and... Well, nautical spyglasses don't pop up that often, not in such good condition, anyway. Especially not Victorian, so... Cooper felt such a bolt of fondness it knocked his breath out of his chest. Settle down, Long John Silver. I'm not here to seize your booty. Tonight, he added after a small pause, and Park's eyes widened fractionally. I was just thinking about something and realized I could think about it even better while holding you. Ah, Park said after a moment, then crossed his arms and adopted a casual stance against the counter as if he could reclaim some of his dignity after that embarrassing break in character. Thinking about what? Oh, nothing new, just how I'm going to love the ever-loving fuck out of you for as long as you let me, Cooper said. Park blinked, a tiny, pleased smile sneaking into the corners of his lips. Really? He leaned forward and kissed the tip of Cooper's nose. I had no idea I was with such a poet. Hmm, what can I say? You inspire me. Cooper pretended to give him a critical once-over. Have you considered full-time muse work? You'd look very fetching, lounging in nothing but a sheet. You're ridiculous. Remind me again why I missed you so much while I was away. Park murmured and pulled Cooper close, touching his lips to his. It was a sweet touch more than any kind of passionate claiming, and it still made Cooper's knees buckle. Park held him up as he continued to press soft, tender kisses to the edges of his lips, his hands running up Cooper's sides to the back of his neck and tracing down the back of his arms. Cooper flinched and hissed when Park's hand passed over his elbow. What? Park asked, concerned, already easing Cooper's sleeve up to look. A brutal bruise had ripened around the bone from when Neil had slammed him onto his back. Park traced the edges of the dark bloom without touching, face suddenly impassive. It's fine, Cooper said quickly, reluctant to start talking about Neil again and see worry in Park's eyes. Or worse, pity. I'm not that delicate. Park must have heard the plea for what it was because all he said was, I don't think I've ever seen you fight hand-to-hand -hand before. Yeah, well, murder investigations call for a lot less fisticuffs than Sam Spade led me to believe. You're better than I thought. Cooper snorted. Thank you to the peanut gallery for that not-at-all condescending compliment. I do have almost a decade more field experience than you, Professor. Why is it that you always seem to forget I was an infamous pack enforcer feared around the continent? Park asked thoughtfully. No, please, you're not so tough. He poked Park in the belly lightly, and Park seized his wrist, twisted him around, switching their positions, and had him bent over the kitchen counter before Cooper could even register what was happening. You lock your knees when you tense. That's why it's so easy to overbalance you, Park murmured behind his ear. Hey, Cooper said a little breathlessly. Park's weight, at least partially on his back, pinning him down while his arms acted as a cushion between Cooper and the granite. Is this foreplay or the start of a training montage? He arched his spine suggestively. Because if you want, I'll let you teach me how to bend my knees properly either way. Park huffed a laugh. The puff of breath on the back of Cooper's neck made him arch again instinctively this time. 
the tickle of arousal unfurling lazily in his belly. Park dragged his hands possessively over Cooper's chest, rubbing his nipples up to his sensitive throat and then back down his torso, tracing down the grooves of his hips. Cooper widened his stance welcomingly and felt something hard, something unexpectedly hard, in Park's pocket, like he'd bundled up thick cloth. Curious, Cooper reached back for it, and Park abruptly jerked away to standing. What's wrong? What is that, a matching captain's compass? Cooper asked. No, it's nothing, Park said, blank-faced. Cooper took a step forward, and surprisingly, Park took a step back. Cooper raised an eyebrow, took another step forward, and again Park stepped away. Are you trying to tango with me? I'm more of a foxtrot sort of guy. Park's hand rested defensively over his pocket. Tell you what, if you're so curious, why don't you put these legendary ten years of experience in the field to use and come take it from me? A surprised laugh escaped Cooper. Is that a challenge? For me, not at all. Not even if I was blindfolded with one hand behind my back. Cooper snorted but couldn't deny the flicker of excitement and interest as well. Park's cockiness awoke something in him. Competitiveness, perhaps. Or something even more primal. He felt energized at the prospect of tussling with Park. All the pent-up frustration, adrenaline, anger buzzing under his skin and begging to be used. Released. This was precisely what he needed right now, and Park clearly knew it. Cooper shouldn't have been surprised. Park knew him. People were rarely that complicated, but even less often were they generous. Park could have decided to be jealous, or that he wanted to keep talking about Cooper's relationship with Neil. He could have requested details, could have felt angry for him, sorry for him. He could have wanted to be tender and soft and gentle with Cooper, which would have only made him feel more fragile, fractured, hurt. Instead, Park was offering controlled, consensual roughness, and Cooper was grateful more than he knew how to put into words. That was okay. There were other ways to show appreciation. You talk big, Cooper said. I am big, Park winked. It's the pictures that got small. Prove it. Park moved quickly, too quickly for Cooper to do much of anything, even if he'd wanted to. He found himself bent backward on the countertop, Park standing between his legs. Hands gripped the backs of his knees and tugged him forward so he bumped firmly against Park once, twice. Cooper groaned and Park leaned over him, trapping his body to the marble. Easy, he murmured and kissed the vulnerable spot under his jaw. With effort, Cooper put a hand to Park's chest. Stop. Park did and started to back away, but Cooper gripped his shirt and held him there. That wasn't fair. I believe you said something about being blindfolded with one hand behind your back. Park's eyes darkened. Unless you've changed your mind, of course. Park stood, pulling out of Cooper's hold, breathing a bit heavily, as if stopping himself from touching was the first time he'd needed to expend any effort. Living room. Five minutes. Bring your choice of blindfold. And my dueling pistol? Cooper asked, amused, standing. I was thinking a good old-fashioned crossing of swords. Park squeezing himself through his pants. Deliberately crude. Cooper felt his own breath catch, and he had to swallow a sudden excess of spit. All right. Five minutes he said roughly, and stalked out of the kitchen, hurrying upstairs. They'd bought a blindfold from a sex shop a few months ago, but after a couple unsuccessful attempts, Cooper had decided it wasn't his thing. It wasn't that he was upset or turned off by it per se, just that he kept compulsively pulling it down to see what was going on. I'm sorry, I can't help it, Cooper had said when Park got exasperated with him just wearing it over his eyebrows like a bandana, and said he drew the line at Rambo roleplay. I like looking at you. An understatement, if there ever was one. 
Still, they hadn't bothered trying the blindfold again, and Cooper found it shoved in the back of a drawer upstairs behind other, more successful items. He grabbed it now, and because luck favored the prepared, tucked lube into his pocket as well. Back downstairs in the living room, Park had pushed the coffee table to the side and was perched casually on the couch arm. His expression was slightly more unsure than before, as if wavering on the edge of some decision, and the moment Cooper walked into the room, he examined him very intensely. Are you sure this is going to be okay for you? Park asked, which was about as close to him bringing up Cooper's PTSD without an explicit invitation as he got. Yes, Cooper said quickly. Are you? He stepped between Park's legs, twirling the blindfold from his finger teasingly. You do the honors, Park gestured, and Cooper carefully fitted the blindfold over his head and eyes and then gently readjusted where it was pulling, taking the opportunity to run his hands through Park's thick hair. Okay, Cooper checked, and in response Park leaned forward, pecking him unerringly on the lips. Hey, Cooper protested. Can you see? Love looks not with the eyes, but with the mind, Park said smirking. And the ears and the nose. What does love smell like, then? Cooper said, taking a step back with one last reassuring squeeze to Park's thigh. At the moment, a bit like catnip, unfortunately, Park said but smiled fondly, looking much more relaxed now. He followed Cooper's movement without the least bit of hesitation, and belatedly Cooper remembered a conversation he and Park had once had about how wolves didn't primarily rely on their sight the way most humans did. The blindfold wasn't going to slow Park down any more than sticking a clothespin on his nose would slow down Cooper, and from the amused quirk to his lips, Park had always known it. That being said, Cooper took a long, uninhibited look and couldn't regret the turn things had taken. Blindfolded and barefoot, with his shirt untucked and the first couple of buttons undone and his hair in disarray from Cooper's fingers, Park should have looked utterly vulnerable, but he didn't. There was a predatory sort of stillness to him as he easily tracked Cooper. The juxtaposition of it was, well, erotic for some reason like the blindfold had done nothing but highlight certain qualities Park usually kept hidden. Cooper had the sudden sensation of being on the edge of another exhilarating fall. You'll have this forever, he thought suddenly. This moment, this memory, no matter what happened in the future, no one could take away from the fact that imperfect Cooper Dayton had found his own perfect love. He'd never felt more stupidly lucky in his whole life. Cooper darted forward without a word, hoping for the element of surprise, but Park caught his arm as easily as if it were choreographed and pulled Cooper over, causing him to stumble into Park's chest with a grunt. He felt Park's mouth drag along the side of his neck before nipping him lightly. Got you, he murmured, more vibration against the skin than actual speech. Cooper sucked in a breath and tugged away, Park letting go of him immediately. That was just a test, Cooper warned him. Park nodded solemnly. Did I pass? Cooper lunged for him again, this time twisting and ducking in anticipation and made it close enough to touch Park's leg before he was grabbed around the waist and felt the ground fall away. He just had enough time to register being in the air before he landed, bouncing harmlessly on the couch face up. Park stood over him, still blindfolded, and cocked his head. He stroked two fingers up Cooper's neck, over his chin, and tapped it against his lips, which parted obediently, and then he dipped briefly in and out of his mouth. Got you. Cooper scrambled up to standing, torn between arousal and something with a darker edge. This time he genuinely tried. Circling Park, dodging his reach, darting forward and back. Sight wasn't the advantage he'd hoped for, but there were other things he did have on his side. One, he was very twisty. 
too. Park would never hurt him or let him hurt himself. Three, he had a pretty good idea based on the last two attempts what Park was going to try to do. He lasted twice as long before Park caught him around the waist and tugged him close. But having anticipated this, Cooper was already shooting his hand up between them to grab the back of Park's neck. Got you, Cooper said. Park went strangely motionless, not even breathing, the wolf of him docile and submissive to the dominating touch at his nape. Cooper knew instinctively he could claim his prize, the mystery item that had started all this, and Park still wouldn't move or protest. Instead, Cooper leaned in and nudged Park's nose with his own. Kiss? He asked softly. Park's arms immediately came up around him and pulled their mouths together, one hand fisting into Cooper's hair, the other cupping his ass and pulling him firmly closer and closer until Cooper had to break away with a gasp. Without pause, the hand in his hair tilted his head back and Park just continued kissing across his jaw, behind his ear for a toe-curling moment and then down his throat. Cooper shoved his hands between their bodies and fumbled Park's belt off and his pants open just enough to yank everything down his thighs, freeing his cock. When Cooper grasped it, hot and hard in his hand, Park bit down on the flesh between his neck and shoulder, groaning. Cooper only stroked him once, twice, before shoving Park away firmly. Pants caught halfway down his legs, Park toppled backward and landed with an oomph on the couch, blindfold still in place. You should bend your knees, Cooper teased. After you, Park countered, and Cooper complied, lowering himself to the floor at Park's feet and immediately burying his face between his legs. He nuzzled the base of Park's cock, inhaling the comfortingly familiar scent, then gently began to mouth his balls. Park shuddered and both of his hands came down on Cooper's head, petting his hair reverently at first, then gripping tight when Cooper made his way up and started to suck Park's dick instead. Cooper let it happen for a bit, working him farther and farther down his throat with Park's encouragement. But when his hips started to switch, Cooper pulled off. A reluctant little sigh turned whimper escaped Park's mouth, and Cooper smiled. It was funny how such a simple sound could make him feel almost decadently desirable. He stood, quickly shucking his clothes and rescuing the lube from his pants pocket. He tossed it underhand at the couch and felt a flicker of adrenaline when Park caught it in the air without sight. Blindfolded with one hand behind your back, Cooper said, voice rough. So how come I felt two tugging my hair and choking me on your cock? Maybe superhearing was contagious because he was positive he could detect Park's eyebrows quirk beneath the silky black cloth. If this is how you fight, I think we need to have a talk. This is how I win, Cooper said, straddling Park's lap comfortably. He grabbed Park's right wrist and pinned it to the back of the couch by his shoulder. Now you're going to stay right here while I open myself up. And when I'm ready, I'm going to ride you. He brushed his thumb over Park's lips lovingly. I'm going to use your fat, pretty cock like my own personal toy. Okay? Park nodded eagerly. Yes. Yes he said, passing Cooper the lube. Cooper reached back and began to prepare himself with one hand, the other keeping Park's wrist trapped. Park pressed his face against Cooper's chest, just breathing deeply at first, but soon his free hand crept to Cooper's waist, then from his waist to his ass, massaging the flesh there and inching toward where Cooper was stretching himself. Then he traced the rim and Cooper felt Park shudder beneath him, he began to nip and suck sloppily at Cooper's chest, murmuring something into the skin. 
When Cooper was ready, he kissed the top of Park's head. Scooch, he said, repositioning them so that he could guide Park's dick between his cheeks, just teasing them both like that for a moment before fitting the head to his hole and working himself down gradually, whimpering a bit at the stretch he hadn't felt since they'd fucked goodbye last week in the airport parking lot. When Cooper was finally seated, Park let out a desperate, primitive groan but didn't move his hands. They both sat still for a moment, adjusting to the sweep of raw emotion that came from cohabitating. Briefly. Partially. A single body. Cooper pressed his lips to Park's. It didn't have the finesse of a kiss so much as it was breathing together, panting into each other's mouths. When he finally began to move, rolling his hips, his own dick brushed maddeningly against Park's shirt, wilted with the humidity of their sex-hot bodies. Cooper fumbled at the buttons and yanked it down to his elbows, trapping Park's arms at his sides. The sight of him, restricted by his clothes, sloppily pushed to the side, blindfolded and sitting low on the couch, and the way he felt distractingly large inside Cooper with every circle of his hips made soft pleasure sharpen into a different need. Cooper began to ride him properly, with intent. God, you feel so good, he gasped, bouncing in Park's lap, so deep. Park dug his head back against the couch cushions and whined, clearly struggling to keep still. Cooper, my Cooper, he groaned, mouth slack with pleasure. Needing to see him, Cooper pulled the blindfold down without warning so that it hung around Park's neck, and was momentarily taken aback by Park's eyes glowing gold and inhuman. Obviously startled, too, Park stared at him for a millisecond before blinking hard, and suddenly his eyes were the same amaretto brown they usually were. Sorry, he murmured quickly, but Cooper shook his head. It's fine, don't be. It stopped moving and just sort of sat there, in danger of losing the moment despite the fact that Cooper was still stuffed full of Park. A strange to be tied together in the most physically intimate and vulnerable way and still be hiding parts of your body. Yourself. Can you... You can change them back, if you want, Cooper said, if that's more comfortable for you. Park studied him cautiously, and Cooper was almost sure he wouldn't do it. He had just enough time to feel disappointed and then wonder why he was disappointed when Park's eyes changed again, this time without blinking, so Cooper could watch them brighten and expand, obliterating the whites like clouds over the moon. Cooper's heart rate felt loud in his ears. He reached up slowly to cut Park's face, thumb brushing the softest skin just below his dark bottom lashes. This close... His eyes looked a bit like gold flakes exploding out of a darker cloud of bronze that lined the pupil. How are you so beautiful? He whispered and tentatively rolled his hips. Park's eyes fluttered, and he abruptly growled, ripping out of his tangled shirt with a flash of claws. Free. He grasped Cooper's ass firmly, holding him in place on his dick as he stood. Cooper gasped and clung to Park's back as he was picked up and turned around before being eased down on the couch. Flat on his back, legs bent and spread with Park positioned between them, pressing his thighs back, Cooper grabbed the blindfold hanging loose around Park's neck. God, Oliver! Cooper groaned, pulling gently but insistently on the black silk around Park's neck. Please! Say it, Park growled. Tell me what you want me to do to you. Cooper gathered the blindfold in his fist until it sat snug on Park's throat. Like this, it couldn't possibly choke him, but it did give Cooper a sort of makeshift collar to tug on. 
which he did. Fuck me. I want you to fuck me. How do you want me to fuck you? Hard, Cooper begged. So hard I can't move tomorrow without remembering who, who I belong to. Park snarled, pulled back, then slammed into Cooper. At this position, it felt impossibly deep, and a prickle of tears appeared as Cooper's heart launched up into his throat. Not pain, exactly, but surprise, and that bone-deep ache of being completely and utterly taken. He was just able to focus on catching his breath when Park thrust into him again and again, setting a demanding pace that Cooper urged on, guiding him, pulling him deeper, closer with one hand and grasping his own dick with the other, stroking himself frantically. Whose ass is this? Park demanded. Tell me who owns your slutty little hole. Yours, yours, Cooper said. He started to moan, approaching the edge now, punctuated by gasps and the slap of flesh on flesh. Cooper registered distantly that Park was staring down at his face intently, pupils so blown that all that remained was gold rings. Gold rings. Cooper was sure that any other time he'd think connecting Park's friggin' eyes to wedding rings, embarrassingly trite, nonsensical sentiment he'd rather die than repeat— but right now, on the edge of orgasm, system going haywire, it seemed like the most poignant, poetic miracle in the universe. Cooper laughed as he came, overflowing with feeling, pleasure, and joy. He felt Park stiffen and jerk his own orgasm deeply within, making a broken sound before collapsing heavily on top of him, forcing Cooper's legs farther apart in a way that would have been uncomfortable if he had been capable of noticing anything but banked satisfaction. They drifted for one or many moments before Park pulled out and rearranged them on the couch, rolling Cooper over to rest face down on Park's chest, lulled by his heartbeat. Soon, Cooper's body would protest with all the dismay and outrage of middle age, but for now... All the happy sex hormones and quite possibly shock at the audacity of it all kept his bones relatively silent. Park's hand stroked lazily up and down his spine. He was just resigning himself to sleeping on the couch when Park spoke, his chest rumbling beneath Cooper. I know we like to laugh during sex, but cackling as you come is a new one he said mildly. Hmm, I was struck by something poetic. Blame my muse. Does your muse get to hear the poetry? Cooper smiled, but wasn't quite willing to expose his rambling sex brain thoughts, which, as predicted, seemed entirely absurd now. Park couldn't even wear rings because of the shifting. So Cooper just pressed a lazy kiss to his chest and dodged the question with some improv. Oh, Oliver. Another kiss to his collarbone. You turn up my thermometer. Mm, it's true, I'm no philosopher, but I think therefore I am in love with you, my Oliver. Park sighed. To think I inspired such fine art, what a legacy I'll leave. Cooper's mouth moved, but he was so tired, even he wasn't quite sure what he was trying to say, and he was half asleep when Park spoke again. Do you want your prize? Mm hmm? Cooper asked, forcing his eyes back open with significant effort. The thing in my pocket. Do you want to see it? Park half-heartedly reached in the direction of his pants, Abandoned on the floor somewhere, but Cooper caught his arm and pulled it towards his face instead. He kissed the inside of Park's wrist gently, then dragged his teeth up his forearm and placed another soft, ticklish kiss to the crook of his elbow. I got what I came for. He snorted with his eyes closed. Came for? <laughs> his face landed heavily back on Park's chest. Your surrender is all the reward I need. 
It's true. I did surrender, Park murmured, sounding soft and even a little surprised. I surrender everything to you, heart and soul. Cooper hoped he said something nice back before he drifted off completely, but couldn't be sure. With Park, sometimes it was hard to tell what was real life and what was just a really lovely dream. Chapter 6 Show business didn't take a day off for death, and neither did whatever sort of business involved coaxing a TT monkey with a bit of fruit into perching on the exact right branch while three camera crewmen, four supervising zoo employees, and about twelve other people with unclear purposes stood around calling out unhelpful suggestions. Sophie wasn't working today. No reptiles on the docket. But she had told Cooper that wild nature conservation would be filming inside the Amazonia exhibit, a brick building with an odd medley of fish, frogs, snakes, and monkeys that could be found by the Amazon River. Most of the building was very dark, to better highlight the tanks and who was inside them. But in one section, the monkeys were free to swing about the mini jungle in natural morning light, apparently free of noticeable confinement. Cooper had to pause just inside the space to let his eyes adjust to the brightness. That curator Ryan wasn't exaggerating when he said people liked to hang around the sets, Park murmured. No, and I can't imagine that helps keep the animals calm and cooperative, Cooper said, watching the puffy little brown monkey flee farther into the trees. Is it a bit strange they're filming today? Park asked. James's blood is still being filtered out of the sea lion pool down the road and all that. I got the impression from Sophie that they're running hugely behind schedule. There's some kind of screening at the gala tonight, and they were supposed to launch a lot more content as a follow-up to that. But it's going poorly, and Hirano is under a lot of pressure from all the people she's persuaded to invest in this. Hirano was there today, among the crowd watching. Cooper also recognized the curator Ryan and close to the barrier to keep zoo patrons from walking directly under the monkeys, looking every inch a nervy personal assistant with his coffee and touchpad balanced in his hands, Neil, or J.T. Armstrong as his cover story claimed. I was thinking we could get lunch in town after this, Park said, interrupting his thoughts. Since we didn't get to go last night... That Cajun place you like is nearby. Maybe we could walk there. Talk. Mm, sure, that sounds good. Cooper said, then narrowed his eyes suspiciously at Park. Why are you so determined to eat out all of a sudden? I said I'd go shopping if you made me a list. Park appeared very focused on the various people, still trying to tempt the monkey back into the spotlight. I will. I just missed you this week. I want to spend time with you. Cooper raised an eyebrow. I want to spend some non-naked, non-working time with you as well. All right, lunch out it is, but straight back to naked work after. If you wish, Park said, still watching the crowd, but he looked unaccountably pleased. A small, satisfied smile curling the corners of his lips as he rocked onto the balls of his feet and bounced a little. Speaking of work, we should talk to the cranes separately, don't you think? Cooper asked. Yes, that's Genevieve Crane, Park said, drawing Cooper's attention to the woman standing beside Neil, studying a piece of paper. She was white, anywhere from twenty-five to forty-five, nearly as tall as Cooper and very pretty, though he couldn't quite point to why exactly. She had flat brown hair and flat brown eyes, and she didn't appear to be wearing any makeup, though that perception was definitely just due to his own ignorance, because a second woman with buzzed peroxide blonde hair and an enormous fanny pack could clearly be seen dabbing at Genevieve's face with various size brushes. Both of them looked vaguely familiar, but he couldn't really place why. Are you sure? Cooper asked. Is she... He trailed off suggestively, curious to know if she was a werewolf, but not wanting to risk being overheard. 
Ark huffed a laugh. I can't tell yet if she's... He teased. There's definitely traces of a wolf in here, but there's too many people and unfamiliar animal scents to track who it belongs to or how fresh it is. Then how do you know? Park shrugged. I recognize her from Labyrinth of Love. You've seen her show? Cooper asked, surprised. Oh, yeah, more than once years ago. She had a minor role. The little town of Crete had to deal with a new monster every week. They never did werewolves, which was disappointing. But there was a siren named Sebastian on season five that... Oof. Park blew out a long breath. Let's just say he could wreck my ship any day. Cooper laughed, astonished. <laughs> Oliver Park, I'm literally speechless. Park shrugged. It was a very fun show. He hesitated. I was a bit... at a loss when I first left teaching and joined the Trust. I went from a large pack to being alone. From colleagues who were interested in the work I was doing to... Well, you see how it is. Cola has been good to me, but it's not likely I'm ever going to be close with anyone else there, is it? Not with my past. Cooper felt a surge of defensive anger. He shifted to stand closer and subtly press his shoulder to Parks. It's not a big deal, Parks said quickly, though he did lean back into Cooper. And it's all worked out for the best now, of course. But there was a time in the beginning there when the dramatics of Mikey the Minotaur and his best friends at Crete High were very... comforting. Just when I think I've plumbed the last of your hidden depths, you reveal something like this. Ask nicely and I'll let you plumb my depths tonight while we watch season five of Labyrinth. You're in a good mood, Cooper noted. Park cocked his head. I am. I have a feeling this is going to be a very good day. I had an excellent night and an excellent part too this morning, he added, looking pointedly at Cooper, who felt himself flush. I have a couple possible promising avenues of investigation on this case. Lunch plans this afternoon with the love of my life, and if I'm very, very... Lucky later. He subtly dragged his finger up the back of Cooper's thigh. I might just get Genevieve Crane to give me that siren's number. Cooper cut off a burst of laughter as Hirano approached, and he and Park took casual steps away from each other. Back again, I'm guessing not for a third tour, she said with some bite. Looked like she was well aware of who they really were now. Inevitable after they had secured the scene yesterday. We're here to speak to Arthur and Genevieve Crane, Park said smoothly. Is Mr. Crane here? He's around here somewhere. Talk all you want to him. In fact, I'd appreciate you keeping him out of my hair. But I need Genevieve shooting with no distractions. We've already had too many upsets this morning. Everyone working yesterday was called in for questioning this morning, leaving us with the B team a substitute makeup artist she isn't used to, and a substitute film crew unused to her. Thanks very much to your boss, that cola woman, Hirano said sarcastically. Cooper looked toward the set and saw that the makeup artist was gone, and that Genevieve had taken her position as close to the perched monkey as was allowed. She looked very smooth and professional, nothing like the flighty stereotype he'd been imagining based on Hirano's comments and he was about to say something to that effect when one crew member shouted something to another, laughed loudly, and the monkey dropped his fruit and fled deep into the foliage. Are you kidding me? Genevieve demanded. She had a very clear, ringing sort of voice that swept out over the suddenly dead silent onlookers. No, really, is this some kind of joke to you? I was under the impression that we were all professionals, here to complete one simple shot on a deadline, but apparently I was wrong, my mistake. Her words were getting more and more enunciated, 
until she was spitting consonants more than anyone else. Please go on. I wouldn't want the job we're all here to finish interrupting your extremely important conversation. Just let me know when you feel like working so I don't continue to waste your precious fucking time. Genevieve spun on her heel and walked briskly out of the room, yanking furiously at the heavy door to get out of the monkey area with a great whoosh of air. Cooper noticed Neil slip out after her before the door could fully close. Looks like Crane's taking her break now, so this is your chance to speak to her. Hirano murmured sweetly after a moment of stunned silence. Do me a favor and let her know we need her back on set in twenty. Thanks, Cooper said. I appreciate that. Hirano started to walk away, but he stopped her. Just a couple of questions before we go. How old did you know James Finnegan? Me? My work is to manage the education and publicity programs, oversee our nonprofit volunteer base. I only work with the keepers peripherally. But we heard Mr. Finnegan often hung around these shoots, which you also oversee, isn't that correct? Cooper asked. Hirano stared at him blankly for a long moment, and he almost thought she was going to deny it. But finally her eyes flicked between him and Park, and she almost resignedly said, Yes. Yes, he was here often, but I wouldn't say I knew him well. Your curator, Mr. Basque, said James had a talent for handling animals. Cooper said, nodding at Ryan, who had joined the efforts to coax the TT monkey back. He said they loved James, and people like Genevieve appreciated his presence here. Would you say that's true? Hirano's eyes narrowed. Undomesticated animals don't love people. They're not your pets. They can become accustomed to us, even occasionally playful with us. But the quality of the relationships is based on what service the human provides them and how well their signals are respected. James understood that. And he understood them. When to approach and when to back off. Would you say he ever received any signals to either approach or back off regarding Ms. Crane? Park asked. You work quickly. Hirano laughed, and her gaze drifted in the direction that Genevieve had disappeared. I think you'll find more clarity in that regard if you go speak to Crane now. But I will say that today is the first day in a long time that her husband is not hovering on set, so if he was worried about something, that something no longer seems to be an issue. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have feathers to unruffle. She left to speak with the crew. Seems like that's two people who believe Arthur had something to gain from James's death, Park noted. And two people who have avoided giving a clear answer as to how Genevieve might have felt about it herself, Cooper added. Shall we ask her ourselves? They started walking in the direction that Genevieve and Neil had left in. I did manage to catch her scent when she opened the door, Park said as they did the same leaving the bright open monkey space for the dark interior of the building with another whoosh of air. She's human. Which doesn't exclude her as a suspect. It is possible that none of this has anything to do with James being a werewolf or ex-rebel pack leader, Cooper mused. He was blackmailing at least one, if not two people, and possibly mixed up with embezzlers who are being watched by the FBI. Not what I'd call a quiet retirement. But to be slit in the belly like that? Cooper touched his own stomach reflexively, feeling it clench and swoop. A number of weapons could have been used to do that. Someone hoping to pin it on a werewolf, or even a zoo animal. Local zookeeper mauled to death. Accident. Then whatever made his face slip made the killer panic. Change of plan. They walked down a long, dark, curved hall with low lighting directed at various plaques about the Amazon River. I suppose that depends on what the tox report says. Hmm, Cooper said, thinking. Did you happen to see the makeup artist Hirano said was filling in? I suppose. Why? I'm pretty sure I saw her at the zoo a couple days ago, when I was here with my family. Park shrugged. Is that strange? Irano said she was B-team. Maybe she was working that. Cooper was looking directly at Park, so he saw the moment he stopped speaking 
and his nose wrinkled as if catching the scent of something surprising. Wait, Park said, but Cooper had already turned the corner and caught Genevieve and Neil quickly shuffling away from each other, silhouetted against the enormous, luminescent fish tank that took up the entire thirty feet of wall. Behind them, Cooper could see ugly gray tube-shaped fish drifting past and a rapidly fading handprint on the glass. His gaze immediately shot to Neil, surprised, and found Neil staring back with an expression so furious Cooper stumbled a bit. Sorry, I believe this building is closed to the public today, Genevieve said in that ringing voice. Park took out his badge and Cooper belatedly reached for his own as well. Genevieve Crane... I'm Special Agent Park, and this my partner, Agent Dayton. We'd like to ask you a couple of questions regarding James Finnegan. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought, of course, I'm happy to help any way I can, that poor man. She swept her hair out of her face, and the light of the fish tank cast blue shadows on her skin. This close, he could see she was definitely on the 45 end of the age range, or perhaps even older. Still beautiful, of course, but with harder edges and thinner wrapping. Wet lambskin draped over marble. This is my assistant, JT, she said, gesturing to Neil, who didn't even pretend to acknowledge them. I'm not sure how much help we can be, though. I just met Mr. Finnegan recently, here, during filming. We're speaking to everyone who might have spent time with him this last week. Standard procedure, Park said. We'd like to talk to your partner after this, too. You mean Arthur, really? I think you might be disappointed. He spoke to James even less than I did. Nevertheless, Cooper said, sometimes an outside perspective is the most helpful. Neil interrupted. Excuse me, if you don't need me, I should be getting back to work. And walked abruptly away, brushing past Cooper. No, oh, please don't mind him, Genevieve said. I'm afraid I've been a bit short-tempered myself. We're all under some stress at the moment, this horrible death, and just before the gala tonight, I'm sure you think we're total ghouls, but it's not really something you can cancel. Of course not, Park said evenly. Maybe that was just to build rapport with her, but Cooper wouldn't be surprised if he'd been to more than a few galas already himself and knew what he was talking about. Seemingly bolstered by Park's agreement, Genevieve continued. We've worked very hard on it, Arthur, Nico, and I. Everyone on the project has, here at the zoo and at Wild Nature. We have almost 200 guests registered, a musical performance, catering. It's really quite crucial this evening's a success. 200, Cooper repeated. At 850 particular more? Sounds like you've succeeded already. Oh, ticket prices are a small percentage of it, enough to cover our expenses, but a lot still depends on how tonight goes. There's the live auction, raffle, and any commitments we can raise in the moment. That's where the real measure of success is taken. Her eyes darted between the two of them. Please, let me offer you a couple of tickets. It would mean a lot to me that you were there. I'm afraid we can't accept, Park said apologetically. It would be a conflict of interest, but I'd be happy to purchase two tickets. Cooper tried not to wince. Oh, how lovely, Genevieve beamed, her teeth very white. Thank you for your contribution to our cause. She cocked her head and seemed to examine Park. You said your name is Park, didn't you? Any connection to the Park Foundation? Ah, Park said. My family's project. I can't say I've been involved in years. That did nothing to temper Genevieve's delight. I'm a huge admirer of the charity work they've done, particularly their contributions to the global conservation efforts. It's really a gold standard for us all. Habitat conservation is very near and dear to my family's hearts, Park said mildly. How long have you and your husband been running wild nature? Genevieve's smile turned a bit sharp and stiff. Wild nature is my baby. 
I gave up my acting career and invested everything into getting her up off the ground. And even then I had to call in a lot of favors. It was tough in the beginning, but we've come an enormous way. Arthur only came on a few years ago. You met through conservation work? Cooper asked. Oh, no. Genevieve laughed. He's the most appalling city boy. Arthur's background is in financial management. Three years ago, he interviewed to be our treasurer. I suppose you could say it was a whirlwind office romance. Her gaze turned distant. It was very unexpected. We are so very different. He's absolutely terrible with animals, not that you need to interact with them much for the work we do. I only insist on being part of these videos because I love them so, but he refuses to come near them. Won't even agree to me having a dog in the house. Seems like an odd career path for someone like that, Cooper noted. Oh, it wasn't his career path at all. Like me, Arthur gave up his old life entirely after some soul-searching. He refers to it as his penance. Genevieve laughed again, though Cooper wasn't entirely sure why. He thought the whole thing sounded terribly grim. Your husband's been spending time around animals here with you on set recently, hasn't he? Park asked. Why's that? Genevieve looked at him sharply, before seeming to remember the whole Park Foundation thing. Her expression softened. As I said, I'm under a great deal of pressure at the moment. Arthur has been very supportive. We heard he wanted to leave, that he was trying to persuade you to come with him, and you argued. Cooper pushed. Genevieve frowned, shaking her head. That's simply untrue. It doesn't even make sense. Why on earth would he want to leave right before the most important event of my career? How would you describe Arthur's relationship with James Finnegan? Park asked. I told you there wasn't one. Arthur never interacted with that man, and neither did I. But you did say your husband spoke to Mr. Finnegan even less than you did, Cooper said in a confused voice. What did you mean by that if neither of you ever interacted with the victim? Genevieve pursed her lips. I had a total of three conversations with James Finnegan. The first, he wanted to know about wild nature. The second time, we talked about Toronto. I was living there when Arthur and I met, and Mr. Finnegan was thinking about moving soon. Said he was from up north originally and had a hankering for some familiar faces. The last time we spoke, the day before he died, all we did was talk about animals. We were shooting with the python. I was nervous, and James gave me some advice. That's it. That's all there was. But JT, Arthur, none of you will believe me. Everyone demanding, what did he say to you? What did he say to you? Like I'm not a grown adult woman who can speak to whomever I please without being chaperoned every goddamn sick. She cut herself off and exhaled sweeping her hand through her hair again. I was very sorry to hear what happened, but as you can see, I didn't know him. There was a moment of silence, and Cooper was considering what she'd said about JT when Park asked, What was the advice? Genevieve looked confused. What? What advice did he give you about the python? Oh, she frowned. Don't run and you won't be chased. Cooper raised an eyebrow. Is that typical snake advice? Well, perhaps phrased a bit oddly, but it's what they always say one way or another. No sudden movements, don't do anything that might make the animal think you're prey. Which is precisely what I told Arthur, he said. And did Mr. Crane think that was strange? Cooper asked. Did I think what was strange? A voice said from down the dark hall, and Cooper jumped a little. 
Oh, goodness, you scared me, Genevieve said, holding a hand to her chest as a man emerged from the shadows. But she seemed extremely relieved to see him, and for good reason. He'd completely interrupted their questioning. The man was white with silvery gray hair pulled into a top knot. A trim beard and probably in his 60s or so, a good 15 years older than Genevieve, but just as fit and nearly as good-looking in his own way. He wore expensive, loose-fitting clothes, dark-tinted glasses that obscured his eyes, and multiple leather bracelets with little charms. They tinkled as he sipped from a travel mug that smelled very strongly of a fruity tea. All in all, he looked precisely like the sort of person who had done some self-proclaimed soul-searching and turned his back on a finance career for penance and conservation work. Arthur Crane. He introduced himself a bit unnecessarily, shaking their hands briskly. JT said some people here wanted to speak with me. Fucking Neil, Cooper thought. What, did he run directly to Arthur and sent him to interrupt their interview with Genevieve? For what purpose? We're investigating the murder of Mr. Finnegan and speaking to anyone who might have seen him in the time leading to his death. Murder, Arthur said, taking another sip of tea. Are they sure? I'd heard it might be an accident. This is a murder investigation, Cooper said firmly. How awful, Arthur murmured. Anything I can do to help, of course. Cooper glanced at Park, who would normally step in at this point of an interview to balance it out. But Park said nothing. He was studying Arthur with a strange look on his face. Quizzical and a little disturbed. As Cooper watched, he leaned toward Arthur, as if taking a closer look. Um, Cooper said hastily. Could you tell us the last time you spoke with Mr. Finnegan? I didn't. Arthur said evenly. When Cooper frowned, he clarified, That is to say, I never spoke to him. Which sounds terrible, I know. All this time I'd seen him around. I wish I had now. It's terribly sad how caught up in our own little lives we get and don't know the first thing about the person standing right beside us. He put his hand around Genevieve's waist. Park leaned in even closer. And though Arthur's expression remained placid behind his tinted glasses... Genevieve's turned a little annoyed. Is there some kind of problem, Agent Park? She asked. He looked at her, surprised, as if he'd completely forgotten her presence, and quickly took a step back. I'm sorry, Park said. I'm afraid I'm having a hard time uh, seeing in here. She relaxed somewhat, happy to go along with whatever excuse the guy with the rich family chose to provide, no matter how thin. Yes, they do keep it terribly dark. I'm always surprised they don't have more accidents. Little heads running around and crashing into each other. Shouldn't you be heading back to filming soon, babe? Arthur asked. I did think I saw Nico looking for you. Oh, shoot. Genevieve kissed Arthur quickly on the cheek. You're right, she'll be furious. Excuse me, I really must go. It was a real pleasure meeting you, Agent Park, and... She looked at Cooper blankly, clearly having forgotten his name. And please do come find me tonight and say hello. She covered as smoothly as possible. They said their goodbyes and Cooper listened to her footsteps recede down the hall. As soon as they heard the whoosh of the door leading back to the others, Park turned back to Arthur. What's wrong with you? He asked immediately, shocking Cooper into silence. Arthur, on the other hand, looked as if he'd expected this. Like this, in fact, was the exact reason he had sent his wife away. Nothing whatsoever, I assure you. I can barely scent you, Park protested. You don't smell human, but you... You don't. I almost can't smell the wolf in you. If you wouldn't mind keeping your voice down, Arthur said perfectly pleasantly, glancing past Park in the direction Genevieve had gone. I'd be happy to explain, but this is a topic I'd rather avoid having to explain to my wife. She doesn't know you're a werewolf? Cooper asked incredulously. How is that possible? Arthur looked at him. When do you imagine it must come up? I... Cooper glanced at Park. I'm sorry, I don't understand. Arthur sighed. 
I was born a werewolf, of course, and spent many years living much like many of us do. But pack life never really agreed with me, and when I met Genevieve, an unaware human, I just... left. I'm not in the community anymore. I'm not bound to any pack or alpha. I have a new life, free of that world. Park looked vaguely disgusted. But you must... shift, right? Cooper asked. As needed? Arthur said a bit tersely. But I don't linger, and I certainly don't involve my wife. So you see, we are able to have a perfectly normal human relationship. Cooper felt deeply uncomfortable, but he didn't know what to say. What about James Finnegan? Park asked finally. What about him? Arthur asked. I told you I never spoke to the man. You must have known he was a wolf, Cooper pushed. Yes, and why would that require conversation? Arthur took a long sip of tea. He's hardly the first wolf I've crossed paths with since my new life, but I haven't had pack bonds in years. I spend less than a minute in the other form twice a week. He shrugged. It seems that at some point my lifestyle started affecting my chemical makeup. Now, as you demonstrated yourself, most can't pick out my scent, even at close distances. It's easy to go unnoticed. Are you saying James didn't know you were a wolf? Having never spoken to him, I really couldn't say. Mr. Crane, two nights ago you and Genevieve had an argument. You wanted to leave town urgently. Can you explain why? I'm afraid I have no idea what you're talking about, Arthur said, looking genuinely confused. I have absolutely no reason to want to leave. The whoosh of the door sounded and Ryan appeared around the hall, breathing heavily. You're... you're FBI, right? Please help. I think... I think we've just been vandalized. Chapter 7 Looks like there is a book room after all, Cooper said quietly to Park, or what's left of one. They stood in the doorway of one of the visitor center's many upstairs rooms used for classes, meetings, and conferences. Now the long table had been flipped over on its side. Chairs were cast around the room, and while the shelves were seemingly bolted to the wall, every single book had been taken out and thrown to the floor. Torn stray pages peppered the mess, and someone had clearly tried to set a fire, though they'd done a pretty slapdash job. The room smelled of wet smoke, and the walls were stained with sweeping clouds of black, but only a handful of book piles seemed to have really burned. They managed to put this out quickly, Cooper noted. Or whoever set the fire only needed it to burn enough to cover their scent trail, Park said. A wolf, a human aware of wolves, or just somebody who wanted to make picking up a fingerprint pretty impossible. Don't narrow down the suspects too dramatically there, Cooper said, stepping carefully into the room. It can't be a coincidence that we theorized someone being blackmailed by James Finnegan set fire to his apartment, and now a fire has been set in the other space we theorized James might have stashed Eli's recording and whatever he has on this second victim. A second victim we theorized, based on suspicious recent behavior, was most likely Arthur Crane. Yes, if Neil's to be believed, Park said, nudging over a book on the horrors of elephant poaching with his toe. Cooper looked at Park, whose face had gone carefully blank. Do we have any reason not to believe him? He asked. Park didn't respond. Any reasons that don't have to do with the fact that he's a dick I used to... Dick? I'm just remaining cautiously skeptical until we can get this suspicious recent behavior verified by someone who I didn't just send fingering the woman whose husband he's fingering for murder. Never mind the ethics of engaging in a sexual relationship with someone you're investigating for embezzlement at all. I'm not defending him, Cooper said. 
crouching to sift through the pile of books that had undergone the worst damage and had thus possibly been where the fire began. I just want to make sure we're not thinking with our little heads. Am I the type to get jealous? Park protested, sifting through his own pile. Nothing so mundane, Cooper said. Protective, though? In the name of a hurt you imagine I've been holding on to all these years? Hmm. 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 Yourself, Park mumbled. Let's say Arthur Crane was being blackmailed. We're back to the question over what? The embezzlement? That gives Genevieve motive, too, if we think they're in on it together. It'd be about the only thing they are in on together, Cooper said. A slightly singed book with a wolf face on the cover caught his eye. My Year with Wolves. Wolf Behavior, Ecology, and Mythology Demystified by Nico Hirano. Hello. Could he have been threatening Arthur that he'd tell Genevieve he's a wolf? Cooper asked, flipping it open. Park was quiet for a moment. Maybe. I don't know. That whole situation is... He trailed off, clearly troubled. Regardless, we don't know if Arthur and Eli were the only people James was blackmailing. Or if whoever did this found what they were looking for, Cooper added as he skimmed through the book. It was all very animal-specific, of course, and not at all relevant to werewolves. A sort of general coverall directed toward lay people. The origins of their dog's quirks, some basic biology, the decimation of the wolf population by their only real predator, humans, and their loss of habitat. It was all told along the loose thread of Hirano's 13 months living in isolation in the Yukon, while attempting to follow one particular pack who, she explained in the foreword, first avoided her, then seemed to tolerate her distant observation, but ultimately rejected her disappearing from the territory after a particularly antagonistic encounter. And yet Cooper couldn't put it down. He wasn't really sure what he was looking for. In a way, it seemed like too weird a coincidence that she had written an entire book on wolves. On the other hand, maybe it wasn't weird at all. She'd already mentioned more than once that they were one of the species she tracked as a documentarian, and wolves were a popular figure in public imagination. He doubted there was much market for the ecology, behavior, and mythology of fisher cats, and it's not like she was writing about werewolves. Cooper was about to put the book back down when one sentence caught his eye. If we dismiss the myth of a single dominating alpha, the question we must ask ourselves is, what then binds a wolf pack together? The simplest answer I can offer is a common purpose. What does this Find something interesting. Cooper gasped and almost dropped the book. Park was standing over him, clearly amused. I was just... Yadano wrote it, he said, handing the book back over to Park, who took it and skipped directly to the back, about the author, which Cooper wished he'd done himself and avoided being caught entranced by a book on animal wolves like a dickhead. She wrote this ten years ago, it says she had plans to return, to try to relocate the pack she followed. I wonder if she ever did, Cooper said. Park flipped back a couple of pages and stilled suddenly. What? What is it? Park handed him the book. It was open to the acknowledgments page, and Cooper skimmed it, looking for what had caught Park's eye. And special thanks to my friend Emily Freeman without whom I would never have understood that we uncover the answers we go looking for, but must wait for the truth to find us. What the hell is Freeman doing in Hirano's book? Cooper asked quietly. Park shook his head. Coincidence? Cooper shot him a look. When we first met Freeman, she was researching and tracking wolves in Canada, Hirano's time as a documentarian led to her doing the same. It would be more unlikely if they hadn't crossed paths in their long careers in the same relatively small field. It's one mention in a decade-old book, not a postcard from prison. True, Cooper conceded. 
but I still think we should talk to Freeman. Park frowned and turned, walking a couple steps away from Cooper. He flipped another book over with his toe. I don't think that's a good idea. What? Why not? Cooper stood, still holding Hirano's book. I don't trust her, Park said. Really? I was thinking she could officiate our wedding, Cooper said. Park didn't look amused. Of course, I don't trust her either, but there is a connection here. Tenuous, true, but don't you think it's worth following up on? Park was silent, thinking. Finally, he said, All right, I'll call Cola. See if we can arrange an interview tomorrow. In the meantime, you can come up with an opening question besides read any good books lately. Is that what they call the mortifying ordeal of being known? Cooper asked the smoke-damaged ceiling. As long as you're already mortified, do you have something to wear tonight? Cooper groaned. No, God, I can't believe this is the second time in three days I'm going to have to wear a costume. Park looked at him askance. What do you mean? I told you about the sunflower hat Kayla made me, didn't I? No, what do you mean, second time? Park clarified. Well, isn't it a haunted Halloween gala? Cooper said. Don't we... What do you think we're supposed to wear? To a black tie event that cost nearly two grand to get into? A tux, Park said, biting back a smile. But if you want to put a different sort of costume on afterward, I suppose I can grin and bear it. In the meantime, we'll have to buy off the rack, which is unfortunate, but... I have a tux, Cooper said. Park looked surprised. Really? Why? I've lived a life before you, Cooper said. The occasion arose, the tux acquired. You're not going to tell me you were married before, are you? Park asked, and Cooper laughed at the absurdity of that thought. It was for a case, when I was an undercover. Neil had helped him pick it out, actually. Weird the way that worked. Cooper remembered being impressed when Neil recommended his personal tailor and thinking that was an older man thing. But now, full-grown himself and just as clueless, he realized it was just a rich thing. It probably won't fit perfectly, but I promise you won't be too embarrassed to be seen with me in front of your foundation friends. Park laughed. Cooper, there isn't a room in the world I would be embarrassed to walk into with you by my side, not even if you were wearing a sunflower on your head. They finished searching the room but found nothing else of note. If James had ever stored blackmail material here, it was long gone. Eventually, trust agents came to secure the scene. Two wolves Cooper had spoken to before, Agents Anya Roy and Zoe Dion. They were both friendly enough with him, if a little stiff around Park, who wandered toward the back of the room when they arrived. So casually, one might believe he actually needed to reinspect the burnt-out shelving, if it wasn't for the way all the three wolves determinedly didn't look at one another. I could have sworn you weren't working on this case, Roy said to Cooper lightly, a teasing glint in her eyes as she walked in and surveyed the mess. Can't a guy spend his day off at the zoo? Cooper asked innocently. The last time you did that, an infamous rebel pack alpha who's been missing for a decade went swimming with the fishes, Dion said. She had a deep, monotone voice that made it hard to tell when she was joking or not. Now you're back and there's a fire. Maybe you should take less time off. Hmm, Cooper said. Speaking of not working, a little bird in the Amazon building just told me you dragged in all their regular set crew for questioning today. And what brought you and this bird to Amazonia? Dion asked. Another purely coincidental pleasure trip? Monkey business, Cooper offered. Roy huffed a laugh. We asked them in to establish alibis. The whole crew was present and waiting to film at time of death. Waiting for Genevieve Crane? Cooper asked. Among others, Roy said. 
Genevieve disappeared after the first shoot of the day during what was supposed to be a five-minute break. Claimed she went home with a headache without telling anyone. One of the head zookeepers supervising filming that day went looking for her. Genevieve's assistant, J.T. Armstrong, showed up late and immediately went looking for the keeper. Nico Hirono stepped out to take an urgent call from her partner. No one can remember seeing Arthur Crane at all despite the fact that he hadn't missed a shoot up until that point. All in all, a pretty empty set. Cooper digested that. If Arthur's whole purpose for shadowing Genevieve was to do with the blackmail as they'd suspected, had he not shown up that day because he knew the threat was gone? Because he had already decided to leave town, as Neil thought? Or was there some other reason? So they just waited around with the... What were they supposed to be filming with? Wolf exhibit, Dion said flatly. Now, if you're done not working the case, you might want to move date night along to a secondary location quick-like. Cola said she'd meet us here. Cola's coming? Into the field? Park asked from the back of the room. Clearly surprised their boss was showing up to the scene herself for the second day in a row. There was a definite shift in the atmosphere. Dion and Roy stood a little taller. Looked a little warier. Yes. Roy said after a moment's pause, but didn't offer anything else. Cooper suppressed a sigh. You got the talks report back yet? He asked. James Finnegan didn't test positive for any of the usual suspects, Roy said hesitantly, sounding a bit awkward. They're going to have to go back and test individual toxins. If it's poison at all, Dion murmured, voice even lower than usual. And not the punishment of a wolf who's betrayed his pack for... Roy shushed her partner, then glanced at Park with something almost like fear in her eyes. We should get to work, she said quickly. I really think you should go now. Both of you. Well, there couldn't be a clearer dismissal than that. Cooper bid them goodbye and Park followed him outside. They called ahead to the restaurant and there was a 25-minute wait for a table so Cooper and Park decided to take their time and walk there. Park was quiet as they left the zoo. Lost in thought, his hands shoved so deeply into his pockets that his shoulders hunched, giving him a sort of wounded, vulnerable look. Cooper hesitated, then snuck his hand into the crook of his elbow. Park looked at him, surprised. What? As long as I'm strolling the streets with my bow, I might as well look it. Park smiled and shook his head, but tucked his arm a little tighter holding Cooper close. You're good with them, Dion and Roy, he said after a couple moments of comfortable silence. They like you. Cooper shrugged. I excel in short increments, like a polar plunge. He felt Park stiffen under his hand. That's not. Do you really think that? Cooper considered. I don't know, maybe? All signs point to yes. You can't deny most people don't seem to know what to make of me. Particularly wolves, but perhaps that was just statistics these days. Park was quiet, and when Cooper glanced up at him, he was frowning faintly and nibbling at the scar on his lip. Not going to tell me I'm beloved by all? I can't tell you how to think of yourself, and neither should anyone else. Park said promptly and with a startling edge of intensity. Cooper wondered if Park had heard the tail end of his and Neil's conversation in the bar after all. Or was it just obvious from the outside looking in? Park opened his mouth to add something else, then seemed to change his mind. When he spoke next, it was a lot more calm, casual, almost offhanded. I can't imagine any amount of time with you that will feel like enough. You say too many interesting things. Er, line check, Cooper said to the imaginary offset. Not that I'm cracking under the pressure of that statement or anything. Don't worry. I like you speechless and gasping, too. Park said primly, then shot him a half-heated, half-teasing look. Cooper couldn't help laughing. You're ridiculous, but pulled Park a little closer all the same. 
It was a genuinely beautiful late October day. That brisk, fresh air that just felt clean. Some of the row houses they passed had put up Halloween decorations, and the trees here and there were heavy with warm, jaunty colors at their peak of brilliance right before death. A sort of melancholic splendor that Cooper had always found a bit enchanting when he bothered to think of it at all. What about a fall wedding? Cooper asked abruptly, interrupting Park, who was planning out loud what time they needed to get ready if they were to be primped and present on time at the gala tonight. Park looked surprised. For us? He smiled and looked down at his shoes. I like the fall. Good, that's one decision made, only a million to go. Park started to say something when Cooper's cell rang. Unknown number. Hello? It's me. Where are you? Neil. Cooper bristled at the familiarity, but the truth was he did recognize his voice. We left. Why? I need to speak with you. Is this about you and... No. Meet me back at the zoo. Just you. Can you ditch your partner? Cooper looked at Park, who could clearly hear what was being said and raised an eyebrow. Why? I trust him. Anything you need to say to me, you can say to him. And anything I say to you, you can say to him. But I'm only meeting with you. I can't. This is important. Please. That made Cooper pause. He wasn't sure he'd ever heard Neil say please in his life. Hold on. He said and covered his phone to speak to Park. What do you think? Park looked in the direction of the restaurant for a long moment and then back at Cooper. You will be safe? Cooper nodded. Then you should go. Are you sure? You're okay with that? Cooper asked. I'll tell him no if you're not. Park reached up and tucked a stray strand of Cooper's hair into place and stepped close enough that Neil could hear him through the phone. I'll pick you up that fish dish you like and meet you at the gate in 30. If you are not there, I will come find you. Cooper nodded again, though he understood Park had said it more for Neil's benefit. He put the phone back to his ear. All right, I'm coming. Where? Back at Amazonia? No, there's still crew hanging around here. Meet me at the reptile house. I'll be waiting. Less than ten minutes later, Cooper walked into the tall brick building that housed most of the zoo's reptilian guests. It made him think of Sophie. She and Dean would be at the gala tonight, too. He'd forgotten that. He wondered if he should let them know he and Park would be there, working. That would be friendly of him, wouldn't it? It was very warm in here and nearly empty. Only one young family was moving from glass window to window the mother pushing a stroller while the father filmed their four, five, six-year-old daughter pointing out each animal and chatting in what Cooper thought was Portuguese, their voices echoing through the tall ceilings. They nodded at him, and Cooper smiled and tried to look a little less like a single man warily waiting for a covert meeting in the reptile house. He turned to examine the closest animal instead. A python. Really, no wonder Genevieve had been nervous. The thing was thicker than her leg and twice as long. James had been in this building the day before he died, Cooper remembered. That's when he'd given her that ominous advice, don't run and you won't be chased. Yeah, no way was he just talking about snakes. Cooper reached into his pocket to finger the little silver key he'd found in the hotel room. What if it hadn't unlocked something in the book room after all? Down the large, wide hall, the young family left and the building's noises shifted to relative silence before all the ambient noise rose up to fill the void. The buzzing thrum of the lights and the heat lamps, the clicks and rumbles of any old building. Cooper walked down the hall, listening to the taps of his feet on the tile. If Neil was making him wait because of some imagined competition with Park, Cooper was through. Park had said he'd come looking in 30 minutes. Cooper was leaving in 20. He wasn't interested in playing those sorts of games. Between a couple of the exhibits, recessed in an alcove, Cooper noticed an employees-only door cracked open. Neil? Cooper called hesitantly. 
He stepped through the door into a sort of hallway running along the backs of the enclosures. There, locked doors were on one side and medical and feeding equipment were on the other. Every twenty feet or so there was another door sectioning off the hall. But they were all open, and he could see straight down the length of the building. Hello? He called again, but heard nothing. Cooper ran his hand over the closest enclosure door, secured by a heavy bolt, chain lock, and a small keyhole. Cooper pulled the key from James's hotel out of his pocket and held it to the lock. Correct size. Same tinny silver metal color. He tried to fit it in. No, wrong one. Cooper got to work, trying the key to each enclosure lock. No, no, no. He was just beginning to reconsider, okay, so the metal key and the metal lock were both metal colored, what a clue, when the key slid in perfectly smoothly. Cooper froze, surprised. After all that, his first instinct was to flip the deadbolt, rip this shit open, and ask whatever was in there if they'd seen anything suspicious. But was that what Park would consider being safe? He looked around for some indication of what kind of creature was in there and found a small plastic tag on the metal mesh that covered the door. Philippine Crocodile. Super, thank you very much, James. Cooper unhooked the chain, then hesitated again. He checked the time. No messages from Neil, so he sent a quick text of his own. I'm here, where are you? And waited a moment, but there was no response. A quick peek inside wouldn't hurt, would it? Two minutes at most. Cooper flipped the bolt and very carefully cracked open the door two inches scanning inside. He spotted the crocodile immediately. It was on the other side of the enclosed room pressed against the viewing glass directly opposite the door. Between them was a small pool with very dark water. Cooper meticulously studied every inch of the space just in case there was a second animal lurking in shadow or camouflaged against the mulch that surrounded the pool. The walls were painted in a vague, sort of misty jungle mural, and besides the water that took up a majority of the space, there was a large boulder directly to the left of the keeper door, a pile of enormous fallen tree stumps to the right, and a smattering of big leafy plants all over. That meant plenty of hiding places that needed checking. He was not going to have the ace-in-the-hole maneuver pulled on him by some reptiles. He'd never live it down. When Cooper was absolutely positive there was nothing else in there, he opened the door wider, keeping an eye on the sole crocodile for any sign of movement. But the thing didn't even blink. There seemed like only one possible reason James would keep his own personal secret copy of the key to a crocodile enclosure. Not because he wanted somewhere to hang out, that's for sure. Not with its terrifying guardian always within seven feet of you. Cooper doubted even the keepers would choose to linger in here, which was, of course, the point. What better place to stash something than in a room no one went with 24-7 security that would never tell your secrets? Not looking away from the crocodile, Cooper cautiously took one step into the enclosure, having to duck his head and step up into the raised space. The croc's eyes were open, but again, it didn't move. Cooper gave the room another scan, this time looking not for where an animal might hide itself, but for where a person might hide something valuable. Not close to the ground where the crocodile might disturb it, but not on the walls either, where any zoo patron or keeper might spot it. Werewolf or not, he doubted James would want to keep the blackmail too far from the door. Not if he wanted to be able to access it at a moment's notice. At least Cooper hoped not. Because if something was hidden in that pile of logs within lunging distance of the crocodile, he just wasn't risking it. He wanted answers, but he wanted to live too, thanks very much. That really just left the boulder to the right of the door. He took another careful step inside, feet near silent on the wet mulch. The air was humid in here, and there was a horrible smell he couldn't describe. It was too unfamiliar, unlike anything else he'd come across in his life. The closest he could think of was when he was ten or so. He'd been in the marina, and a couple of kids had fished a drowned squirrel out of the water and left it to rot in the blistering summer sun. Cooper tried not to breathe through his nose and ran his hands down the back of the boulder positioned up against the enclosure wall just by the door. 
He had to lean in. Shoulder pressed hard against the rock and feel blindly for anything out of place. Up and down he swept his arm, the stone wet and much colder than the temperature of the room. He was just beginning to feel ridiculous when the tips of his fingers caught on the sharp edge of something sticking out from a crevice in the rock. Something hard wrapped in plastic was taped to the underside of a jutting ledge. He checked that the crocodile hadn't moved, then repositioned himself so he could reach even farther and get a grip on the thing and tug it free. A smartphone in a plastic bag. It was about four or five years old, by Cooper's guess, but was in good condition and powered on. As the screen loaded, he carefully stepped down out of the enclosure and closed the door behind him. There were no apps on it. No texts, no emails, no voicemails. Then he opened the camera roll. There he saw Arthur Crane. A much younger, happier-looking Arthur Crane, but undeniably the same man. It was clearly a photo of a Polaroid, and someone had scribbled, Ottawa, babes, in blue pen on the white bit. Cooper zoomed in for a closer look. Crane was posed with a group of six other people, most of them grinning, all of them in their twenties wearing loose, timeless sorts of clothing. T-shirts and sweatpants that made the date hard to place. Sitting head at hip level was a large brown and tan-colored wolf in fur. Its eyes closed and mouth open. One of the women had a toddler propped up on her hip, face hidden in her neck. Cooper exhaled shakily. He'd seen that woman before. She'd even saved his life once. Daisy Budillion. Park's mother. Cooper studied the other faces, not sure he'd know it when he found it. But he did. Park's father looked a lot like Park's Uncle Marcus, who in turn looked a lot like an older Park. The same jawline, cheekbones, perpetually windswept, thick hair. There were differences, too. Of course there were. Park's father, Benjamin, had a narrower build, almost no muscle, a fuller mouth, but it was his expression that really set them miles apart. Mischievous. Arrogant, a touch challenging. Like a man about to dare you to do something he already knew you couldn't. A man who was young and unhurt in a way Park had never got the chance to be. Cooper flipped to the next photo. This one was some kind of document. He zoomed in again, and a blinding pain whited out his vision like a flare gun as something cracked against the back of his head. He gasped soundlessly in shock and stumbled forward, ears ringing. Some part of him realized he was tipping over slowly and indirectly toward the cement floor. But even as he fell, the floor seemed to shrink away from him, blackness eating at the edges of his vision. There was a muffled, distant sound behind him, and a deep survival instinct made him throw his arms over his throbbing head just as a second sharp crack came down on his wrist and the tunnel closed completely. Cooper slipped into darkness. Chapter 8 There was dirt in his mouth. Dirt in his mouth and his nose and his ears. That was the first thing Cooper noticed when he regained consciousness, and for one disorienting, terrifying moment, he thought perhaps they'd found him already, presumed him dead and buried him alive by accident. But then his eyes cracked open, and the bright, piercing light was too painful to be anywhere but above ground on this earth. Cooper closed his eyes again and did a mental check of his systems. He was face down on something firm, but not uncomfortable, and his head was the most cause for concern. It was throbbing so strongly he wouldn't be surprised if other people could see it move. His wrist was vying for a strong second place, but when he tentatively stretched out his fingers, the pain barely fluctuated so he doubted anything was broken. In third place of top concerns, but climbing fast up the ranks, he had a horrible taste in his mouth. Moving his tongue around, Cooper realized it was his own breath. Not just his breath, but the air itself stank. The smell so powerfully bad it seemed to sit heavy on his skin, clogging his airways, choking him. The more he paid attention to it, the more overwhelmingly bad it became, like something rotting and fetid, slimy and fishy. Cooper stopped breathing and his eyes shot open again. 
This time, he refused to close them when the light tore straight through his corneas and jumped on an expressway to the goose egg on the back of his head. Less than a second of white-hot pain later, his vision reluctantly settled into actual shapes, shadows, and finally, colors. Namely, the soothing blues and greens of a jungle sky mural. Cooper was back in the crocodile enclosure. Whoever had attacked him had dragged him back inside and closed the door behind them. Very, very slowly, without getting up from his belly, Cooper turned his head, letting the wet mulch brush across his face until he was looking in the other direction, toward the viewing glass, where he'd last seen the crocodile. It wasn't there. Cooper let out a small, unintentional sound. Pure animal fear. It was incredibly hard not to jump up screaming, but he didn't dare. Not without knowing where the crocodile had gone first. Of course, gone was a wildly inapt word. The room was maybe 10 by 15 feet. It obviously hadn't gone anywhere. Wherever it might be was still dangerously too close. Cooper's eyes darted around the enclosure, moving too quickly to really find anything more subtle than a croc tap dancing on its hind legs in a top hat. Fear is just your body protecting itself, Dr. Rapoti had said once. Just like pain exists to let you know something is wrong, fear is another message. Sometimes, though, the body gets a little too good at protecting itself, going into overdrive, shouting out the fear message in a way that drowns out everything else. Cooper forced himself to slow down, really examining each mulch pile, every piece of debris floating in the dark water. Any other time, it would be interesting how, like a switch being flicked, a broken stick in the pool suddenly transformed to the crocodile's head. It was like Cooper's brain had finally caught sight of some detail and hastily switched out the cue cards from innocuous inanimate object to living and immediate danger while chuckling, my bad, my bad. Cooper would have to have a word with Dr. Rapoti about this too-good-at-protecting-itself bullshit. The crocodile was about five feet away and almost entirely submerged in water. Only the tip of its nose and the very top part of its head where the orbital ridges were peeked out. But Cooper was under no illusion that it hadn't noticed him there. One eye was fixed directly on him, unblinking. Cooper had never realized how similar to cat's eyes they were with the vertical slit pupil and the yellow tones. This eye was quite a bit darker than Boogie's, though. Almost the same shade as the crocodile's... skin? Scales? The way Cooper saw it, he had two options. He could lie there, unmoving and hopefully unthreatening, and wait for someone to find him, the problem with that was he had no concept of how long he had been lying there unconscious, or how easily he could be seen from outside the exhibit. There was also a small matter of what was or wasn't threatening to a crocodile. If some other predator were tossed into his extremely small territory, Cooper wouldn't ignore it just because it was having a lion. In fact, lack of movement would just make him brave enough to get close and investigate, and if that thing got closer... He knew he wouldn't be able to hold still. He just wouldn't. Don't run and you won't be chased. That's what James had said, but James was dead, which definitely took some weight out of his argument. Option two it was. Cooper spread his fingers wide, palms flat against the mulch. He tensed all his muscles, not breaking eye contact with the croc, took a steady inhale, and pushed up fast tucking his feet up under him into a crouch and springing immediately up and at the boulder by his head. He heard a splash behind him, but Cooper was standing, hunched on top of the four-foot boulder, hands up and ready to punch anything that tried to follow him. The crocodile was now half in and half out of the water, head in the general direction of where Cooper had been lying. It didn't appear to be planning a counter-strike, though, and Cooper exhaled the breath he'd been holding. From on top of the rock, he reached for the keeper door, but found it locked. Not unexpected. He felt for his phone, but it was gone. That was a bit more challenging. 
Above him, wire netting covered huge, bright lights that were giving off enormous amounts of heat. This close to them, Cooper was already starting to sweat. Plus, now that he was in a safer position, the throbbing of his injuries was returning with a vengeance, pulsing out a furious message. We said some things wrong, you stupid fuck. His wrist wasn't so bad, but when he gingerly tried to explore the back of his head, he couldn't even get close to the scalp. One brush of blood-soaked hair was all it took to give him a dizzy spell, and Cooper didn't try again. Considering who was waiting below to catch him, this was not the time and place to risk fainting. Instead, he just had to focus on getting help. Cooper started banging on the walls. To his relief, the crocodile just slid backward into the water, returning to its cautious, submerged position. Hello! Cooper shouted and kept banging. Help! I'm in here! Eventually, when his hand started hurting, he kicked the wall instead. When his throat got too sore, he stopped yelling. He wasn't going to make lunch with Park, he thought randomly. Silly. Strange thought, but he could see it so clearly. Park standing by the zoo entrance. Waiting for him. Giving Cooper the time he needed to speak to Neil. Checking his watch, wondering if he should come looking for Cooper, deciding not to, not wanting to look jealous, overprotective, untrusting. He'd been so excited to go to lunch, too. That softly pleased smile of his when he felt really good, but didn't want to draw too much attention to it. Cooper yelled in pure frustration and kicked rapidly at the wall. Suddenly, he heard a thump and clatter from the other side. Someone throwing open one of the internal hallway doors? Maybe you're going into another exhibit? Hello! He pulled his foot back to kick again and paused. What if whoever had put him here had waited around? Now that Cooper was making too much of a racket, had decided to finish him a different way. He was completely vulnerable and exposed like this. No way to seek cover without getting back on the ground, and that sure as hell wasn't happening. The door cracked open. Eli stuck his head inside. Well, 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 looks like the shoe's on the other foot now. Found him! He yelled in the other direction, then turned back to Cooper. Pro tip, it's usually a little more inconspicuous if you hide with an animal you can actually shift into. I wasn't hiding, Cooper started, and Park's head appeared beside Eli's. Cooper wasn't sure what he looked like, but from the way Park's expression went from relieved to dangerously blank, he knew it wasn't pretty. Cooper smiled wanly. I don't suppose you picked up any other food besides fish? One look at the amount of blood in Cooper's hair, and he was hustled to the hospital without so much as a buy or leave. Fortunately, his wrist and head had sort of split the damage evenly between them, so neither injury was too bad. Hurrah for teamwork. Like most head wounds, the bleeding looked worse than it was, but he didn't have a fracture and only needed a couple stitches. As suspected, his wrist was mildly sprained and would apparently be fine with a soft brace. All in all, it was barely mid-afternoon when Cooper and Park made it home with Eli in tow. So, what you're saying is now you have even less hope of finding my recording than before, Eli said, scooping up a delighted boogie and planting himself on the large, squishy armchair in their living room. Because you led my co-blackmail victim turned murdering arsonist directly to the evidence. Maybe so they'll destroy it all. Maybe so they can use it against me as well. Only time will tell. If you were hoping for a job well done bonus, I too feel I must deliver some bad news. Not less hope, Cooper protested. We at least know Arthur is on there for sure, which makes him a strong suspect for attacking me and stealing my phone, if nothing else. Oliver and I can speak to him again at the gala tonight. He had told them about finding the phone and seeing a picture of Arthur Crane with a group of people, but not who else in that group he'd recognized. He wanted to speak to Park privately about it first, unsure what Eli did or didn't know about Park's parents, and they had yet to get a moment to themselves. Weren't you supposed to be laying low? Cooper asked. 
what part of that means lurking around the scene of the crime. I do not lurk. I was merely keeping an eye on proceedings from where they'd least expect to see me. And lucky for you, I was at hand to rescue your distressed self from between a crock and a hard place. He has a point, Eli, Park said, sitting opposite him on the couch. Maybe you should go back north to the pack for a bit, at least until we can figure this out. Eli looked down at Boogie on his lap and rolled her to her back, a move that would have led directly to the emancipation of Cooper's skin from his body had he tried it, but just made Boogie give a big, pleased stretch. I'd rather stay here, Eli said vaguely. Not here, here. Of course I won't trespass on your hospitality by inviting myself into your home, Cooper snorted. But I assure you I'm perfectly capable of finding accommodations for myself. And I'm sure we'd all have a big laugh when you pop up in the birdhouse or a panda tree or whatever else you next consider to be reasonable shelter, Cooper said bitingly. Don't be ridiculous. If you're staying, you can stay here. He paused and looked at Park. If that's okay? Park had an odd expression on his face. Not unhappy, though, just a little surprised and thoughtful. Yes, of course, why wouldn't it be? Eli's gaze darted between the two of them shrewdly. Very well, he said finally, then abruptly stood, expertly pouring Boogie out of his lap into a sleepy puddle on the cushion beside him. In which case, I admit I'm in desperate need of a shift and a bath, and perhaps some of that wine you take to bed with you? He added directly to Cooper. Any order will do. In fact, Capsolve breathes beautifully in a large, shallow bowl, if you're so inclined to put one out on the porch for me. Ollie, care for a trot? Park glanced at Cooper, clearly reluctant to leave him alone. Ah, uh, not right now. Eli shrugged, already pulling out of his clothes. Suit yourself. As he wandered into the kitchen and out of sight, Cooper heard the telltale clacks of a shift, like stone on stone, followed by the creak and slam of the back door. You could have gone with him, he said. I promise I'm fine, even the headache's gone. I don't need it. I got a shift in this morning. Cooper frowned the wording of that reminding him just a bit too much of Arthur Crane, but bit his tongue. As long as you're staying, there's something I need to tell you. Can Eli still hear us? Park listened and shook his head. He's probably a couple miles into the woods by now. Okay. Cooper exhaled. Look, I didn't know if I should say it before, but the photo I saw on Arthur's phone with a group of people, I recognized a couple of them. Park tilted his head, curious, looking sweet and unworried. Cooper wished there was an easier way to say this. Once upon a time in his life, he might have just avoided saying it at all. He was with, uh, Daisy. Park's face sort of stilled. And a man I think was probably your dad. Park didn't respond, and after a moment, Cooper hesitantly went on. Daisy was holding a toddler, and it said, um, Ottawa Babes on the Polaroid. Silence. Then, must have been Camille, Park said distantly. They lived in Ottawa before I was born, with some other WIP members. Okay, Cooper said slowly. So does that mean Arthur, I'm not a wolf, I'm a real boy crane, was once part of the WIP with, um... He said himself he didn't get along with the packs. The WIP is actively trying to dismantle the pack rule system. James Finnegan could have recognized Arthur, known he was WIP back in the day. Is that really blackmail worthy, though? Park shook his head. No. No, it isn't. We must be missing something. 
probably more than one thing. Cooper nodded, thinking. I wonder if he recognized you. Arthur, I mean. My parents were probably using a different name. Budillion or hell, any other random alias, I don't know. Anything but Park, the WIP are very pack-averse. No, I mean, I wonder if he recognized you because your dad looked a lot like you, Cooper explained. At that, Park's gaze drifted to the side, staring unfocused around Cooper's shoulder. Although it was dark in that fish room and he was wearing tinted glasses and the picture was taken over 40 years ago, so maybe not. I wonder what happened to the other people in the photo. One of them was in fur, too. Did I mention that? I mean, I don't know if it's important, but what did he look like? Park interrupted. Um, kind of brown with tan patches? Park looked back at Cooper. No. My dad. You said he looked like me. How? I don't... My grandparents only had pictures of him as a kid, so... Never mind the murder investigation, the blackmail, the crocodile. Cooper wished he'd managed to hold on to that phone, if only just so he could hand park the photo to keep and look at whenever he wanted. For as long as he wanted. Because it wasn't fair that Cooper could know what Benjamin looked like while Park had to cling to a child's fading, unreliable memories. Cooper moved to sit next to Park on the couch and stroked his jaw. This was the same. And this. He booped Park's nose and Park's eyes closed, perhaps to imagine it better. He looks like a charmer. Like you, and the same pretty hair. Cooper said, running his fingers through it before poking Park lightly in the chest. Leaner. Thinner. Shorter. Happy. Happier, Cooper thought, but didn't say. Maybe Park heard it anyway. I'm happy, he said. Are you? Cooper blurted out before he could stop himself. Park opened his eyes, expression concerned. What do you mean, why wouldn't I be? Cooper shook his head. I mean, I know we're happy together, but are you as an individual fulfilled? Empowered? Nourished? Park laughed, startled. Therapy is really putting you through the ringer, huh? I'd have worried you'd been replaced by a pod person if you'd been able to get through that without all those air quotes. I'm attempting a rare, serious moment, Cooper said, putting his hand on Park's thigh. He wasn't sure exactly how to put into words the low buzz of concern that had been building for some time now but his head was spinning with thoughts of Agents Roy and Dion's wary standoffishness. Of Arthur Crane, who had once been smiling and committed to fighting for what he believed was the best possible future of wolves, now devoid of pack bonds and shifting so rarely he hardly smelled like a wolf anymore. What had happened to change him so dramatically? Had it been one single moment? Or a loss that had been gradual? Preventable. Just, I want to know if you're where you want to be, not just with us, but with work, with your family, with your pack, that as a wolf you feel whole. Happy. Park studied him. Is this because of that book you found? Are you trying to do some kind of alpha check-in? Because I promise it's not your responsibility whether or not I'm happy with my career or family. Not as an alpha, and not as my partner. Responsibility, no, Cooper agreed. But in addition to being my partner, my 
whatever the opposite of alpha is, the horizon that my first and last thought touches every day and my hands down favorite lay, you're also my best friend, Oliver. And maybe that doesn't sound as big of a deal because, you know, not a lot of competition, but it's true. You're my best friend. And you make me feel like I can do anything. I just... I want you to feel that, too. <clears throat> Cooper cleared his throat. Uh, the bit about feeling supported, I mean, I'm not demanding you say I'm your best friend back. I haven't made us half-moon bracelets or anything. <laughs> Park's eyes crinkled as he smiled softly. He put his hand on top of Cooper's and entwined their fingers. Have I told you I love you recently? No, you've been cruelly reticent, and I've had no choice but to be sentimental enough for the two of us. Cooper shook his fist at the ceiling. Curse this new burden of being the most emotionally healthy person in the house. I hate it. Park laughed. How could I ever not be happy when I have this? And everything else? Cooper asked. Park tilted his head. Truly? Some things, yes. Others, I am not sure. Can I think about it and let you know? Whenever you're ready. As often as you like. Cooper vowed. You can always tell me what you want out of life, and I'll always be the first pick on your heist team ready to help you get it. As often as I like. Dreams change. People change. Please just don't stop giving me the chance to change with you. As if he could not resist, Park pulled Cooper close for a light kiss to the mouth, the cheekbone, the temple. His lips felt wonderfully cool to Cooper's skin. Happy chance, Park sighed into Cooper's hair. What? Nothing, Park said. An old line I've developed new appreciation for. Perhaps I'll pull it up and read it to you sometime during one of our daily power couple check-ins on hopes, dreams, and aspirations. Daily? Cooper muttered. I said best friend, not your fucking fairy godmother. Weekly, maybe. He rested his head on Park's chest listening to his heartbeat and sighed. Every other day at most. Later that evening, Cooper was freshly showered, dressed and clear-headed enough to feel self-conscious as he examined himself in Park's haunted mirror. He tugged at the tux. It was a bit loose in some places, tight in others, but the general concept still worked. And it wasn't like he had options. The real betrayal came from the parts that he hadn't dug out of a garment bag at the back of his closet. His hair, for example, that he tried to do something new with and instead taken from blandly uninspired to slightly deranged looking. Really, what was its excuse? He didn't even dare look at the back where the stitches were. From the bathroom, he could hear Park showering. They'd talked a bit more about Arthur Crane after that detour, but really what else was there to say? It was only speculation until they could speak to the man himself tonight. Cooper futzed hopelessly with the bow tie and his wrist twinged a bit, feeling sore and fragile. He'd taken off the hand brace to shower and dress, but was considering putting it back on again before the gala when a dark shadow moved in his lower peripheral. Jesus, Eli, Cooper said, spinning clenching his hands at first defensively, then even harder to try to force the sudden trembling in his arms away before it could spread through his body. I'm really not in the mood for being snuck up on. Fuck, too late. The tremor had made its way into his voice. He took a deep, calming breath through his nose and out his mouth while Eli eyed him speculatively, sitting in fur in the open bedroom door. What do you want? I poured you a bowl downstairs, Cooper said. Eli very distinctly rolled his eyes and then jerked his head to indicate Cooper should come with him. 
Cooper frowned, but did, following him down the stairs into the front door where Eli sat patiently. How'd you let yourself back in if you can't let yourself out? Cooper asked, annoyed, and pulled open the door, faux irritated, but also somewhat relieved not to be staring at his reflection anymore. Beginning to walk up the house path was Neil. Just as startled as Cooper was, he froze and stared, lips slightly parted, as if Cooper were some spirit manifested to haunt him. Boo, Cooper said and heard Eli huff as he padded away. Neil's face turned angry. Where the hell were you this afternoon? He demanded. Where was I? Where were you? Cooper asked. You didn't show. I had to. Genevieve needed me to take care of something. You couldn't wait ten minutes? Take care of something? Cooper repeated. He almost added he had been waiting until someone jumped him but stopped himself. When had Neil gotten there exactly? While Cooper was wandering around in the back? While he was unconscious? Surely any later than that he would have heard Cooper banging on the walls and... Earlier than that... Cooper studied Neil, then dismissed the notion. No, the man he knew could be a real bastard, certainly, but he wouldn't attack Cooper and leave him in a potentially life-threatening situation. For what possible reason? What are you looking at me like that for? Neil asked. How do you know where I live? You used to be a federal agent once upon a time. Surely you don't have any illusions of privacy. Now, I told you I need to speak to you. Are you letting me in or not? Cooper hesitated, then stepped to the side, letting Neil into the house. I don't have long, he warned. We need to leave for the gala soon. You think JT isn't working that entire shit show? Neil retorted, striding into the living room as Cooper followed. I have less time for this than you do. He came to a sudden stop. Is that a dog? Cooper looked around him and realized Eli was splayed on his side, taking up the entire couch, head partially obscured by the pillows. He looked like nothing more than a pitch-black mass of fur and legs and didn't move as they entered the room. What else would it be? Cooper said. Neil shrugged, acknowledging that, and took the armchair opposite Eli. He's fucking huge. What kind? Some type of working breed? I've never seen him do any work, Cooper said, sitting on the edge of the couch between the two of them, blocking most of Eli from view, feeling the warm press of his body at his back. It wasn't ideally comfortable, but for some reason Cooper disliked the idea of Neil being able to look freely at Eli like this. What do you want? Neil rhythmically tapped his knee with his fingers, looking around the room with open curiosity. I visited you, you know, he said nonsensically. What are you talking about? When you were in the hospital a few years ago, I heard down the grapevine you'd been attacked in pursuit of a suspect and were in the ICU. No visitors, but flash a badge and they'll bring you a chair. You were being kept under at the time. Belly was still all open, managing the sepsis, apparently. I took a look at your chart. Four deep lacerations, just like James Finnegan. Cooper didn't say anything. Couldn't. The thought of Neil being allowed right there into the room with him at one of the most vulnerable points of his life, without the permission he never would have given during a medically induced unconsciousness, flesh literally flayed and his insides exposed, made Cooper's whole body feel impossibly tight. Not uncomfortable, but angry. Like every single muscle fiber had coiled up with a fury so sudden and intense it was like it was happening right now, so consuming that there wasn't even room for surprise. Hell, what was surprising about it? Of course Neil wouldn't think twice about inviting himself into Cooper's trauma. He'd never hesitated to invite himself into any other corner of his being, his mind, his body... He'd probably been thrilled to hover over Cooper, brought low enough for him to look down on, split open wide enough to look inside. 
When every word and every touch had been a criticism of his defensiveness, he probably choked on satisfaction to see Cooper so utterly, brutally defenseless. The vicious thought caught Cooper off guard. Even in his rage, the only way the most simple and obvious realizations can. Of course he hadn't turned Neil bitter and cruel with his icy untouchability. Neil had never wanted him warm in the first place. He'd wanted him obedient, and in lieu of obedience, he'd take impotence. Defeat. Behind him, Eli shifted his position, tucking his long face alongside Cooper's thigh, and without thinking, Cooper let his hand drift into the fur behind his neck. Enough of the anger eased for him to sound calm when he spoke. You had no right to my private medical information. Well, I wasn't the only one. There was a woman looking through it when I got there, having a hush-hush conversation with your doctor. This shut up real quick when I walked in. Neil paused again, looking around the room, gaze stuttering over Eli. A couple of days ago, Ginny, Genevieve, needed me to pick up some papers she'd forgotten at the house. It was right after the fight she'd had with Arthur, and she didn't want to go back and see him. When I got there, a woman was leaving. It was the same woman I'd seen talking to your doctor that time. Cooper frowned, confused. How... Are you sure? Neil ignored that. I saw her again this morning shortly after you left the zoo... She joined a couple of your shadow agency colleagues on the scene of the fire. They were deferring to her. A boss, it looked like. Maybe your boss, too. Short black woman wearing a bright blue suit. Cola, almost certainly. Cooper hadn't known she'd been there when he was in the hospital, but it didn't really surprise him either. A werewolf attack. A human about to be offered the chance to be made aware and recruited into the BSI. Those weren't decisions made on a low level. But what reason would she have to speak to Arthur Crane before James was killed and the investigation had even begun? Was it the same reason she was working in the field herself? Cooper had thought she'd showed up to the sea lion scene because he and Park had found the body. What if there was another reason? You do recognize her, Neil said, watching him. Cooper didn't answer. Instead, asked, When you arrived at the house, did Arthur say who she was or anything about why they were meeting? No. But when I told Ginny about it later, she... reacted. Canceled our meetings for the rest of the day, disappeared from the shoot we had scheduled the next afternoon. The afternoon James was found dead. Cooper confirmed. Don't. Neil said quickly, stay away, don't come after her. I'm telling you as a friendly warning that someone high up in your shadow agency has a close eye on Arthur Crane, nothing else. Is that your unbiased opinion speaking? Neil's voice hardened, and that same anger he'd seen before flickered across his face. Whatever you think you saw today in the fish room... You didn't. Behind Cooper, Eli pulled himself to standing and hopped gracefully off the couch, shook himself in a very dog-like manner, and slipped out of the room. Cooper could hear him going up the stairs. You're not having an affair with her, then? Neil laughed loudly and stood. Cooper hastily did the same, uncomfortable with looking up at him. An affair? <laughs> What do you think, a protecting her out of some kind of chivalry? Come now, bright boy, you know me better than that. So explain it to me. What am I missing? Because what it looks like is you're sleeping with a woman you're investigating for embezzlement, and the only words I keep hearing out of your mouth is look into Arthur Crane. Neil took a couple steps closer, so they were standing face to face. His eyes traveled up and down Cooper's body. I recognize this. 
he said, reaching out to run a single finger beneath the satin lapel without touching Cooper's body. Didn't I buy it for you? No, Cooper said shortly, jerking away. Hmm. Regardless, I recognize it. He needed it for that Stevens case. Do you remember the party they had, the ridiculous yacht thing? Cooper did, actually. Or more so, he remembered how Neil had gotten angry at him that night for some nonsense reason and used shitty, unsatisfying sex against him for the next week. That had been near the end. The first end, anyway, when he'd asked to get out of undercover. The whole thing was packed with trust fund babes, blood money, and weapon smuggling. But you got right into their heads. Absolutely. Fucking lootly clueless at the tailor of the day before. Couldn't even guess your own inseam, but five minutes studying these vultures and you knew them inside out could put them on like masks. It's your game. You taught it to me. I thought I did, but I was wrong, wasn't I? Neil asked. He was practically whispering now. A strange new frantic edge to his voice and glanced in the direction Eli had disappeared. Ken, is there anyone else here? Cooper wondered what would happen if he said no. Why? I want to know what you're planning, Neil murmured urgently under his breath. I can help. We can work together, just like old times. I don't want it to be like old times, Cooper said. He didn't mean to sound quite so horrified, but... Well, not exactly like that, Neil agreed hastily. Better. I'm sorry for the way things were between us. The truth is, I resented how much I wanted you. I hated you for the way you made me feel. Inferior, desperate, trapped. But I understand now. I get it. And you can trust me. Cooper blinked at him feeling very much like he'd just been sucker-punched twice in a row. It wasn't every day you got the apology you'd been waiting years for. An apology you hadn't even realized how much you wanted, needed, to hear, slipped in so casually. Nothing more than a throwaway thought to the other person immediately followed by hearing you were hated. That it was your own fault someone had hurt you. Fuck you, Cooper said softly. Why are you still trying to manipulate me? What the hell is the point? You're not listening, Neil sounded frustrated, annoyed. I want to help you. He grabbed Cooper's hand suddenly. I've missed you. I'm done fighting with you. I'm done fighting this. Cooper shook him off. Christ, Neil, stop it. Whatever you're trying to do, just stop. Even if I wasn't, you know, engaged, we were horrible together. That didn't stop us from coming back again and again. Tell me, if you hadn't ended up in the hospital and been transferred, we still wouldn't be together. No, we wouldn't, Cooper said firmly. He hoped that was true, but really it didn't matter. He had been attacked, and his life had changed. He had changed, whether Neil thought so or not. To imagine a world where none of that had happened wasn't just pointless, but unwelcome. I've moved on. Neil's gaze seemed to darken. I see that. You've found yourself a whole new mask to put on. This one comes with an expensive little home and a powerful little job and an obedience little pet. I didn't realize we had company. Neil jumped at the sound of Park's voice, then took a hasty step back. In his position, Cooper would have done the same. Park had clearly just gotten out of the shower seconds ago, fetched by Eli, no doubt. His hair was very wet, and he was only wearing a pair of hastily thrown-on sweatpants that were splotched dark with water and clung in, uh, interesting ways to his body. Still, even with all that, he looked a little frightening. His expression wasn't aggressive in the least, and yet there was something... off. Something that prickled even Cooper's base animal instincts. 
the predator stillness of his body, perhaps, or the intent, unblinking stare that didn't quite meet Neil's. Directly behind his legs, Eli sat primly, grooming a paw. I was just leaving, Neil said slowly, eyes darting between Park and Eli. I assume I'll see you both tonight. Yes, Cooper said. We'll be there. Neil nodded and took a few steps toward the door. There he hesitated, as if reluctant to walk too closely past Park, but after a moment trudged forward. Cooper walked after him and sensed Park following behind, though for the life of him he couldn't hear his footsteps. When Neil opened the front door and turned on the stoop, he'd regained a little bit of his usual confidence. You know, the thing I remember most about that Stevens case, he said, and Cooper tensed. That night was when I first realized you were better at the game than I was. You've been playing it a lot longer. Pretending to be something you're not. Pretending to know less than you do. That you're not the one in control all along. You and Genevieve are a lot alike in that way. That's why I was with her in the fish room. Neil looked around the foyer of the house and then up and down Cooper one last time. I meant what I said. When you're ready for my help, you know where to find me. Without another word, he spun and walked lightly down the path. Cooper watched him get into his car, turn over the engine, and drive down the long driveway. When he turned, he saw Park and Eli having some sort of silent conversation. He owed Dean an apology. Of course, wolves had their own way of communicating. If Cooper were any kind of mate, he'd have understood that. Understood what they were saying so intently now. After a moment, Eli stood and padded lazily out of the house and then broke into a brisk trot, disappearing into the woods parallel to the direction the car had gone. Where's he going? Cooper asked. Making sure your visitor makes it back to the main road without any detours. Park reached past Cooper, closed the door and locked it. He took a step forward, putting Cooper very suddenly in the position of being backed up against the door between Park's arms. It felt... odd to be so formally dressed while Park was more than half naked and dripping, the heat of the shower still radiating off of him. Did you hear any of that? Cooper asked. No, Park said paused. Except for the part where he said he's been in love with you all these years and wants you back. That's not what he said, and you know it. Cooper frowned, thinking. I don't know what he was saying, really. It was like we were having two different conversations, typical Neil. Still trying to put me off my game. Park traced Cooper's lapel along the same line that Neil had. Are you okay? Of course, why wouldn't I be? Cooper asked. Park's gaze flicked over his face as if searching for something. Then he leaned forward so that their noses were practically touching. Cooper's eyes fluttered shut in anticipation of a kiss. But the kiss didn't come. He opened his eyes again and found Park studying every inch of him. Belatedly, he remembered Park hadn't seen him in the tux yet, or his shameful attempts at leveling up his grooming. You look very... sexy, Park said, sounding almost surprised. Cooper snorted despite himself. Careful, any more incredulity and I'll think you like me or something. Park shook his head. I mean, you look sexy in a different way than usual. He ran his fingers up the starched shirt and tugged lightly at the collar. Very buttoned up and proper, 
like an uptight little lord of the manor. Cooper felt his cheeks heat just a touch, and he tugged self-consciously at his own jacket hem. It doesn't fit right, he said. I noticed. Park brushed his hand along the bottom of Cooper's ass. Borderline indecent, he murmured, letting his fingers dip down the inside back of Cooper's thighs. When Cooper made a small, unintentional sound, Park kissed him quickly, but with a hint of possession. Cooper reached up, laying his hands flat on Park's bare chest, pushed him away slightly, reluctantly. Wait, just tell me this isn't about Neil, he said, meeting Park's eyes. Park hesitated, cocking his head, giving the question genuine thought. I don't want you out of some jealous need to assert a claim on you, he said slowly. But I'd be lying if I said seeing you like this. Put together and unfazed while he walks away frustrated and stinking of lust doesn't make me want to take you apart piece by piece right here and now. Cooper raised an eyebrow, feeling the starting prickles of arousal in his balls tighten and solidify into a pulsing want as Park continued. I'd also be lying if I said it didn't make me hard as stone knowing to everyone else you're untouchable and in control while I can turn you into a shaking, dripping, begging mess. Begging? Cooper scoffed, or tried to. Unfortunately, it came out a little breathy. Yes. Park said matter-of-factly, hands slowly, methodically, starting to work open Cooper's pants, giving him plenty of time to pull away again if he wanted to. I'm going to play with you as long as I please. He squeezed Cooper's cock quickly through his briefs. And by the time I decide I'm done, you're going to be on the floor. Ass in the air, begging like a whore. Cooper groaned, thrusting forward encouragingly, hoping to get Park's hands back on his dick immediately, but instead found himself being suddenly spun around so he was facing the door. Slowly, Park eased Cooper's pants and briefs down, encouraging him to step out of them entirely, and then took his jacket off for him. When Cooper's hands started for his shirt, Park grabbed his wrists and pulled them away. No. Leave it on, he said roughly. Why? Cooper asked, surprised, wrists flexing in Park's unforgiving grip. No pain, but no give, either. I like it. My uptight lord with his fancy, pretty clothes caught with his pants down and his cheeks just peeking out, hoping to get caught, wanting me to see. As he spoke, Park lifted Cooper's hands and placed them against the door. So, go ahead. I caught you. Show off your cute little ass for me. Cooper did, arching his back. The tails of his shirt covered him, but Park ran teasing fingers just under the hem. It tickled slightly, and he couldn't help spreading his legs and arching farther. He was still wearing his dress socks, and his feet slipped unsteadily on the floor, so he let his forearms rest on the door instead. In reward, Park's hands got a little rougher, massaging the cheeks, pulling them apart until finally he tugged Cooper's shirt up, completely exposing him to the air. Cooper let out an embarrassing whimper, clenching shyly, feeling that initial moment of vulnerability. 
Park groaned softly and then slapped his ass with his palm. Cooper gasped, jerking forward. Don't hide from me, Park said, smoothing over Cooper's ass cheek with the flat of his hand and then slapped the same spot once, twice more. Cooper whined and shifted in place, trying very hard to relax. He looked over his shoulder to see Park examining him very intently before abruptly bending to kiss where he'd spanked. His lips felt oddly cool against the heated flesh, and Cooper exhaled shakily at the soothing sensation. Park kissed him again, this time more open-mouthed, sucking and nibbling the same spot of tender skin until Cooper was positive there would be a mark. As if sensing he was being watched, Park's gaze shot up to meet Cooper's. He held eye contact for a long moment, then lowered himself to his knees one at a time and thumbed Cooper open. Park's lips parted slightly, eyes flaring gold. Cooper could feel the heat of his breath on his hole and compulsively twitched, aching, desperate to be touched. Please, Cooper whispered, straining back toward him. Oliver, please. Park's eyes flickered with an almost predatory sort of satisfaction. Then he buried his face in Cooper's ass. All rational thought stuttered to a stop. There was only wet heat dragging and pushing, massaging him loose, the gentle scrape of teeth that made him clench tight again, then the apologetic tongue coaxing him back open, cycling round and round until Cooper was panting loudly, legs shaking, head hanging loose between his forearms, which kept slipping farther and farther down the door. Cooper couldn't bring himself to pull up and away. Then... Alongside Park's tongue, Cooper felt the slow, demanding press of a finger entering him, tugging his rim, then curling down and stroking at the same time Park's thumb pressed up into his taint. Cooper's feet slipped out from beneath him. Park caught him around the belly and eased him all the way to the floor with one guiding hand between his shoulder blades until Cooper's cheek was pressed against the blessedly cold floor and his ass was up in the air. Good, Park said. Stay. Cooper heard him stand, shuck his sweatpants, then circle him slowly. Look at me. Love. Cooper opened his eyes and looked up at Park without moving his head. Park was stroking himself lazily, staring down at him. You look very hard. Park extended one bare foot under Cooper's belly and gently nudged Cooper's dick, which leaked at the small movement. Are you aching? Cooper nodded as best he could, a little too overwhelmed with sensations to be verbal. I'm going to give you a choice. I can give you relief right now, give you my hand, jerk you off hard and quick like you like it, or if you wait a little bit longer while I get myself off first and stripe your pretty ass with my cum... I'll let you fuck my mouth. Cooper trembled, his eyes slipping closed and felt Park nudge his dick again. Tell me, what do you want? Park said, gently but firmly. Mouth, please, Cooper said roughly. Mmm, put you in a bow tie and you're all manners, Park said, kneeling back down behind him, spreading Cooper's legs until Park could slot his dick between his cheeks, gliding back and forth. Waist up, you look entirely respectable. He tapped the head insistently against Cooper's hole, 
jerking himself off against him. His voice was getting grittier. Waist down, you're presenting to me like a good little cock slut. Cooper moaned, pushing back and felt heat splash across his ass and then again followed by the slow slide of it down his crack, his balls. Park made a small wounded sound and seemed to gather what he could and push it insistently into Cooper's hole until it was all just too much and Cooper whined, pleading. Park started to roll Cooper onto his back, but one brush of floor against the forgotten bump on the back of his head had Cooper crying out and jerking back to his hands and knees. Sorry, 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 Park said, kissing his temple apologetically. Here. He lay on his own back and urged Cooper's leg over so that he was straddling Park's head. Fuck my face. He guided Cooper's dick to his lips and licked the tip greedily. Use my mouth, use me, use... Cooper reached down to carefully grip a handful of Park's hair, and with his good hand against the door to support himself, finally, finally pushed his cock in. His whole body convulsed with the relief, and his vision went momentarily fuzzy. Unfocused. Cooper just froze there for a second, letting Park suckle him before he felt one hand come up to grip his ass. Park tugged, urging him to thrust, so Cooper did. Holding Park's head in place, he humped his face carefully, feeling the tight, wet grip and give of his mouth. He didn't stand a chance of lasting. He'd been strung along the edge too long, and Park felt too good. I'm... He tried to pull back, but Park dragged him back down, urging him farther, deeper, tilting his head to open his throat. Cooper's orgasm didn't hit him so much as he hit it at a running tackle. He felt it sweep through his body like a wildfire of paradoxes. He was the most powerful creature on earth. He was utterly defenseless in the grasp of his own pleasure. He was flayed open and terrifyingly vulnerable. Nothing could ever hurt him again. Soon the flood of hormones receded like the tide, and Cooper pulled out, fascinated by the stretch of spit and cum that tied him to Park's lower lip like a thread of fate until it collapsed. Park coughed beneath him, and slight tears escaped the corners of his eyes. Despite this, he seemed reluctant for Cooper to dismount, clutching at his legs. Just for a moment, Park whispered, voice a gravel of glass. Just hold me down for a minute, please. Cooper thumbed a tear away, slid down and positioned himself lying on top of Park so that the full weight of Cooper's body covered his. He held Park's wrists one in each hand, pressing them firmly to the floor by Park's head, then tucked his face into Park's neck. Cooper dragged his mouth and teeth across the skin there in the rough draft of a kiss and felt Park's body go utterly lax beneath his. You are my favorite part of living, Cooper whispered. I'd do anything for you. It was a confession more than anything else. Not necessarily something he thought was right or took pride in, but dug from the deepest and most private part of his mind. Unsightly and true. I'm yours, Park murmured simply. And for the first time, Cooper didn't see it as having a power and dominance over him that he'd never wanted. But as a rare and fragile responsibility that Park had gifted Cooper in love. Chapter 9 Apparently, one did not arrive fashionably late to a conservation gala. 
When Cooper and Park showed up, still very much on time despite second showers, some spot cleaning, and quite a lot of emergency ironing, the Smithsonian Natural History Rotunda was already teeming with people. It had been a long time since Cooper had last been here, but he remembered this room directly at the museum's entrance, an enormous four-story round space, all white stone and marble, with two levels of overlooking balconies and columns out the wazoo. The room was lit dramatically by blue and purple lights, and vague hints of nature were projected all over the stone balconies and ceiling. Everyone appeared to be in tuxedos or long dresses, and though some people had incorporated little hints of animal print into their attire, no one was wearing anything remotely Halloween-y. Close call there. In fact, the creepiest thing about the room was the taxidermy elephant near the center, beneath which an empty stage had been set up. Across the space, under one of the balconies, musicians were performing big band music, and waitstaff flitted through the crowd with platters of hors d'oeuvres. There was a small number of tables and chairs scattered around the room as well, but the majority of people appeared to be standing or even dancing in the center. Cooper eyed the elephant. Odd choice of venue, isn't it? Help us save animals while enjoying a cocktail under this poached one? Maybe it's part of their point, Park said. Or maybe it was just cheaper to have it here. Either way, I don't think tonight's animal guests mind. Cooper raised an eyebrow. Why, Oliver, making digs at yonder gentry? The riffraff is rubbing off on you. Yes, you are. Approximately once a day. But I was actually referring to non-human animals, Park said, waving the pamphlet they'd been handed at the door. Apparently, you can get your picture with two different special guests. Is that... Are they okay, do you think? The people must be entertained, and according to the schedule... The animal's gig is only an hour, Park said, still reading. There's the raffle draw soon, and then a short screening, followed by some words from Genevieve. Also a silent auction. So, if you want to bid on one of these resort getaways or oil paintings of flamingos, now would be a good time to tell me. You're about to own a resort, Cooper reminded him. We're about to own a resort, Park corrected, scanning the auction offerings. And I was thinking more along the lines of a honeymoon. There must be a place somewhere in here you can't manage to stumble upon a murder plot. Look, three nights in Paris? Mm, perhaps not. Knowing you, the hotel will end up being in the Rue Morgue. Park effortlessly snagged a couple of miniature squares of baklava from a passing waiter and handed one to Cooper. Girano isn't scheduled to speak? Cooper asked, nibbling at his, tasting cinnamon and walnuts. Not that it says here, but she must be around. We should speak to her soon, as well as Arthur Crane. A frown line appeared between Park's eyes. Cooper had filled him in on what Neil had said about Cola. Like Cooper, Park found it perplexing more than anything else. Cooper wanted to promise him they would speak to Arthur and get all the answers Park wanted, but of course he couldn't. Instead, Cooper did a scan around them briefly, then reached up and thumbed away the tiniest flake of Philo from Park's lip. The frown line disappeared, and Park's gaze shot to him, surprised. You had a little something, Cooper said bringing his thumb to his own lips and sucking it clean. Park watched, and his eyes got a bit more gold. Thank you, he said. His voice was still slightly rough from earlier, and it sent an embarrassing wave of smugness through Cooper. Park cleared his throat. <clears throat> we should... Yes, Cooper agreed quickly, in danger of getting distracted. Together, they stepped out of the shadows beneath the balcony by the entrance and began to thread through the crowd, looking for Hirano or either of the cranes. What Cooper wasn't expecting was someone else to find them first. 
Well, 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 look who decided to show his face after all. Cooper turned to find Sophie, resplendent in some kind of flowy, cobalt blue, fuchsia, and yellow patterned dress, her hair now in long braids, worn half up, half down. We're working, Cooper protested, allowing Sophie to buss his cheek. You look gorgeous. So do you. She winked and pulled Park in for a quick kiss as well. You're not here to discover another body, are you? Because the keepers have their hands full, keeping the critters calm as it is. These people came with an agenda, to get shit-faced and touch animals. Why does everyone keep implying I go places to find bodies? We're just here to ask a few questions. Well, come this way and answer a few questions first, Sophie said. Your dad has been driving me up a wall trying to find out about this case of yours. Cooper stared at her. He's here? How? Why? Just because you spat at my offer of free tickets doesn't mean everyone hates on an open bar, light refreshments, and rubbing shoulders, Sophie said, guiding them through the room to one of the other arches leading to a far emptier hall that seemed to contain dinosaur bones of all things. The music and crowd sounds were muted here, and Cooper could see his dad and Dean standing in a small group of guests listening intently to a woman in a black zoo polo holding a very large snake. There were another three zoo personnel standing around as well, on hand to help and limiting the number of people who could walk up to the snake at once. Among them, Cooper recognized Ryan, who waved cheerfully, causing a number of the guests to look as well, including Dean and finally Ed, whose expression became almost comically surprised. Dean walked over, Ed shuffling after him after a moment's pause. Damn, looking snazzy, you two, Dean said, snapping his fingers. Coop, Ed said. You look... so... He just sort of trailed off, blinking, bewildered, then looked at Park. Oliver. He held out his hand as if to shake, then his arms went up for a hug, then dropped and fiddled indecisively with the lapel of his old suit jacket the same one he'd worn for Dean and Sophie's wedding, and very possibly Cooper's high school graduation. Park smiled as if he and he alone hadn't noticed the awkwardness. It's good to see you all again. Are you here working? Is this the third leg of the quest? Dean asked, then lowered his voice. No one's dead, are they? We're just here to support a good cause, Park said mildly, Cooper being too busy gearing up for the biggest eye roll of his life to respond himself. Might as well get your money's worth then, Sophie said, gesturing as some of the guests left to return to the main room. Come eat the python. She's very mellow. Are you comfortable with snakes, Oliver? They all started to walk over to replace the guests who'd left, but Ed held Cooper back. Just a minute. I'd like to talk to you. Dad, now's not a good time. It'll just take a sec. Gosh, Coop, I... Ed stopped, clearly catching sight of the hand brace. He grabbed Cooper's forearm and held it up so he could cup the hand between them. What happened? What is this? It's nothing. A little sprain. I'm fine. Ed opened his mouth, closed it, nodded. Of course you're fine. You always are. He still held Cooper's injured hand in his, though, as tenderly as he would a newborn. Do you remember when you broke your wrist in second grade and didn't tell anyone? Just came downstairs the next day with a bunch of socks taped around it. Your mom asked what happened and you said, I fixed myself. Ed laughed. We all thought it was another one of your games you played in your head, and it took until that night, when you wouldn't take it off to shower, to realize your whole goddamn hand was swinging by a thread. Christ, she was angry at you. Complained all week about it. I said, well, at least we never have to worry about him being too dependent. And she got angry at me, too. He shouldn't be afraid to show us when he's hurt. That's what she said. His own parents... If he doesn't even trust us to help him now, what about when he's grown and scarier things happen? Will we even know he's okay? Will anyone? Cooper felt an unexpected tightening in his throat at the reminder that there was a time when his mother had once speculated what he'd be like as an adult. 
what their continued relationship would look like. And that ultimately, she never got to find out. Ed also seemed to need to take a breath. When I saw you walk up before, you looked so... grown up. I know you've been grown up for a long time. Longer than maybe you should have had to be, I don't know. But you look more settled in your skin now. Confident. Relaxed. Ed smoothed his hand over Cooper's brace gently, then picked a tiny bit of fuzz out of the exposed Velcro. I just think your mom would be really, really happy that you found someone you trust enough to see beneath the socks. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, Cooper said, voice a little rough. Okay. Ed patted his arm, giving them both a moment. Anyway, all I wanted to say before was that Dean told me you're freaking out about the wedding and what other people will think or want to happen. Did he? Cooper said, narrowing his eyes at an unsuspecting Dean petting the python's back with two gentle fingers and laughing at something Park was saying. Judas. Don't go getting mad at your brother now. He just told me so I'd back off and he's right. I'm sorry I've been making you feel like this has anything to do with anyone but you and Oliver. You just do whatever feels right and ignore what anyone else wants, including me. People will think what they think regardless, and that doesn't mean they have any kind of special insight into who you are or what your relationship is. All right? Cooper nodded, not really sure what to say. Still, that seemed to satisfy Ed. Right, he said. That's it. Ready to go see the snake or what? In a minute, you go ahead, Cooper said, and Ed escaped. Perhaps just as grateful as Cooper was for a moment alone to regain his composure. If he walked over there right now, he might do something horrifying, like start sniffling or worse, hug someone. Unfortunately, his solitude didn't last long. Everything okay? Ryan had snuck up behind him and was blinking at him with that wide-eyed puppy dog look. It looked like you guys were getting pretty intense over here. Fine. Just having a personal conversation. Cooper said with more edge than he'd intended, and immediately felt bad when Ryan's face fell. Sorry. Long day. No apology necessary, Ryan said genuinely, tucking his surfer hair behind his ears. And Cooper might think it made him look oddly sweet and pretty if he wasn't still a little irritated by his presence. I can't imagine all the stress you're under right now. They really keep you working all hours. Cooper forced himself to smile. You too. I didn't think this would be your usual gig he said, gesturing toward the snake. It's not, Ryan agreed. But Nico disappeared an hour ago, and Genevieve is freaking out, and we're all operating short-staffed after... Ryan seemed to realize what he was saying and stopped, a very pink blush appearing over his entire cheeks and, amusingly, the tip of his nose. Not that this is more important than a man's life and what you're doing, he said hastily. I don't think I've really quite processed what's happened to James. Were you close? Cooper asked. Yeah, we hung out a couple of times. Ryan looked a little sheepish. I mean, I guess that's not really close, but he was a pretty reserved guy. Felt more comfortable with animals than humans. He and I probably talked more than he did with anyone else at work, besides Nico, of course. Cooper frowned. I didn't realize James and Miss Hirano knew each other well. In fact, he was sure she'd said they hadn't, which meant someone was lying to him. Ryan shrugged. I know they talked outside of work. He was friends with Nico's girlfriend, too. I saw her and him together a couple times in town. James and Nico's girlfriend? Cooper asked, trying to keep up. Yeah, or a partner, I guess, Ryan said, 
scratching at the back of his neck and squinting. They've been together for years, met back when Nico was a documentarian around the same time of her accident. Hooper hummed, thinking. I heard her mention an accident as well, he said. Can I ask what happened? Ryan looked surprised, then laughed. I don't know why I thought you knew. It's pretty common knowledge around certain circles. She wrote about it in her book. Do you know she has a book? My year with wolves, right? Yeah, well, those wolves she spent that year with had enough. Turned on her one day. Messed her up pretty bad. God, Cooper said, reflexively smoothing his shirt over his own scars. That's horrible. Why? Ryan blinked a couple of times as if he didn't understand the question. Why? She got too close and they reacted. That can be the trouble with working long term with wild animals, he said, gestured toward the snake that was now draped over Sophie's arm and seemed to be examining Park. Even experts like us are in danger of forgetting these aren't your pets or friends or family. Living with them like that for a year, with limited human contact, big mistake. Ryan smiled brightly at Cooper very suddenly. Although one good thing that came out of it was that's how she met her partner. Because of a wolf attack? Cooper asked. Actually, yeah. She, like, found her out in the woods or something. Saved her life. Nico moved into her cabin just until she was well enough to travel. Never moved out. Typical, right? Cooper hummed an acknowledgement, but wasn't sure what Ryan meant. Typical of who? Gerano? Lesbians? Lonely, off-the-grid cabin dwellers? Ryan was still talking. You get little bits of that in the book, too. It's really quite an interesting read. Sounds like it. I picked up a copy this afternoon, Cooper said. And then Park had promptly put it back down, but he didn't need to add that part. I was surprised to see a name I recognized in the acknowledgments. Has Ms. Hirano ever mentioned someone named Dr. Freeman to you? Emily Freeman? Ryan asked, and Cooper blinked in shock not having really expected that to go anywhere. Sure, I've met her myself a couple of times. You have? When? Ryan frowned. Our wolves got real sick a while ago, and Nico called her in to consult. She's a gifted pathologist, and there's not much about the species she doesn't know. Cooper could feel his pulse in his ears. He was as alert as if Freeman had walked into the room herself. I didn't know that. Well, no, Ryan laughed. Why would you? Did she figure out what was wrong? With the wolves, I mean. Yeah, tainted meat, apparently. But not before three of them died. Nico took it hard. The thing is, no one even thought it was that bad. I mean, they'd just sort of been unwell for a couple weeks. Then suddenly, within like two hours, their system started shutting down one after another. Animals are like that. They hide stuff well. Their keeper was still sacked, though. Everyone said if he'd caught it earlier, called Dr. Freeman in sooner, all four wolves could have lived. Ryan's face twisted slightly. You disagree? Cooper asked. Oh, no, I don't know. Probably. We're supposed to record every little behavioral change for exactly this reason. And it turns out the wolf's keeper had been slacking. But he totally freaked out on Nico after. Accused her of setting him up. Stealing the records. Intentionally tampering with the meat. There was no basis for it, just crazy bitter stuff, really. I thought he was going to hit her, no joke, but she just stood there, staring him down like, well, if looks could kill and all that. Nico loved those wolves. If you ask me, that's the real reason he was fired. Ryan shrugged. 
James was his replacement, actually. The dull crackle of a speaker turning on caught Cooper off guard. Genevieve's voice echoed suddenly through the rotunda, slightly muffled here in the hall, declaring it was time to announce the raffle winners. The first prize of the night. Why the interest in Dr. Freeman? Ryan continued over the speaker, his expression now curious and a little eager. Is she involved in your case? Is that why you're asking these questions? No, not at all. Cooper shook his head firmly. She couldn't be. Under other circumstances, he might consider it. Freeman was a gifted pathologist with an expertise with wolves who had spent four months doing who knew what with a dead man's biological samples. She had openly admitted to wanting the existence of werewolves to come into the public knowledge. Now, a werewolf was murdered. His body posed in an extremely public way. His face and body affected by some mystery toxin to make his inhumanness obvious, and Freeman's name kept popping up in odd connections to the co-workers of the victims. Hell, never mind, consider it, she'd be Cooper's number one suspect. But the woman was in custody. Talk about an airtight alibi. And there were other people who wanted James dead. Arthur Crane, for example, who they still needed to talk to. Hey, that's you, Ryan said. Cooper blinked at him. Sorry? Ryan pointed up, and it took Cooper a moment to realize he was referring to Genevieve's voice, still ringing out over the speakers. Third raffle winner of the night is Cooper Dayton. Cooper Dayton, congratulations, and please come to the stage beneath the elephant to collect your prize. I didn't enter a raffle, Cooper said, confused. Your name gets put in when you buy a ticket. Ryan said, clapping, presumably in congratulations. Some of the prizes are big money items. Hope you get a good one. Thanks, Cooper said, feeling a sliver of excitement despite himself. Who didn't like winning something? He said goodbye to Ryan and caught Park's attention, gesturing that he was leaving. Park nodded, leaning down to say something to Cooper's family and the zookeeper while gracefully extricating himself from the snake, which had at some point ended up wrapped around his arm. Cooper walked to the doorway that led back to the rotunda and looked around the room while he waited for Park. The announcements had stopped and the band had picked up the music again. This time a woman was singing along, and a number of people had paired up and started slowly two-stepping around the dance floor. He watched them, humming along under his breath. Would I grant all your wishes and be proud of the task? Finally, Park appeared at his elbow. Making a new friend back there? Cooper asked, amused, as they walked back into the main room. My energy must be very soothing to ill-tempered creatures prone to biting. Park looked at him slyly out of the corner of his eye. At least that's what Dean claimed, and your father said to stop teasing you. Nice. Cooper said as they tried to pick their way through the dancing couples to the stage. And you defended my name then and there, or does that part come in a minute? Park adopted a scandalized expression. By admitting you bite me all the time, I didn't think you'd want them to know. But I suppose I can go back. He looked over his shoulder and Cooper grabbed his arm. All right, all right. His uninjured hand slid down into Park's and gave it a squeeze. But when he started to pull away, Park held on. He tugged Cooper gently, questioningly toward him, glancing at a dancing couple and then back at Cooper. Quirked an eyebrow. Yes? No? I saw you tapping your toes. Cooper felt a little flushed. He looked around them but stepped hesitantly forward and let Park pull him into a dance position. Cooper felt very stiff in his arms and unsure where to look, but Park seemed perfectly at ease and patiently shuffled them across the floor toward the elephant stage, stepping in time to the music. Only forever, if someone should ask. Cooper couldn't help glancing up and found Park staring down at him with a smile. Cooper cleared his throat. <clears> throat> 
Anyway, while you were yucking it up with a snake in the hand and two snakes in the grass, some of us were working. He recapped what Ryan had told him, watching Park's face turn more and more grim. When I spoke to Cola about setting up an interview with Freeman tomorrow, I asked if she'd had any visitors, Park said when Cooper was done. But she hasn't. No family, friends, colleagues. Accomplices, he added pointedly. Hasn't tried to make contact with anyone at all since her arrest. The besides you hung in the air unspoken. What about the threat she warned about? Park asked, clearly thinking of that same single meeting three months ago. What about it? Well, we did wonder where she got her information. Maybe this is the connection we've been waiting for. Cooper frowned. But if we're taking Freeman at her word, I'm not being threatened. Park looked pointedly at Cooper's injured wrist, resting on his shoulder. That was spur-of-the-moment panic. Someone wanted that phone. Someone like Arthur Crane, who is the only person besides Eli we know for sure James was blackmailing, which at the end of the day is the actual case we have. Someone murdered a blackmailer. All this other... Weirdness is insubstantial at the moment. Although now it seems certain Hirano had lied about knowing James, she was a possible third person with a motive, not to mention the oddness around his predecessor's departure. And what about her partner, who had also been seen with James? She who had appeared in Hirano's life after a wolf attack? What was her part in all of this? Park was watching him with a thoughtful expression. You never doubted Eli is innocent. Why? Eli and innocent are two words that have no business being neighbors. Cooper said immediately, but then gave it some genuine thought. I think it was extremely difficult for him to talk about his past, especially to me. I don't think he ever would have if he felt like he had any other possible option. Maybe not. Though I think he's more fond of you than you believe. Park tilted his head a little. And I think you've taken a shine to him yourself. He's a slippery, peccant bastard who believes a Marcus's rapier is an achievable personality type, and so horrifically attractive he looks like... Like singing woodland creatures help him dress in the morning. I can't stand him. Clearly, Park said, amused. Sometimes I look like a woodland creature, and I helped you get dressed a couple hours ago. I can hum a little tune next time if it makes you feel special. Why did you two break up? Cooper asked. Park looked surprised. Cooper was surprised himself. He hadn't really intended to ask. You don't have to tell me if you don't want to. It was a long time ago, Park said carefully. There's the reason we thought we were breaking up at the time, and then there's the bigger, more vague, and mature reason seen in retrospect. I'll take leave the petty in the past for 400, Alex. Park thought about it. I think... I think we were both too willing to see the other person the way they saw themselves. And the way we saw ourselves back then was... He shook his head, then seemed to realize they'd both stopped dancing and spun Cooper gently toward the stage. Or perhaps I just got sick of waking up to squirrels with a terrible tenor tying his shoes every morning. Cooper snorted and started to respond when a familiar ringing voice interrupted. Agent Park! Genevieve Crane waved enthusiastically at him from the stage. She stepped carefully down to the floor with them, picking up her long, slim-fitting black gown as she went, flashing an eye-wateringly high stiletto. My goodness, you look handsome, and Agent... She looked at Cooper blankly. 
I am so honored you came to say hello. Actually, I um, won a raffle prize, Cooper said. Cooper Dayton. Of course you did, Genevieve agreed, snapping her fingers behind her and telling the woman who approached to fetch Mr. Dayton his prize, would you? Cooper wondered where Neil was. I'm sorry, you've caught me rather frazzled at the moment. I'm about to go up for the speech. Experienced actresses still get stage fright, Park remarked, and Genevieve eyed him as if unsure if she was being mocked or not. Medea deserved better, but you acted the hell out of her, Park added. Genevieve's face softened. Oh, thank you, sweetheart. That's so lovely to hear, especially when I'm so nervous. I suppose I'm more comfortable playing the vengeful woman than the conservation philanthropist. Speaking of which, is your husband here? Park asked, and Genevieve laughed. I haven't poisoned him, if that's what you're asking, Agent Park, she said, leaning forward to touch his arm and Cooper was mildly surprised to realize it was more than a little flirtatious. No, well, you wouldn't, Park said. Everyone he loves, though. He winked, and she laughed again, thoroughly at ease. Cooper hoped this was not the sort of seductive banter that had won him over, because from the outside looking in, it was appalling. You know, I recently heard I might have a friend in common with your husband, Park added smoothly. Genevieve looked intrigued by the idea of being three degrees of separation from a park of the Park Foundation. Margaret Cola? She mentioned seeing him a few days ago. Oh, Genevieve said, clearly disappointed. Yes, of course, Arthur's known her for years. They used to work together, I believe. Cooper exchanged looks with Park as the woman sent for the prize returned, handing it to Genevieve, who then handed it to Cooper. It was a flattish, rectangular package wrapped in expensive-looking matte black wrapping paper. Unless it was a book of instructions on how to collect their resort tickets, he didn't think he'd gotten one of those big-money prizes. Is Arthur here tonight? Park asked. He's supposed to be, Genevieve said, scanning the people. He wasn't feeling terribly well, poor thing. Between you and me, he just doesn't care for big crowds, she added sotto voce. Everyone has abandoned me in my hour of need. Miss Hirano, too? Cooper asked. Oh, I'm sure Nico is somewhere around here bleeding some poor sucker dry, Genevieve laughed. She's much better at soliciting those one-on-one -on -one donations. It makes me cringe myself, she admitted. But Nico has plenty of practice, I suppose. She used to fund those little camping trips entirely on her own, you know. For the documentaries? Cooper asked, confused. Genevieve looked around as if making sure no one could hear them, then said, She hadn't actually worked for a production company for years. Most of the film career she's always going on about was just her squatting in national parks with a handheld camera. That sounds like... passion. Cooper couldn't imagine it himself. Oh, I'd say it was an obsession, Genevieve countered. But then she'd do anything for her beloved wolves. There was a strange, bitter note to her voice. Not a wolf fan yourself? Cooper asked, half-jokingly, half-curious. Of course I am opposed to the endangerment of any species. Each and every one is critical to maintaining the balance of our ecosystem. But personally, no, I'm not much of a wolf lover. Genevieve's mouth tightened, gaze distant. Cold, proud animals. You could drive yourself crazy trying to get them to care. Just look at what happened to Nico after everything she gave up for that pack in the Yukon. They just chewed her up and spat her out. 
Not that it seems to have affected her devotion in the least. She seemed to give herself a sort of internal shake, and her expression turned a bit wry, a bit self-deprecating. I guess I'm not quite as magnanimous, but you don't become an actress without craving unconditional affection. The assistant hovering at Genevieve's elbow cleared her throat pointedly. <clears throat> ah, that's my cue, agents. Wish me luck. They said goodbye and watched her walk to the stage as the band finished up their song, and as the final chords faded, the chatter and hum of the crowd seemed to rise to fill the space. Then the lights all around them got even dimmer, and the large screen hanging from one balcony lit up with Wild Nature's logo. The crowd quieted gradually, filtering down until only the loudest, most unobservant people's voices were left. Intro music started in loudspeakers around the room, and a drone shot, flying through the zoo's main entrance, appeared on screen. As Genevieve's voiceover began to lay out statistics, Cooper's attention wandered back to the present in his hand. He started to open it. You are as impulsive as a child, Park murmured, watching him out of the corner of his eye. Hasn't anyone ever told you patience is a virtue? What in all the time we've known each other makes you think I care about being virtuous? Cooper said, slitting his finger under the thick paper and flicking it open. Park sighed. If only I'd known all it took to get you excited about receiving gifts was a bit of wrapping, we could have two vases in the foyer right now. I like to win, Cooper said absently, pulling out Hirano's book. Oh, good, Park said cheerfully. I'm sure reading that won't send you into a tailspin. Cooper cracked open the front cover and saw Hirano had signed it. Above her short, choppy name was an inscription in cursive. The tainted will brush past the pack in darkness, passing burrs to our fur, until the moon rises again and in its light the sinners will be revealed for all to see. Um, Cooper said, showing the page to Park, who read it with a frown. More cheerful children's tales? Actually, I think it's the same legend I was telling you about before, Park said, studying the line. The wording isn't from any version I recognize, though. The concept of sin is very human. I've never seen it used in any wolf lore before. I might have to actually read this now, Cooper said, flipping through the pages, thinking about what Genevieve had said about Hirano about wolves. Something slipped out to the floor and Park swiftly bent to pick it up. When he straightened, he looked grim. What? Park held up a single, flat, dried-out coral rose. Cooper stared at it, then silently opened the book again and turned through the pages, much more carefully this time. Every twenty pages or so was another pressed flower. All roses, all the same color, all missing any hint of stem. Who could have? Cooper whispered. He looked for Genevieve and realized he was not the only one watching her. One of the few people not turned toward the screen was standing on the other side of the stage opposite Cooper and gazing a bit intensely at Genevieve. He recognized the same peroxide blonde buzz cut, the makeup assistant from earlier the one who had been standing outside of the wolf exhibit staring at Eli just before Cooper and Dean arrived. Did people have their makeup redone on site? He knew they refreshed it occasionally over the course of a day, but if you got it professionally done for a big, fancy event, was that person just waiting around in the wings for... emergency powdering? He genuinely had no clue. As he touched Park's elbow and directed his attention to the woman, she turned and slipped through the crowd, heading toward the edge of the room. There she paused, standing back to one of the columns, and surveyed the gala. Cooper looked around, too. Everyone in the room still appeared focused on the screen where a twenty-foot Genevieve was laughing prettily, crouched with an enormous tortoise. Her voice echoed so loudly off the tall stone walls that it sounded distorted. 
mechanical. When Cooper turned back to the blonde woman, he caught her slipping behind the velvet rope that blocked guests from wandering down the surrounding halls. Cooper looked at Park, who was also watching the now-empty archway. Park tilted his head. Follow? Cooper nodded. It was easy to move through the room with everyone standing still and staring up. Moments later, Cooper and Park were stepping over the velvet rope, too. There was a large, dark hall running perpendicular to the rotunda, and directly across, another enormous archway. A large cream and gold plaque on the right-hand wall read Hall of Mammals. Park inhaled, sniffing the air and led him into a small foyer, glass cases on either side. There was enough light from the hall outside that Cooper could see the cases were full of taxidermy animals. A moose on his left, a walrus to his right. The cases were at least 30 feet tall, and a couple dozen other creatures of all sizes were positioned throughout, placed on shelves or held up by strings, from mice to bighorn sheep to a panda to a rhinoceros. There was even some kind of whale floating, uncased directly above their heads, and a tiger positioned to look like it was leaping for it. A prickle of unease and wrong started in Cooper's throat, and he subconsciously stepped closer to Park just enough to feel the warmth and constant movement of life radiating from him. Cooper supposed, like the elephant in the rotunda, many of these animals had been hunted, stripped of their skin and stuffed a long time ago. But it was still deeply depressing to be surrounded by dead creatures, so many of them endangered or perhaps even extinct by now. All clustered together, unnaturally, and positioned into a pantomime of life, any sense of majesty they might have possessed now tawdry, almost grotesque. They kept walking, and the next room was a large hall, but much darker. Here, Cooper could only see the enormous silhouettes of more animals. These, all from Africa, and not fully encased, but placed behind open-top glass barriers or high up enough not to need any protection at all. A giraffe overlooking all newcomers. A lion, posed on top of an information stand. Each of them, still, dark, shadows. Even the digital informational screens were black. The only sources of light, the dim security strips along the floor, and the green glow of an occasional exit sign. Cooper tapped his own ear, asking if Park could hear anything, and Park shook his head in the negative. But he was frowning. Something's wrong, he murmured to Cooper. Something's dead. Everything, I hope, Cooper whispered, glancing up as they passed under a whole tree branch, where the crouched outline of some kind of feline predator was posed alongside the limp hanging body of a gazelle. Park shook his head. No, it's... I don't know. There are too many unfamiliar, confusing smells in here. I'm having a hard time separating everything, but there's something fresh, bad. They continued walking slowly, Park sniffing the air as he went. The rooms appeared to be divided into continents, Africa taking up the largest hall, then to the left a smaller section of rooms for Australia, that led into South America, and so on. As they stepped into the North American section, greeted by a standing grizzly bear, Cooper got the feeling they were beginning to circle back around toward Africa and still had found no sign of the woman. Then Park stopped abruptly. There, on top of the information stand, was a gray wolf posed to a forever howl at the ceiling panels, just below it, seated on a large square stone bench back to them, was a figure. A human figure, in dark clothes. His head was tilted back, and he appeared to be staring up at the wolf, hands resting on the bench at either side of him, long fingers curled upward as if begging for penance. Cooper took a tentative couple steps forward and recognized the long gray hair pulled into a fashionable topknot. He could also hear the faint drip, drip 
of something spilling slowly to the floor. Mr. Crane? Park grabbed his arm before he could get closer. Blood, he said, grimly moving in front of Cooper, widely circling around Crane. Cooper followed at his heels, watching for any sign of movement. But Arthur Crane was as still as the hundreds of dark, watching animals around them. As they came around the front, Cooper could see the shadowy puddle at Crane's feet, and his once white tuxedo shirt stained deep red. His face twisted into the same partial transformation, inhuman eyes half open in death. God, Cooper exhaled. Is he... It seemed obvious, but they had to check. Park stepped forward and checked his pulse. Cooper noticed Crane's fingers, which had seemed unnaturally long, were actually fully clawed. Yes, he's dead, Park said, crouching to get a better look at the torso. Four deep lacerations, just like James. Slipped like James, too, Cooper said, taking a step closer. The blood pool is so... Neat. He must not have been moving at the time of death. Perhaps whatever is forcing the slip is a sedative as well, he thought out loud. Would make sense, Park agreed. Here, does this look familiar? He directed Cooper's attention to Arthur's left hand, clawed fingers slightly curled around something. James's phone, Cooper confirmed. That's the same one I found in the croc exhibit this morning. So Arthur bashed me over the head to protect whatever James had on him from getting out. Probably set both fires looking for the damn thing, too, knowing he had to cover his scent. But it looks like he's not our kill. Park stopped and whipped his head around, eyes glowing gold. Cooper looked around, too. What? He asked, scanning the room for whatever Park had sensed expecting to see someone watching them. The problem was, the whole room was full of dark shapes watching them. Bobcats, deer, wolves, bears, buffalo, raccoons. Everywhere he looked, there was an animal posed in unnatural stillness. Then one of the shadows shifted its weight. Oliver! Cooper started scrambling back. Park stood, but the shadow was already barreling toward them. A pitch-black wolf slammed into Cooper at full speed, knocking Hirano's book out of his hands and throwing them both directly into the case containing the grizzly bear. The glass cracked without shattering, and every trace of air was knocked clean out of Cooper's lungs. He could only wheeze painfully, entire chest consumed by that aching fire as the wolf scrambled upright on top of him. Fur in his mouth, warm breath on his face— not like this. Not like this. Without thinking, Cooper shot his arm up between them, hand grabbing blindly and landing on the wolf's throat. He squeezed desperately. No! Cooper gasped with the precious little air he regained. The wolf stilled as if surprised and stared down at him. Cooper just registered bright blue-gray eyes before a dark blur knocked the wolf from his chest with a furious snarl. Cooper rolled and scrambled across the floor away from the sounds of growling and the thumps of bodies against glass. Using the wall, he dragged himself to standing just in time to see both Park in fur and the black wolf standing on their hind legs wrestling, teeth bared and snapping at each other's faces before they both tipped over into the same display case Cooper had slammed into before. This time, the already weakened glass gave out and they knocked into the bear, which swayed precariously before also falling, taking out the remaining glass with an ear-piercing shatter. Cooper started forward to help when he heard a voice shout his name. Cooper! His father was in the entryway, mouth open in shock. The black wolf scrambled out from beneath the bear and ran at Ed, who just stood there, unmoving. Cooper leapt forward, but Park beat him there, jumping on the wolf's back and rolling them both over in a tumble of fur, claws, and teeth, and shattering a second case, this time knocking over a caribou. There was a sharp yelp of pain, and Cooper's heart jumped into his throat. He couldn't explain exactly how he knew that was Park, but he did. No! Cooper shouted, running toward the sound. Leave him! 
The black wolf emerged, stumbling from the case, and made eye contact with Cooper for a moment before darting around him to Arthur Crane's body, grabbing the phone in its mouth and sprinting down the other end of the room and out of sight. Cooper couldn't follow. Not when Park was hurt. He hurried to the fallen caribou and found Park pinned underneath. Hold on. Hold on, I got you. Cooper said, trying to lift the animal's stuffed body, but it was absurdly heavy. Then his dad was beside him. Count of three, Ed said. One. Two. They lifted the caribou together, standing it upright, and Cooper knelt on the ground. Park blinked at him woozily, then lifted his head like he was going to try to get up. Stop that, Cooper said, running his hands over Park's body, searching for injuries. Only when he didn't find anything obvious, such as an antler running through him like a park kebab, could Cooper breathe again. Always have to be a hero. Park squinted at him. Then his eyes flicked to the left just before Genevieve's piercing voice rang through the room. What the hell happened in here? What? Cooper stood, belatedly remembering who else was in the room with them, but it was too late. Genevieve had seen Arthur Crane's body, knocked to his back during the fight, his bloody shirt and shifted face in plain view. Genevieve started to scream. Chapter 10 Cooper sat on the long stone bench between Australia and South America, looking up at a deeply irritated cola while various trust agents, some of whom he recognized, some he didn't, bustled back and forth between her documenting the crime scene, transporting Arthur Crane's body as surreptitiously as possible, making sure no other humans wandered in. Agents Dion and Roy had arrived first and already hustled a hysterical Genevieve away. Cooper wasn't sure what exactly she was being told. In all likelihood, they'd first determined just how good a look she'd gotten at Arthur's face. Could she be convinced it was a mask? If not, she'd have to be told about werewolves. If she really hadn't known what her husband was, he couldn't imagine finding out like this. Losing him to death while at the same time discovering you might not have ever known the real him at all. A double loss. Cooper's hand tightened in Park's rough and smoothed over it apologetically. Park was still in fur, his head resting in Cooper's lap, even though some agent had already nervously placed a pile of non-ripped, non-bloodstained clothes in a neat pile by his feet. Cooper didn't know why he hadn't shifted yet, but didn't try to rush him. Just carefully picked through his fur for stray bits of glass, assembling a small collection of jagged shards beside him on the bench. For reasons he wasn't even sure he understood himself, Cooper found something about park and fur very comforting right now. It could simply be how competent a protector an enormous wolf was, but Cooper very much doubted that was the only reason. If the two of them were alone, he'd probably bury his face in Park's fur and try to figure it out. But they weren't. Besides Cola glaring down at them, Sophie, Dean, and Ed watched from a distance where they'd been firmly instructed to wait for their own debriefings. Cooper had already told Cola his family knew about werewolves, worried they'd be hustled out into some dismal interrogation room like Genevieve. But Cola had just nodded, her utter lack of surprise or interest making it obvious she was well aware of precisely how informed his family was. He couldn't help but wonder just how close an eye the trust kept on him, or on any human who might spill their secrets. This is your definition of keeping out of it, I suppose, Cola said tightly. I hope you realize what a mess you've made. Yes, I've said to Oliver many times we should stop fighting for our lives around breakables, Cooper said sarcastically. Cola gave him an unimpressed look. I'm not talking about the museum. I'm talking about the fact that twice in one day you've managed to let critical information slip through your fingers. How do you know what's on the phone? Cooper asked. The number of times he'd been knocked around today had pretty much broken any last remaining patience. Does this have anything to do with why Genevieve seems to think you and Arthur Crane used to work together? Or how about the fact that Arthur was in the WIP with Oliver's parents? Cola stared at him for a long, tense moment, then blinked very slowly. 
She turned to Park, who had picked his head up to stare at her. You must understand these decisions were made well before my time as director. I had no say. Park didn't move, and neither did Cooper, his hand stilling in Park's fur, gripping it loosely. Cola tapped her fingers against her own thigh, an unusual display of fidgetiness, and she looked around as if searching for a reason not to speak. But Cooper's family was well out of earshot for humans, and there were currently no trust agents passing through. Finally, Cola sighed, and her posture changed to something resigned. <sighs> Arthur Crane, or the man you know as Arthur Crane, was indeed in the WIP, within the same cell as Daisy and Benjamin for many, many years. They were like, well, not pack, but family, I suppose. She paused. I don't know why, but six years ago, Arthur Crane approached the Trust, claiming the others had acquired explosives and were planning to attack a local ruling pack the following week. In exchange for the details and names of some leading WIP members, Arthur bargained for immunity for himself and a new identity. But there was a leak. A Trust agent belonged to the targeted pack, informed his Alpha, and the pack struck the WIP cell first— we don't know if there really were explosives stored in the house, or if the pack used their own, but everyone died except for your mother, who was unexpectedly absent that night, meeting with a new recruit. They were the only survivors, and of course, Arthur Crane. The very few people are aware of that fact. Park stood suddenly and growled. As if answering a question, Cola responded, That's the way it had to be. If anyone in the WIP were to find out he lived, they would know he was a traitor to his own kind. Arthur used his new identity as an opportunity to fake his death and completely isolate himself from wolves, essentially adopting a human life. His own wife didn't know his true nature. Fearing another league because every goddamn agent has ties to some pack, the only wolves he came into contact with were my predecessor and eventually, when I took over the director position, myself. Once a year check-ins, as is routine. Park snarled, a half-frustrated, half-furious sound that ripped through the space, and then abruptly dipped his head as if trying to bite at his own shoulder. Horrified, Cooper instinctively reached out to stop him, wincing at the way Park's lips pulled back over vicious-looking teeth that disappeared into his own fur as he strained to gnaw on himself, but then hesitated. Hand frozen halfway, not sure if he should touch, not wanting to control. Help him, Cola snapped, and it took Cooper a moment to realize she was speaking to him. I don't, Cooper started. He can't shift if something is interrupting a critical movement point, Cola said. Check around the radial nerves. She tapped her own shoulder impatiently. Cooper blinked but quickly recovered and reached for Park. As soon as his hand landed on his soft fur, Park went very still and docile. Cooper could feel Park's gaze on him as he carefully ran his fingers through the fur at the top of his right foreleg and quickly found a thin but long shard of glass lodged in the flesh. Got you, Cooper murmured. One, two... He pulled the glass out carefully and heard Park huff slightly. He took a few steps away from Cooper shook himself heartily, and then bounced on his front legs a couple times as the sound of clacking stones began. Park stood, shedding one skin for another. Even anticipating it, Cooper couldn't really figure out what happened or how exactly Park's coat seemed to fall and never land anywhere. Cooper picked up the pile of clothes and walked them over to him, then, a little nervously, peeked at his family still watching from across the room. To his surprise and relief, Sophie just looked impressed. Ed satisfied, and Dean gave him a thumbs up, which Cooper decided to wipe from his memory immediately. Seemingly unconcerned with his audience, or maybe just distracted by the truth of Arthur's identity, Park tugged on the generic pair of sweatpants and picked up the conversation where he'd left off. Why wouldn't you just tell me the truth, though? He asked Cola. 
words a little looser in his mouth than usual as he adjusted to the shift. Why did I have to get the same story as everyone else? Helena and I agreed it was safer for you that way. Park made a protesting sound not dissimilar to his earlier growls and fur. Take a moment and remember yourself six years ago, Cola said, holding up a hand. You were devastated, not speaking to your family, unmoored and dangerously desperate for connection with your mother. What would knowing the whole story have changed? Your father is still dead. He was still betrayed by a man who does not exist anymore. The only difference is that as long as you thought the traitor had been killed like everyone else, Daisy wouldn't have any reason to manipulate you. Park shook his head, but it wasn't necessarily in disagreement. Helena knows what Daisy's like. A lot better than you do. Cola added gently. Even if you weren't pack anymore, she didn't want you hurting any more than you already were. Park looked down at the floor, and Cooper put his hand on his back, applying firm, steady pressure, and felt Park lean back into him for a moment. Okay. Okay, Park said finally. So what happened next? Cola sighed, looking suddenly exhausted. A couple days ago, Arthur called me in a panic. Someone had recognized him, had proof of his past, and was blackmailing him. Money for silence. James Finnegan, Cooper said. Yes. The blackmail had been going on for nearly a month, and Arthur had been paying— had even started dipping into the charity funds, but the day before Finnegan was killed, a package showed up at Arthur's house, and he was convinced it meant James had told and the WIP were going to kill him. That's when I first learned of the situation. What kind of package? Cooper asked. A box full of rose heads. Cola said. It's an old legend. Yeah, yeah, the moon cleanse, Cooper said, heart beating fast. Under his hand, Park had stiffened. Well, Arthur thought it was a threat, and seeing as they're wiping him off the floor in the next room, surrounded by pressed roses, I'm inclined to agree. Oh, no, Cooper said. That was me. The flowers, I mean. Cola looked uncharacteristically startled, and Cooper explained about finding the flowers in the book and then dropping it when he was attacked. Then, hesitating just a moment, he told her about the package he'd received himself yesterday. Cola's expression turned increasingly grim. That's three mystery flower boxes. And you're the only recipient still living. What are you talking about? Park said urgently. Three? We found a box of rose heads in James Finnegan's hotel room as well. Same as Arthur received. There was a resounding silence as Cooper tried to absorb that. When Park spoke, his voice was tight with tension. What if this is it? The threat Freeman was talking about. Cooper shook his head, frowning. But why? And who do I, James, and Arthur have in common? No idea. But I can tell you right now who people are going to think it is. It's only a matter of time until every wolf on the continent is whispering about the moon rising. We are a small community, and damn do we love a dramatic rumor, she added in a murmur. Just because of some flowers? Cooper asked, incredulous. Save your judgment for your own people, Dayton, Cola said. Two wolves betrayed their own packs in the most unforgivable way and prioritized humans— Finnegan when he sold his rebel pack to human slaughter, and Arthur when he betrayed his WIP cell and lived a human life. They will be cast from both worlds, cursed to walk between them alone, Park said, clearly quoting the legend again. The slipping. Slipped in death like that, it's unnatural. Frightened people talk. But... Do you believe that's what's happening? Cooper asked. That the legend is true and the moon is walking around punishing turncoat wolves? And me, 
he thought, but didn't add. Cola smiled wryly. You're imagining a big yellow ball walking around on legs, but the moon means many different things to our kind. It's representative of greater power, the cycle of change we have to go through every day, and the duality of our very natures. Now someone out there has discovered the means to take away control over the most fundamental aspect of our identity and is using it to murder wolves. Whether you believe that person is some legendary entity of power or just another earthly murderer hiding behind ghost stories, whether you call them the moon or the unsub, what difference does it make? The result is the same. Cooper couldn't argue with that. So you think a WIP member killed Crane in vengeance, stole the phone, and is using the accoutrement of the legend to make sure the news spreads and incites fear? Why kill James Finnegan, though? A loose end? To sell the story? The real question you should be asking yourselves is how did a member of the WIP even know Arthur Crane came into possession of the phone in the first place? When up until this very afternoon, he was as clueless and desperate to find it as we were. Cooper stilled just slightly, but Cola caught it and nodded. Good, you see what I'm saying. Who knew you found that phone today? Because he's the only person who could have told the WIP that Arthur Crane now had it in his possession. Eli isn't working for the WIP, Park said firmly. You couldn't be more off base. He needs a pack more than anyone. And yet he's no longer a part of one, Cola said. What are you talking about? Park asked. His voice was dangerously low and soft. I reached out to Helena after James Finnegan was murdered, Cola said. I thought she would be able to call Eli in to submit to questioning. Helena told me he was no longer part of the pack. A couple of weeks ago, he asked to be released, which she granted. She was hoping he'd change his mind, but she hasn't heard from him since. That doesn't make sense, Park said, sounding genuinely shaken. Why would he... It doesn't make sense. There's an abundance of nonsense in this case, and yet that doesn't make it less true, Cola said briskly. Now do you know where Eli is or not? Park said nothing, still looking off into the middle space but something about his posture and the stillness of his body made it seem like he was waiting for Cooper to speak first. Like he was waiting to see what Cooper would say. Cooper looked back at his own family, still watching, and then at Park again, who was staring back at him with an almost pleading expression. No, he said finally. No, we don't know where he is. It wasn't not true, as Cooper had half expected, half feared, when he and Park returned home well into the early hours of the morning. The only one there was Boogie, who greeted them at the door with a series of sounds that meant she knew exactly what time it was, and she was disgusted. Cooper cuddled her into a better mood, while Park disappeared into their bedroom, closing the door behind him. After a few moments, the sound of him arguing on the phone with Helena leaked through. To give him privacy, Cooper wandered around the bottom floor with Boogie draped over his shoulder, doing her Beth, Death of Marat impression. He wasn't necessarily looking for a note, but he didn't feel particularly surprised to find one tucked into his closed laptop either. I'm sorry. She knows, but I'll fix it. Take care of him. That seemed a clear indication that Eli had been the one to tell the wolf Park fought, who Cooper was fairly positive was the blonde makeup assistant, their suspicion that Arthur Crane had taken the phone from Cooper. Seeing as she had been standing right outside the wolf exhibit that first day and could surely tell a werewolf from a wolf wolf, Cooper suspected she and Eli had been in contact from the beginning. But Eli had kept her existence a secret. Why? He had a guess. When Cooper didn't hear any more noise from the bedroom for a good while, he put a drowsy boogie to rest on the chair and ventured upstairs. The door had been cracked open, and he entered with a small knock, which seemed silly as Park could surely hear him approach. Park was lying face down on their bed, 
naked under the sheets and didn't so much as twitch as Cooper undressed and got ready for sleep. It wasn't until the lights were out and Cooper was lying beside him that Park moved, rolling over into Cooper's arms, resting his head on his chest. Helena pretty much just said the same things as Cola, he said eventually. He began acting strangely about a month ago. Then, two weeks later, asked to leave the pack and refused to say why. Just thanked her for everything and, as one last favor, asked she not tell anyone yet. Cooper rubbed Park's back soothingly. That's around the same time the blackmail began, he said, thinking. So what does that mean? He was under pressure to leave? He was being isolated from the pack? Why not just tell us that to begin with? I think we act the most irrationally when we love someone, when we feel particularly guilty, or when there is an enormous amount of complicated history behind the scenes. Cooper said slowly, I think the most common intersection of those three things is family. You're saying Eli and the woman are related, Park said. At the risk of sounding like the plot of a 19th century illegitimacy scandal, didn't they look suspiciously similar to you, at least in fur? Park sighed. Yes, they did. For a minute, when I saw her in fur there in the dark, I thought she was Eli. That's why I was so caught off guard when she attacked. He kissed Cooper's chest apologetically, like he was sorry for not stopping the strange wolf sooner before she'd tackled Cooper. It's not your fault, Cooper said. Do you know anything about Eli's life before the rebels? About how he grew up? No. He never wanted to talk about it. Had me promise not to ask. But if there was someone, a sibling maybe, and she ended up in the WIP while Eli ended up with the most powerful ruling pack around, and then she reappears at the same time as James Finnegan, maybe the kind of help Eli needed, he already knew Helena wouldn't be willing to give. Not to a WIP member. Park was silent for a long time. Finally, he said, I didn't ask her about Arthur Crane. Cola was right. At that time, I would have just gone running right to Daisy. Anything for her to reach back. It makes perfect sense, and I'm not even angry, really. Again, Park hesitated. When he did speak, it was so quiet, Cooper had to hold his breath to hear. But I'm tired, Cooper. I'm tired of working with wolves who either suck up to me or avoid me at all costs. Tired of feeling like an albatross around your neck when you try to speak to them. And just because I don't blame Cola doesn't mean I think it's fucking fair that now I have to wonder every day if my boss and my... My grandmother are working in tandem to lie to me. No, it's not, Cooper agreed gently. When I left the pack, I thought I was leaving the lies and learning the truth. But neither of those things really happened, did they? Elena still monitors what I'm allowed to know and when. Well, Cola just gave me another Park Pack approved story. The only thing leaving the pack did was make me a little less close to my family. And now Eli's gone, and I just. I don't know. He's not gone, Cooper said. He's in trouble, but we're going to help him. He's not gone. You don't know that. Park protested, a little hotly. He's clearly in over his head. He could be killed. He could just go on the run and cut ties completely. With him not part of the pack anymore, I feel like... 
like he could slip away, and I'd never see him again. I just feel like people keep slipping away from me. All my life, just in and out, and I never know, is this it? Is this going to be the last time I see them? Park was breathing a little quickly. My parents, my grandfather, my uncles, they... they just keep disappearing. Now, Eli, I don't... don't want to die like Arthur Crane. Cast out. Alone. A stranger to the only person in my life so removed from my own kind that I... I won't even be a wo a wolf anymore. Cooper wrapped both arms around Park and squeezed him close. I won't let that happen, he promised. No matter what. Park took a deep breath and Cooper began to pet his hair. His back murmuring soft comforts. Gradually, Park relaxed under his touch and eventually fell asleep, body lax and heavy, the occasional nuzzles and sounds more senseless. But Cooper stayed awake for a long time after, thinking about promises he couldn't keep and ones he could. The next morning, a scant few hours after he'd finally fallen asleep, Cooper decided he wanted to talk to Neil. To his surprise, Park immediately agreed. Why wouldn't I think it was a good idea? He's been spying on our victim for the last three months, having an affair with the victim's wife, and was mysteriously absent at the time of the murder, Park said, pouring them coffee in the kitchen. I'm extremely curious as to what he has to say. Okay, Cooper said, easily maneuvering around him to grab agave for Park, who liked his coffee sweet. I was sort of thinking we'd just ask him what he knows about this blonde makeup assistant and when she first started showing up. But if it turns into an interrogation, hey, I'm not going to stop you. Cooper turned to hand Park the syrup and found him standing right behind him. Before he could react... Park leaned down and kissed him. Quick, but exceedingly tender. What was that for? Cooper asked, a little dazzled, while Park tugged the agave out of his hand and replaced it with a travel cup of coffee. I was aiming for the cat and missed, Park said, walking away from him. Cooper looked behind him and saw Boogie on the floor staring up at him with a pretty judgmental expression for someone who often stood around with dead things in her mouth just for shits and giggles. Are you a paid critic, or is it just sort of a side hobby? He asked her. In response, she stood and walked past him, huffily to twine between Park's legs. He watched them for a moment and felt such a surge of fondness it nearly bowled him over. If you want to leave, I'd support you, Cooper said abruptly or about as abruptly as a declaration that you'd spent the entire night obsessing over could be. Park was staring at him, a little alarmed-looking, but mostly confused. What? He glanced down at Boogie. What the cat and I had is a passing fling. No need to be the bigger man and step aside quite yet. Cooper rolled his eyes. I mean, I was thinking about what you said last night. Park flinched a little and looked away, staring down at his coffee, loosely holding a spoon in the cup, frozen mid-stir. Cooper went on, trying to tread gently. After everything that's happened, well, I'd understand if you don't want to work there anymore. I'd miss being your partner, of course, but I... I know this was never your dream job, and I don't want you to feel like you're stuck doing this forever because it's... Our thing. He forced a laugh out over the sick feeling he got imagining going on cases without Park. I think it's safe to say we share plenty of other things. By now. Park was quiet. Then. You'd work with someone else? 
He sounded unusually tentative and confused. I'd rather work with you, Cooper said hurriedly. But not if it makes you miserable. And if there's something you'd rather do not around here, teach somewhere, or go back to Canada, I'd, you know. He took a deep breath. Follow you. Leave. You love working for the Trust, Park said, still not looking at Cooper. Yeah, Cooper admitted. But obviously I love you more. Park looked up at him, face soft, and put his spoon down. Come here, please. Cooper walked toward him, and Park pulled him close, tucking his face behind Cooper's ear. I was frustrated last night. Scared, too, he said quietly. Maybe I still am. But never miserable. Not once since the day I picked your awkward ass up at the airport and watched you fidget and check me out and mumble to yourself, lost in the case file the whole drive to Florence. It makes me happy working with you. Cooper started to protest that he shouldn't stay just because of him, but Park pulled back slightly and held a finger to his lips. And I need it for me. If the trust had been what it is now ten years ago, I wouldn't have had to do half the things I did as the shepherd. Ruling packs have too much power because they've been wolves' only viable resource for too long. The sort of work that we do together through the trust, being able to put the skills of the shepherd to use for the good of any wolf who needs it and not just the one pack... I need to believe that helps balance the scales. I need to, he added, almost like he was speaking to himself. Cooper eyed him. I'm no expert, but you're starting to sound a little WIP, don't you think? Park snorted, expression relaxing. I wouldn't go that far. Spread the power, yes, but I personally still need pack. He pressed a kiss to his forehead. Right, well, would you take a neurotic mess and his cat instead? Cooper said, weakly jerking his thumb at Boogie. Park smiled, amused, and returned to stirring his coffee. It would be my honor. They headed out to Neil's soon after, just as it started to drizzle. Cooper had gotten the address from work. Neil was right. Privacy was an illusion. He had moved since Cooper had known him. Of course he would have. It had been years and he'd lived in a too small apartment even then. Not too dingy, but not anything anyone would linger in for a decade, even if they only had the means to move to another equally cramped but different four walls. What Cooper didn't expect was for him to be in a large cookie-cutter house in a gated community 40 minutes outside of D.C. in the opposite direction of where he and Park lived. Not too far from Jagger Valley, where Cooper had grown up, actually. Every house on the block, exactly the same. Every lawn, a monoculture of precisely rolled-out grass. The neighbors within a stone's throw. Groups of them were wandering around, blatantly taking up the middle of the road. Daylight trick-or-treating. This must be the noon shift. Parents pushing strollers or wandering behind five-year-olds dressed as superheroes and running like ducks. Park had to slow the car to a crawl before they were finally able to pull into Neil's driveway. I'd forgotten it's Halloween today, Cooper said, watching absently as they walked up the path to the house. He had the clearest memory of standing in the shadow of a hedge in a rich neighborhood similar to this, where everyone went hoping to get full-size candies. Completely under a sheet he wasn't allowed to cut holes in, all he could see were his own sneakers, the pavement behind them, and the occasional passing shadow and laughter of other kids. He remembered thinking he would never move from that spot. No one would ever find him, talk to him, or look at him again. He could just stand there under the sheet and disappear forever. The idea had thrilled and terrified him equally, how disconnected he'd felt to the world, how he'd always felt slightly out of step with others. 
Cooper rang the elegant four-tone doorbell. Park at his back. No one answered. But as they waited, a second car pulled into the driveway behind theirs. Out stepped Cola. Following us? Cooper asked, a little irritated. Like I don't have an entire secret agency to do that for me, she said, walking right across the grass, seemingly not giving one fuck that her heels sank with every step, leaving holes in the turf. She stopped beside them on the stoop. Reached out to undercover this morning, what with one of the subjects of their ongoing investigations turning up dead and all. And? Cooper asked. Did they have anything to add? There is no investigation, Cola said bluntly. They've never even heard of Arthur Crane, which explains why I wasn't flagged that he'd fallen onto their radar. Cooper shook his head, confused. But Neil, Neil Gerhardt resigned last year, Cola interrupted. Whatever he was doing, it wasn't for the FBI. Cooper was shocked. Resigned? Neil's life was undercover. It was the only thing Cooper had ever really believed Neil loved. Why? The words forced out weren't said, but it was heavily implied, Cola said. He was behaving increasingly erratically. Secretive and paranoid, always liable to go off and do his own thing. He wasn't bringing in the results they'd used as an excuse to look the other way anymore. He also seemed convinced of some kind of cover-up within the agency. She shrugged. Probably wasn't wrong, but madness to outright say to the very people you're accusing. Due to his career record, he was given the option to retire. What the hell is he doing working as Genevieve Crane's assistant? Cooper asked. I asked Genevieve a similar question this morning, and she had some pretty interesting things to say. Namely, that J.T. was obsessed with her husband, was constantly trying to get her to talk about him, that he'd frequently initiate sex with her when she was due to see Arthur soon, and then after ask if she thought he could tell. Cooper wasn't sure what kind of face he was making, but Cola gave him one look and snorted. Just be thankful I'm paraphrasing. She hasn't seen J.T. since the gala set up. How is Genevieve coping? Park asked. Cola shrugged. Aside from seeing the savaged and malformed corpse of her loved one? Well, one might even say suspiciously well. She was quick to jump on Roy's suggestion that Arthur was wearing a Halloween mask last night. But while complaining about Neil's fixation on her husband, let slip it was more than just the cuckolding that got him off. It was like he was testing how well Arthur could scent him. And that isn't a paraphrase. Park made a noise and Cola nodded. Then added for Cooper's benefit. How many unaware humans do you know who use the word scenting over smelling? Not ironclad proof, but my bet is Genevieve Crane isn't quite so clueless as Arthur swore to me she was. And neither is Neil? Cooper asked. Cola held up a piece of paper and a key with a little green plastic tag attached to it. I don't know, but I've got a warrant and Colt Town's gatekeeper gave me a key if you want to find out. She reached past them and knocked hard on the door. Neil Gerhardt, this is Agent Margaret Cola of the Trust. If you are able to, please answer the door. There was silence. Cola used the key and announced herself again as they walked inside. Agent Neil Gernhardt, three trust agents are entering the residence with a warrant to search your home. If you are able to, please respond. Both Cola and Park sniffed the air as they walked into the foyer. I don't hear anyone, Park said, and Cola nodded. Cooper wandered past them, into the living room, dining room, kitchen. It was even more bleak than the outside. Completely clean, and empty. Not literally empty, someone definitely lived there. The fridge had its orange juice carton, its almond milk, the dishwasher had been loaded and run, open boxes of cereal in the cabinet. But there was nothing personal. Not a single item that wasn't essential to living. Demo homes had more personality. 
Cooper thought again of the joke around the agency that there was no real Neil behind the covers. He thought they were naive to think that. He thought they were lucky. The man Cooper had known was a bastard, but he was a... a person. The apartment where he'd lived before hadn't been like this. Looking at this eerily soulless house, Cooper wondered for the first time if the man he thought he'd known was just another cover. That without the job, he was... nobody. He heard Cola going upstairs, and Park joined him in the kitchen, asking, Anything? Nothing. Fucking nothing. Cooper gestured around them, still unnerved. I mean, what is this? Who lives like this? Park shook his head and opened the dishwasher. These have been here since yesterday, I'd say. So he's supposed to have, what, killed Arthur Crane, come home, done a load? Sure, why not? What else is there to do here? Cooper looked around, exasperated. This doesn't feel right, Oliver. Park pursed his lips. I. He jerked his head up, looking vaguely toward the ceiling. What? Cooper asked. I think Cola may have found something, Park said as he quickly made his way back to the foyer and up the stairs, Cooper at his heels. Cooper got a peek of more blank walls, empty side tables, and a pristine bedroom before he followed Park into what might have once been a guest room or office. After the desert that was the rest of the house, walking in here was overwhelming. The desk, chair, bed, and dresser were all covered in camera equipment, files, books, photos, and electronics. Some had spilled onto the floor and appeared to have been shoved together in haphazard piles. On the table beneath the window sat a large vase full of coral-colored long-stem roses. The walls, though. That was what caught Cooper's attention the most. Almost every inch was covered in photos. Almost every photo was of Cooper. Chapter 11 well, this was more than I'd bargained for, Cola said calmly, as if they weren't standing in the middle of a horrifying altar. But then she'd had a few more moments to adjust to the shock, and her face wasn't the one staring down at them from every angle. Cooper glanced at Park, whose expression was unsurprisingly blank, like it usually was when he got the most upset. What was startling, however, were that his claws were completely out hanging at his sides. Seeming to sense Cooper's gaze, Park looked at him, eyes glowing and fully gold. Cooper blinked, and they were back to their average, human-looking amaretto brown. When he checked Park's hands, the claws were gone, too. Park stared at Cooper, as if waiting to see if he'd say something, but Cooper didn't. Hell, he was disturbed enough to pop a claw himself if he was able to. As it was, he could only stand there, arms crossed defensively over his belly, feeling strange, exposed, unsafe. He turned away and began to search the room. Behind him, he heard Park do the same. He's definitely aware of wolves, all right, Cola said a few moments later, a pile of files in her hand. And there's more information about your life here, Dayton, than even I knew. Born Jagger Valley, Maryland, middle name Isaac, medical records, an old resume. Hmm, I didn't know you worked at a movie theater. Lots of notes on the legend of the moon, Park said, flicking through notepads on the bed. Those were probably the most jumbled looking. All fallen to one side as if someone had pulled the covers back to sleep right in the middle of all this madness. A lot of these look like he was recording oral accounts. Who the hell was telling him our legends? Cooper was only half listening. He was studying the photos on the walls. It was difficult to tell, but he'd say most of them were taken within the last five months or so. Him leaving a coffee shop. Him taking the trash at his old apartment. He and Park leaving one of the many houses they'd toured. Cooper felt a wave of fury at that that Park was up on this wall because of him, that Neil had ever sat here laying in his bed and looked at Park? No. 
Besides Cooper, there were photos of Arthur Crane and James Finnegan, separate and together, old and new. Cooper even found the same photo of Arthur that he'd seen on Finnegan's phone. Oliver, Cooper said softly, and heard Park approach and pause a long moment behind him. Then, with a slightly unsteady hand, Park pulled the photo off the wall, stared at it. His fingers brushed almost disbelievingly at the faces of Daisy and Benjamin, his expression a little lost. They look like kids, he whispered finally. How did I never realize how young they were? Cooper touched his hip comfortingly. Oliver, come here, Cola said from across the room. What? Park looked up distractedly, the photo still clutched in his hand. Did you find something? Just please come here, Cola insisted, a steely note in her voice. Her dark brown eyes were wide and serious, and when she held out her hand, beckoning Park forward, Cooper saw her claws were out. He'd never seen Cola slip. Ever. Park made to move toward her, and Cooper grabbed his arm. Let go of him! Cola snapped immediately. What? What are you doing? Park protested, sounding appalled. I said let go and back away, Cola repeated. The hand that had been beckoning before had rotated into a distinctly threatening pose, half raised as if about to slash down. Cooper could feel those claws inside of him as if it was already happening. Phantom pains implied something lesser than, a partial remembrance of the original. But this hurt all the more because it was his own body betraying him, hurting himself. The one thing keeping him calm was how utterly baffled and unconcerned Park was. Park, who would leap in front of a train to protect him, or fight the clouds if he thought the rain caused him pain, was completely relaxed and loose beneath Cooper's hands. What's going on? Cooper asked. You tell me, Cola said, holding up a file. She tossed it on the ground a few steps away, and Park pulled out of Cooper's loose grasp to retrieve it. Cooper kept his eyes on Cola, and Cola stared right back at him. Even so, he could sense Park go still in his peripheral. What is it? Cooper asked. What does it say? Cola lowered her hand, and he risked a glance at Park, who was still staring at the file. Oliver. Park still didn't look at him, but he did hand the file over, and Cooper accepted it cautiously. The tense silence in the room made him not want to open it, but curiosity went out. It always did. It took a moment for Cooper to understand what he was looking at. Someone had glued ripped up bits of paper to a stiff piece of cardstock like they were fitting together a puzzle. It looked like a printed out results sheet, the sort with sparse words and numbers and a mile of ominous white in between. The sort waved under your nose after medical tests or a bad financial diagnosis. In other words, the sort that never boded well. None of the pieces were touching and some bits were missing, so it was difficult to make out what the results were for until Cooper saw the familiar, looping purple script at the bottom of the page. Impossible. And knew exactly what he was looking at. He didn't need to read the rest to remember what it said. He'd been the one to rip it up, after all, right after finding it in some hidden files at the Maudit Falls retreat. His AQ test... The one he'd been told was inconclusive, but had actually tested 100. Impossible. Cooper looked up at Park, who was studying him like a stranger. Like he was looking for something or someone he'd never seen in Cooper before. You recognize it, Park said. 
not a question. Yes, Cooper said anyway, and Park nodded. Cooper didn't know what else to say. He felt strange, defensive, like Park was waiting for him to explain something, admit something. But Cooper hadn't lied to him, hadn't hidden anything from him either. He'd told Park that he'd found his tests and modded and that they were weird. He'd said he thought the non-consensual drugging had messed with the results, and that was still true. Hell, he'd even stolen all the research that had to do with both of them before the trust could get their hands on it. Park had watched him shove it all into the cupboard. He could have looked at it himself any time. He was the one who said he didn't want to. Too offended by the fanatic mind behind the research, too shaken by the way one person's obsession with AQ had become so twisted and violent. He'd even apologized for being so curious and pushy about Cooper's results beforehand. Said he wasn't going to get so caught up in it again. Looked like that was no longer the case. Why didn't you tell me you were... Why didn't you tell me that the test was messed up? Cooper asked, bewildered. I did tell you. You didn't say you scored 100, Park protested. Okay, Cooper said. Does it matter? Park didn't say anything, just kept looking at him. You told me that wasn't a possible score. Cooper continued eventually. The doctor said it wasn't a possible score. You literally said the test doesn't hit zero or a hundred. Clearly I screwed something up as per usual and I was embarrassed to talk about it. What does it matter what the exact error message was? It's not. It's supposed to be impossible, Park said. He opened his mouth, closed it. All right... Cooper said slowly. He glanced at Cola, who just looked thoughtful now. So what's the problem? I haven't told you my SAT scores either. Why? Because they're made up nonsensical bullshit, and I certainly wouldn't have told you them if I'd taken them dosed up on some mystery drug and the results came back as a unicorn doodle. He has a point, Cola said. How is he supposed to have known it might have meaning if you don't tell him? A minute ago, you were gearing up to fight for our lives, Park said accusingly. Now it's all, eh, no big deal. I'm revising my understanding of a situation based on new information. You should try it sometime, Cola said. You can't keep picking and choosing which bits of our world to expose him to and then get angry when he doesn't know that something's worth mentioning. I'm not angry, I'm scared, Park shouted. Cooper was so shocked, all he could do for a minute was stare while Park's words seemed to ring in the air between them. I'm not... not scared of me, he said finally, and his voice skipped a bit. Right? Park's face turned sad, apologetic. No. He murmured, no, of course not. I'm sorry, Cooper, I... He dragged his hand through his hair. You're right. It really is supposed to be impossible. And a month ago, a week ago, hell, yesterday morning, if you'd told me your number, I'd have agreed with you that, yeah, the test is faulty. You filled it out wrong. It doesn't mean anything, no big deal. But, Cooper prompted when Park didn't continue. But, Cola said, in case you haven't noticed, the ghost story we were raised on as children is haunting D.C., and if this little aberration gets out, wolves are going to start thinking it's you. She paused. Are you? Am I an all-powerful being risen straight out of folklore here to wipe out all the little wolf sinners? Well, I'll have to check my agenda, but let's pencil in a soft no for now, Cooper said, irritated. You need to stop dismissing anyone who believes the moon might be more than a fantasy as fools, Dayton, Cola snapped. 
an unexpected edge to her voice. These things are not as clear-cut for us. Your fairy tales are our reality. Or do I need to remind you that you're standing in a room with two werewolves? Cooper felt a blush of shame and glanced at Park, who was staring back at him, obviously still tense. I'm sorry, Cooper said to both of them. I've been rude, and I just... I'm sorry. You're right, this sort of thing is beyond my experience, which is why I don't understand why you think I was the moon. Even if AQ is real, even if mine is 100, what does one thing have to do with another? I'm a human, an outsider. The being we call the moon is not necessarily a wolf, Cola said. They're just supposed to be powerful. Someone able to influence wolves in unprecedented ways, an alpha unlike all others. Someone destined to change the status quo. Your alpha quotient is quite literally off the charts. Your results indicate unprecedented power, and you certainly seem to shake shit up for our kind every few months. She gestured around. Even Neil Gerhardt can do that math. Neil is scribbling on the walls in marker, a confirmed stalker, and very possibly a murderer, Cooper said bluntly. With all due respect, I'm done taking his opinions about me seriously. If you like, Cola shrugged. But others won't be so quick to dismiss the idea. And seeing as how someone has been going through a lot of trouble to make these murders look like the work of the moon, the accusations won't stop there. Cooper gaped at her. You're not saying I'm being framed for murder, are you? He looked at Park, hoping to see his own incredulity there. But Park didn't look skeptical at all. He didn't even look surprised. <laughs> That's absurd. Is it? Even before this fascinating little development, it was obvious you're involved up to your elbows one way or another. You were the one to find both bodies, despite not working the case. Both victims specifically caused harm to wolves you care about. And don't try to tell me you haven't noticed the cause of death is exactly the same as the injury that brought you into our world to begin with. Cooper's hand went reflexively to his belly. He scratched at the thick scars there. But that's all... circumstantial. Agreed. You'll notice I'm not arresting you, but we're talking about rumors now. Gossip. Fear. Take a look around, Dayton. You're one or two well-placed whispers and a printout away from wolves thinking you're some kind of vigilante killer and Neil Gerhardt not only knows it, he's used those 30 years of undercover experience to build an entire case proving it. Cooper didn't know what to say. His head was spinning, trying to make sense of it. But for what purpose? Park asked, saving Cooper from having to respond. Why kill Arthur and James? Why do any of this? Well, I don't think it's a friendly wedding gift to you. Maybe to pull Dayton back into his life. Maybe revenge. You tell us. Cola said to Cooper. You know him best. What's Neil like? Intense. Manipulative. Vindictive. Someone who liked games. Someone who didn't know when to let go. He thought of their last conversation just yesterday. Tried to remember his exact words. I understand now. I get it. And here was Cooper thinking Neil was trying to tell him he'd matured and seen the error in his ways. That hadn't been it at all. He'd been trying to tell Cooper he knew about wolves. Trying to tell him he knew Cooper was... The moon? I can help, Neil had said. Help him do what, exactly? I don't know. Cooper said finally. I... I thought I knew him once, but this is... 
he wasn't like this before. I don't know this person. Cola shrugged. What we do know is he's obviously aware of wolves. From what I've read here, it all seemed to start when he looked into your attack. Maybe he even did it to help you once upon a time. Obviously, he couldn't handle the truth. Most humans can't, Park said. Particularly, one's not partnered with a wolf to help them through it. They either attempt to ignore our existence, pigeonhole us, or crack trying to make sense of a reality that no longer makes sense. Since Gerhardt's wallpaper pattern of choice is your face, I'm guessing he went with option number three, Cola added. And can you blame him? Wolves cost him his career, his lover, his well-being. I've seen humans driven further off the edge for less. Neil and I didn't stop fucking because I became aware of wolves, Cooper said. Didn't you? Cola countered. Because from where I'm standing, you dropped your old life and everyone in it without a second look back. Cooper felt like he'd been slapped. That's not fair, Park said loyally. They're not going to be fair, not when speculating about someone they fear. You, of all people, should know that, Oliver, Cola said meaningfully. But I'm not frightening, Cooper said. I'm nobody. That's what I thought. But even I've got to admit a suspicious number of big things seem to happen around you for a nobody. We partner you with our most feared trust agent to determine if you're responsible for a trail of slaughtered wolves. Your regular partner is arrested and you come back with the shepherd trailing after you like a puppy. Submitting to you. Marrying you. You go on holiday, and two men next in line to inherit control of the most powerful pack on the eastern seaboard are exiled. You go to a simple missing persons case in the mountains and take control of one of the most critical territories on the continent. You can't be surprised you've garnered a bit of a reputation. That reminded Cooper of something. He tried to determine what exactly while Park spoke up. But all those things happened because Cooper's good at his job. Ah, yes, the perfectly reasonable explanation that someone else is simply better than you are. That always stops people from talking, Cola said, rolling her eyes. Look, starting now, this case becomes need-to-know only. The fewer people involved, the less chance this has of getting out. That's what Freeman said, Cooper interrupted, suddenly remembering. Cola and Park looked at him, confused. I mean before. She said I was building a reputation and that someone was interested in my potential. Had plans for me. You think she knew about Neil? Park asked. How? I don't know, Cooper said. He gestured around at the fifty-odd photos of himself. But this... This looks like a plan. Not a good one, but still. Cola was frowning. I think it might be time for that check-in with Dr. Freeman. See if she's in a helpful mood. Every time he'd imagined seeing Dr. Freeman again, Cooper had envisioned himself showing up with a few more answers under his belt. Right now he had so many questions he didn't know how to begin. Luckily, he didn't have to. This time, it was not just Cooper and Freeman in the room. She had finally deemed it prudent to include a lawyer, and Cooper was flanked by Cola and Park. While Cola and the lawyer argued over a deal, Cooper studied Freeman. She'd lost that frenetic, childlike quality he'd noticed when they first met back on the side of the road in Cape Breton, a gunshot still echoing in the air. There was a lazy sort of drift in her movements now, as if floating in water only she could feel. Was it being free of her emotionally manipulative husband that had settled like a quiet cowl over her? Or had her time in custody already broken into her mind and warped the very core of her, as imprisonment so often did? That depends on what your client gives us, Cola was saying. Freeman spoke up for the first time. 
perhaps it would be better if we start with what you've found out for yourselves then we'll both have a clearer idea of how we can help each other i assume since you're here the killings have begun park and cola were very still but cooper shifted in his seat and freeman's eyes zeroed in on him and you've made the connection to the legend of the moon oh my you have been busy how do you know about that cola asked sharply after the terrible events at cape breton i took it upon myself to learn everything i could about your world if you really want to get to know a culture you study the stories they tell each other isn't that right mr park i read your work by the way very interesting it really is too bad you can't publish anything on the legends of your own kind though i suppose you haven't been doing much writing at all with your new priorities park shrugged we're really a much more oral species anyway but i'm flattered you took the time oh i had to freeman insisted earnestly i was terribly curious about you two especially you mr dayton the only human running with wolves so readily accepted into their most elite circles why is that i'm great fun at parties cooper said flatly what does this have to do with our case while i was researching you your past your life now her eyes flicked toward park it didn't take me long to realize i wasn't the only one looking someone else had taken a deep interest in your work yes my secret admirer cooper said you mentioned that last time i was sort of hoping for more the lawyer spoke up my client has already made it clear that we're interested in a deal if you're looking for any more dr freeman who had been studying cooper carefully interrupted him no that's okay we haven't finished going over what you already know have we you wouldn't be here unless you discovered neil gerhardt's dangerous preoccupation with mr dayton cooper stiffened in his seat he carefully didn't look at the others and kept his face neutral but it was hard what do you know about neil i know that ever since your attack he's been trying to investigate one of the largest longest running cover-ups the world has ever had the existence of werewolves i know it's taken over his life lost him his job his relationships his everything i know he's been keeping tabs on you believes you might be important why is that she held up her hand before an answer could be given not that anyone seemed keen to jump in i know you two were sexually involved but surely that can't be the only reason no offense men of course of course cooper said i hate to interrupt this charming exchange but i fail to see what exactly you can offer us cola said bluntly we all know that neil gerhart has some unhinged fascination with dayton i too find it inexplicable but there are about 200 people i'd sooner analyze it with before anyone in this room so if you don't have anything to add she stood up were the victims stuck freeman asked quickly cola paused still standing but making no move to leave did they get stuck during the process of their transformation cola's lips pursed at the incorrect language but still said nothing freeman apparently took that as confirmation and continued i can't tell you why gerhard killed who he killed maybe to bring mr dayton back into his life maybe because he really does believe in the legend of the moon and considers this a sort of courtship gift before he loses him to a rival she glanced at park again then leaned forward but i hope i'm not being too forward in assuming no one at this table actually believes in fairy tales and magic beside him cooper felt park shift in his seat there must be a medical reason for their malformation so you're offering your help as a pathologist cola said skeptically 
believe it or not, we have our own experts here. Got their own test tubes and everything. It's only a matter of time before we determine the cause. You don't understand, Freeman said dismissively. Mr. Gerhardt has made a study of the way people think, but he doesn't know a thing about hard science. He would have needed help to develop such a poison. Someone who knows a thing or two about the, uh, animal side of things. You're saying you think you know who this partner is, Park said. Last year, I was called in to consult on dying wolves at the zoo. I knew right away their illness was deliberate. Someone was experimenting with an early version. Of course, you'll probably figure that out, too, in a matter of time. But time very much matters. What if your agents aren't the first to find the next mutated victim? You can only get lucky so often. Freeman tilted her head, which seemed to be some kind of cue. Nothing else unless there's a deal on the table, the lawyer said. Cola sent Cooper and Park home for the rest of the day while she worked on the specifics of a deal with Freeman's lawyer. Contrary to how it worked on TV, these decisions didn't actually happen with a snap of the fingers, particularly not at this hour. Cola had people to consult, negotiations to run, and decisions to make none of which Cooper and Park could be of much use for, nor did she want them speaking to any suspects. Just try to keep a low profile for 12 hours, Cola had said, shooing them away. Can you handle that? They'd spent so many hours sorting through Neil's room that it was already evening when they got in their car and, not really allowed to do much else, started to drive back home. You think Cola's going to do it? Give Freeman time served and witness protection? Cooper asked as they maneuvered through rush hour traffic and left the city. I don't know that she feels like she has much choice, Park said, turning onto the back road that would take them home and directly into the glare of the setting sun. His skin looked golden in the light and his eyes glimmered and expanded inhumanly. Freeman is right about getting lucky with who found the body so far. It could be anyone next time. You think he's going to try to expose wolves? Cooper asked. Neil's obsession with uncovering their secret existence had taken a serious toll on his life. Was the next logical step wanting revenge? Wanting to show everyone who had dismissed him and forced him into retirement that he'd been right all along? It's not exposure to humans I'm worried about, Park said. As the shepherd, a big part of my job, easiest part of my job, was killing those stories. It's the responsibility of all the ruling packs. Like Cola said, people want to be told they didn't see what they saw. Humans would generally rather believe one person tried to pull a trick on them and that they were too clever to fall for it than the alternative, which is that an entire population of creatures have been successfully deceiving them for millennia, and they've only just this one time noticed. I guess that makes sense, Cooper said hesitantly. But still, it must happen sometimes. I mean, I'm hardly the only aware human in the world. You're talking about a huge spectrum of awareness, though. We don't even use words like alpha around BSI agents because of animal connotations. I didn't use it around you just last year. Now you're talking AQ, are unfazed by slipping and no more secrets about the WIP than possibly any other human. Complaining plenty, but never really struggling to recalibrate your understanding of the world. What understanding of the world? Cooper murmured. But he had to admit what Park was saying rang true. In the BSI, he'd been constantly frustrated by how little they knew about wolves, but really very few of his colleagues ever even asked. They were happy to stay. 
separate. For some reason, that had never felt like an option to Cooper. You might not be able to notice how quickly you've adjusted, Park continued. But every wolf you meet can see it's unusual. He paused, then added faux casually, Even I sometimes catch myself thinking one day I'll go too far, shift too much or shift too slowly, and you'll finally hit your limit. Look at me differently. Oliver, Cooper said, placing his hand on Park's thigh and squeezing. I already look at you differently. That's a good thing. I know, I know, Park interrupted hastily. It's just I'm not used to being so seen by someone who isn't a wolf. He put his hand over Cooper's, running his thumb over his fingers. Okay, Cooper said. So if humans aren't really a risk, what kind of exposure is Cola worried about? If a slipped body is found by the public, the humans will be easily convinced it's a trick. But any wolf will know differently. Cola has a big enough problem on her hands keeping agents discreet. If it gets out to the general wolf public, you... Park shook his head, cutting himself off. Not this moon thing again, Cooper said. I know what Cola said, and I'm really trying to keep an open mind, I swear, but I still can't believe anyone would ever for a second think I'm some kind of whatever this thing's supposed to be. Park glanced at him so quickly Cooper nearly missed it. You don't believe it, Cooper stated, because he couldn't begin to imagine phrasing it as a question. Of course not. Park said before Cooper had even finished speaking, which for some reason made him more unnerved. I mean, you're my moon. And stars, Oliver, Cooper said flatly. Park glanced at him again. I just don't think it's unfathomable that some people might wonder, he said. Maybe more than some. Well, start fathoming. Cooper said as the sun glare got more intense with the passing of a cloud. Because, God forbid, people actually do start expecting things from me. I'm going to need you there with your best incredulous eyebrow pop to tell them there's nothing special about me whatsoever. He yanked open the glove compartment in search of sunglasses. What he saw instead was a rolled-up pair of socks. A prickle of tension went through his body as he tentatively picked them up. Had Eli left something else behind after all? Or had Neil bugged their car, some kind of tracker, a recorder? What are you doing? Put that back. Park said, suddenly sounding panicked, but it was too late. Cooper had already unrolled the socks. The ring was already in his hand. Cooper stared down at it, lying flat in his palm. It was sort of a muted, brassy gold. A thickish band. There was no mistaking what it was. For once, there wasn't a single thought in Cooper's head. Fuck, Park said, pulling the car off to the side and parking. They were nearly home, and the road was woodsy and narrow, with no houses in sight and hardly anyone passing. I, um... Park sounded uncharacteristically flustered. I definitely wasn't going to try to do this today, with everything that happened. The blog said the car is a great hiding place, he muttered. I should have known that was a mistake. They also said a good place to give it to you was a nice restaurant, but every time I've tried to get you in one, it's led to physical violence. So really, I don't know why I'm even surprised. Silently, Cooper poked at the ring, turning it on its side. There was a simple inscription inside. More than words. He looked up at Park, who was blushing and looking down at the ring in Cooper's hand. I, um... I know we didn't say anything about rings, 
And you don't have to wear it or anything. I just thought you might. Park cleared his throat, clearly reaching for some kind of prepared speech. I just wanted to say that whatever we call each other doesn't matter to me. Pack, family, mate, husband, alpha, partner, friend, you're all of those to me. And everything else, too. Park's gaze rose to meet Cooper's. And I love you more than words can even really say. Cooper's throat felt painfully tight. He picked up the ring and rolled it in his fingers. So pleasingly heavy and smooth. But I don't have anything for you, he said softly. I didn't think you could wear rings. Oh, no, I... Gently, he took the other sock out of Cooper's hands and pulled out a very long chain of the same muted, brassy gold color as the ring that hung from it. Lots of us wear necklaces, Park continued, sounding incredibly nervous now. It's just a matter of getting the right length. I've been putting it on when I shift to test it out, and this one works f Cooper swallowed the rest of the word, unable to resist kissing Park any longer, then greedily licked into his mouth for any other sweet things he'd planned to say. Park kissed him back almost desperately, and when he reached up to pull him closer, chain still dangling in his hand, Cooper felt the metal brush his neck. He pulled back from the kiss, and Park made a small, disappointed sound that cut off when Cooper carefully tugged the necklace out of Park's hands. Can I put it on you now? He murmured, fingering the chain. Park blinked, surprised, but nodded. Wide enough to fit around a wolf's throat, Cooper didn't need to unlatch it to put the necklace carefully on Park. It fell lower than most jewelry did. Below his sternum. Does it look okay? Park asked, unsure. Cooper realized he was just sitting there and staring. He nodded, feeling a little overwhelmed, and slowly put his own ring on. A tremor ran subtly through his body, like the whole earth had just heaved a sigh of satisfaction and he was the only one who could feel it. Pretty, Park said. It looks like it fits. How does it feel? It was fairly obvious he wasn't going through the same emotional earthquake that Cooper was. It just didn't have the same significance for him. It wasn't a thing he'd been raised to see as a symbol of commitment. Union. He'd simply wanted to do something nice for Cooper. Is that? Are you getting teary? Park asked, shocked. I didn't even wrap it up nice. I told you it's not about the wrapping, Cooper said, unbuckling his seatbelt. I like to win. He kissed Park again, then murmured against his lips. Your love is the most important thing I've ever won. Park kissed him back, pouring sentiments of yes, that, and this too into his touch. He unbuckled his seatbelt as well only pulling back long enough to slip it off his arm, and then with one hand on Cooper's waist and the other in his hair, pulled him into an even deeper kiss. Cooper couldn't resist running his fingers over Park's chest until he found the ring and squeezed it in his hand. The motion made the chain tug on Park's neck a bit, and he growled into Cooper's mouth, then dragged his lips down to work on Cooper's throat, biting and sucking. Cooper just panted staring up at the ceiling for a minute. He felt raw. From the ring, from Park's words, from the whole fucking day. Oliver, Cooper murmured, reaching down to squeeze Park's hard cock through his pants. I need you. Park groaned, pulling back. We're almost home, I'll... No, Cooper said. Please, here, I don't... 
How could he explain the urgency, the desperation he felt, the intense, unexpected joy of the rings just on the heels of the violating horror of seeing the photos of him park their home? The need to feel in control of his own body, the need to do exactly what he would have done on any other day without a second thought, without shame. I don't want to wait, was all Cooper could say. You'll hear if someone's coming. He bit Park's ear lightly and squeezed him again, feeling the solid heft of him, the way he twitched in Cooper's hand. Please, let me make you feel good. Let me thank you for my pretty present. Park exhaled shakily and undid his own pants, pulling them down to reveal his dick bulging in the confines of his boxers. All right, get your mouth open. Cooper groaned and immediately slid down to start sucking on Park through the fabric, getting it so wet that soon he could trace the ridges and lines of him with his tongue. Eventually, Park wound his fingers in Cooper's hair and pulled him away while his other hand worked his underwear down and let his dick spring free. Cooper strained toward it, but Park held him back. You've got to earn it first, Park said. He made Cooper watch while he started to stroke himself, squeeze, brush his thumb over the tip, collecting any drip. Then Park held the thumb to Cooper's lips and let him lick it clean before abruptly pulling Cooper all the way back up to his mouth for a kiss so he could taste himself. Cooper reached between them to take over where Park had left off, jacking him off slow and teasing until Park couldn't focus on kissing anymore. His head fell back against the headrest, and Cooper just watched the play of pleasure on his face when he twisted his hand here or swiped his thumb there until Park was thrusting up into his fist. When we get home, Cooper murmured, speeding up his strokes, I want you to fuck me. I want you to feel that ring pressed against my back while you bend me over and make me take you. Park's hand tightened in Cooper's hair. I want you to make me wait on my knees on the floor by your feet until you're ready to have me again. Park snarled, hands tightening in Cooper's hair and pulled his head down. He went eagerly, freeing his own dick as he went. He sucked Park off sloppily, groaning and whimpering and choking the obscene sounds extra loud in the closed space of the car. Park's hand was just resting lightly on his head, so Cooper reached up and pushed it suggestively. Park caught his wrist and rubbed at the wedding ring, as if surprised to see it. Then, still clutching Cooper's fingers, he used the heel of his hand to push Cooper all the way down and hold him there as he thrust a couple of times and then started to come in his throat. Cooper jerked instinctively. The panicked flare of not being able to breathe that disappeared as quickly as it had come, replaced by a throbbing arousal before Park yanked him back off and finished on his tongue. They stayed like that for a moment, both breathing heavily, until Park eased him back into his own seat. Cooper just sat there with his arms limp by his sides, chest still heaving, dick straining painfully up toward his belly. Park took it all in, then said, Touch yourself. Cooper obediently reached for his cock, but Park stopped him. No, the other one. Cooper froze, then tentatively switched to his non-dominant hand. It felt strange, of course, but the way Park's eyes flared as he watched Cooper's ringed finger stroke up and down his hard, heated flesh more than made up for it. Paired with the well-used feeling in his throat and the taste of Park on his lips, he soon found himself teetering on the agonizing, aching edge, clumsy grip be damned. Oliver, Cooper whispered with longing, reverence. This was as close to prayer as he got. Oliver, I... Park's gaze flicked up to meet his, and he looked... wonderstruck. Like the sight of his ring, proud and bright on Cooper's finger, was astonishing. 
like the sound of his name quivering and cracked in half with Cooper's need was precious. Park reached to cup his face in his palm, thumb tracing over swollen lips, then trailed down Cooper's body to cover the hand wrapped around his dick with his own. Park leaned closer, murmuring, Mine. And Cooper came, arching into their tangled hands, feeling both released and bound tighter to Park than he ever had before. When Cooper's high faded, he focused on Park, who smiled softly. I think perhaps I'm beginning to see the appeal of these after all, he said, rolling the ring on Cooper's finger. Mm, just wait till I teach you the joys of themed anniversaries. Your three is going to knock your socks off, Cooper said, and Park laughed. They took their time cleaning up, straightening themselves out, and Park had just started the car when there was a buzzing sound. Park slid his phone out of his pocket, and when Cooper reflexively glanced down, he saw Eli's name. Where are you? Park asked immediately upon picking up. He frowned, then put it on speaker. Say that again. I need help, Eli said, voice ringing out tinny and hollow in the little room. There was a pause. Something bad happened. He was speaking in a very slow monotone and hesitating before each sentence. Where are you? Park repeated. What's wrong? He... Pause. He wants to talk, Eli said. Pause. Come to the zoo's medical bay by the Andean bears. Who? Park asked urgently. Eli, is Neil Gerhardt there with you? Pause. Yes, he's here. Pause. You and Cooper have to come in the next half hour. Pause. Or I'll be the next. Pause. Bad little wolf punished. Pause. For betraying you. Eli's voice shook for the first time. And telling stupid, pause, W.I.P. where to find Arthur, pause, don't tell anyone else, you know I, pause, still have plenty of friends in the bureau and I will find out, pause, half an hour now, don't be late. Pause. Then Eli said in a rush, Oliver, don't! The line went dead. The zoo was just closing and the sun nearly set when Cooper and Park arrived. It was still drizzling out. That light, inconsistent misting of raindrops that might have come from the sky or had merely fallen from the swaying trees. Wind blew shockingly bright, orangey-red leaves around their ankles as they walked down the paths and the color reminded Cooper of the coral roses. Park was looking around, trying to catch any signs of a threat. The problem was, there were too many sounds. Too many smells. The zoo was a sensory overload, even for a human. For a wolf, it must have been a nightmare. The door they'd taken that first day when searching for James Finnegan with Sophie was cracked open with a brick. Cooper entered first with his weapon drawn. The long hallway with the cages appeared to be empty, but it was very dark and smelled faintly of ammonia. Probably not so faintly to Park, who coughed and had to blow air out of his nose a few times as if it burned his airways. It took a lot longer to travel down the hall than it had last time, now with the need to check each cage. They were all empty even the last one where the bear had previously been kept. Finally, Cooper and Park reached the large double bay doors at the end of the hall. It was eerily silent. Cooper looked at Park and realized the ring was still hanging out. 
He tucked it safely inside Park's shirt, letting his palm rest over it for a moment, feeling the steady, sure beat of his heart. Then he nodded to show he was ready. On the count of three, Park murmured. One. Two. They burst through the double doors, quickly scanning the room. It, too, was dark, lit only by the sporadic glow of a computer monitor screensaver across the space. This was the medical bay, all right. The ammonia smelled stronger in here, and even Cooper's eyes were watering. The hum of the samples fridge and buzz of the fluorescent lights made the room feel claustrophobic, though it was actually quite large, and had several closed doors leading to the lab, containment area in front of the building. There was a large metal table in the center of the room with a figure lying on it, covered in a light blue sheet. Unmoving, Park made a pained sound. Eli, please, no. Park seemed frozen, staring at the figure on the table. So Cooper walked forward, took a deep breath, and pulled back the sheet. He gasped and stumbled back, knocking the body's arm slightly as he recoiled. It fell and hung limply over the edge of the table. Neil Gerhardt lay on his side, dressed in a very sleek tuxedo, violet lips slack, eyes staring straight at Cooper, filmed over and dry and long dead. On the other side of the room, another set of doors opened, and Eli stepped into the room. Eli, what? What the hell is going on? Park asked. I'm sorry, Eli said, his voice cracked. Just don't shift, don't shift, don't... The sprinklers turned on over their heads, and Cooper jumped as frigid water hit the top of his head and started dripping down his face and neck. He blinked and swiped hurriedly at it, trying to keep his sight clear, and looked at Park, who was doing the same. But no matter how many times he wiped away water, his vision kept getting blurrier. It was like he was wearing glasses, straining to see through the gathering fog. Cooper took a step forward, wanting to be nearer Park, and his knee bent dramatically, sinking toward the floor like stepping into quicksand. How was there quicksand in here? Don't shift! Don't shift! Eli's voice was yelling. At least Cooper thought it was Eli. It sounded strange, just like a bunch of noises mashed together. Which is what all words were, Cooper realized. Just noises that sound different than they look. That was when Cooper realized he might be drugged. He tried to move his other foot, but his legs felt too far apart to get any leverage one way or another, and he just sat down instead. A pair of pants was walking toward him. Cooper looked up, and above the pants he saw an enormous bug's head with bulging dark eyes and a stumpy proboscis before the fog sank right through his corneas and into his mind, and the blackness took over. Chapter 12 When Cooper woke up, his shoulders and back ached and his fingers were numb. Hmm... He mumbled, rolling his stiff neck. Whatever his head was resting on moved with him, and he realized he was sitting upright, leaning against something. Cooper? Park asked. Are you awake? Hmm. He said, deciding Park could interpret that how he wished, and Cooper could still claim plausible deniability in case he changed his mind and went back to sleep. He felt horrible like being a teenager again and waking up after 12 hours of painful, unconscious growing, feeling all at the same time like he'd slept too little, too much, and like he wasn't waking up in his own body at all, but rather some heavy, tender... thing. Cooper, I need you to wake up. Park spoke again, and the pain in his voice forced Cooper to reach deep within himself and focus. Park needed him. He opened his eyes, and the first thing he saw was Eli. Eli, sitting on the cement floor of a cage, head tilted back against the fencing, watching him. Expressionless. Not like when Park was hiding his emotions, but like he'd... given up. Cooper tried to move and immediately felt pain in his wrists like they were bound by something. That finally snapped him the rest of the way into his senses. He was sitting upright on the floor as well, 
his ass fully numb against the cold cement, which somehow just made the small of his back feel like it had taken over Atlas's job and had absolutely lied on the resume. He was leaning up against Park's warm, solid, much sturdier-seeming back, which was almost nice, except for the fact that their wrists seemed to be cuffed together between them. They felt thicker than handcuffs. Heavier. Some kind of animal restraints, he'd guess, based on the whole zoo thing. Cooper looked around as best he could and realized Eli wasn't the only one in a cage. He and Park were in the one the bear had once occupied. Eli on the other side of the fence with the howdy door between them. We're still in the same building, Park said. I think it's been about four hours. When did you wake up? Cooper asked, eyeing Eli, who just stared back, unsmiling. Park paused. Only a couple of minutes ago. Cooper felt surprised by that. Werewolves, higher metabolism, usually meant they processed things like food, alcohol, and other drugs a lot quicker. But Park had barely regained consciousness before Cooper had. He tried moving backward, piecing together what had happened. It was rather dark in the cages, only lit by moonlight that filtered in from the tiny, high-up, barred window along the outside wall. It must be fully night then, and unlikely anyone was going to come wandering by, which was probably the point of keeping them tied up here, waiting. He thought of the person walking up to him just before losing consciousness. Not an enormous bug man, but someone wearing a gas mask staring down at him protecting themselves from the mist that had come out of the sprinklers just after they'd seen Eli watching them from the doorway and kneel on the... Cooper exhaled shakily while regret, sadness, and anger flipped over in his stomach like a stone dislodged by the tide and resettled heavily somewhere so deep within he didn't think he'd be able to budget again for a long time. Foolish to feel so viscerally because of a man he'd only just this morning despised. But loss was too complex a thing to always feel what you were supposed to feel. Are you okay? Park was asking, clearly sensing some of the turmoil Cooper felt. I'm not hurt, Cooper said. You? Park hesitated for so long, Cooper had halfway convinced himself the next words out of his mouth would be, Actually, I was just clinging to life long enough to say goodbye. I'm not injured, Park said finally. But I'm having a hard time... moving. Okay, in what way? Again, the silence stretched between them. Cooper tried to help. Aching pain? Sharp pain? Numbness? Coordination problems? Stiffness? He asked, quickly trying to remember what each one might indicate. Some more serious than others. Yeah. Those, Park said. Cooper stilled. What, all of them? Cooper shifted on the floor and Cooper could feel him straining against him, as if trying to crack his own back into place. Yeah, my spine feels like crumbled cement. Someone's stabbing me in my shoulder. My ass is just one enormous hunk of aching meat, and everything's... muffled, Park said, still trying to stretch. My nose feels all stuffed, and my ears are still full of water, and it's so fucking dark in here... He went on, getting more and more frustrated, stretching his back and rolling his neck and shifting on the floor. He was moving around so much it was really starting to irritate Cooper's skin as their cuffs pulled together. Almost as soon as he noticed it, Park stopped tugging. Now my wrists are burning. It's like as soon as I focus on one thing, something else starts hurting instead. Okay, okay, breathe with me. Cooper said, trying to calm himself down. It wasn't like Park to be so... vulnerable. Does any of it feel life-threatening? No, he said. He sounded a little more settled after matching his breaths to Cooper's. 
nothing that bad. It all just feels sort of the same level of unpleasant, and I feel really weak, drained. Cooper maneuvered his hands a little so he could grasp a couple of Park's fingers. He squeezed them comfortingly, and Park jerked away. What's wrong? Cooper asked. I think I have a bunch of glass in my fingers, Park hissed. My whole hand just feels packed with it. What the fuck had happened to Park while they were unconscious? Okay, it's going to be okay. Eli, are you hurt? Cooper called out and felt Park jerk behind him and try to turn his head. Eli's here? The pure shock in Park's voice chilled Cooper to the bone. Yes, he said softly. He's in the neighboring cage, can't you? You didn't send him? Park didn't answer. He just sat very still. Eli? Cooper tried again when Park stayed quiet. Can you hear me? Yes, Eli said so quietly Cooper barely caught it. In a way. What happened? What's going on? Cooper asked. Eli's eyes slid shut and he pulled his knees up to his chest and hugged them. I'm sorry, he whispered. I didn't want to lie to you, but I had to. I had to, and it's my fault. Again, again, it's always my fault. He dropped his head to his knees and rocked slightly. Cooper couldn't help but feel like he was the worst possible person to be sandwiched between two wolves having full-blown mental crises. He tried to think of what Dr. Rapoti would say. We're running out of time, Cooper said. Just start with why you're here. Hi. Eli started, and his voice cracked. He picked his head up with a deep breath and looked Cooper right in the eye, seeming to steal himself. I wasn't actually being blackmailed. I just told you that so you'd help me find the phone. Cooper blinked, not expecting that. So it was a lie. Everything you told me about what happened to you with the rebel pack. No, Eli said firmly. That was all true. Ollie, Oliver, can confirm. Park shifted behind Cooper. The first movement he'd made in a while. But, but what he doesn't know, what I didn't tell anyone, was I, I didn't join the rebels alone. You do have a sister, Park said wonderingly. How could you never tell me? My twin sister, Eli confessed. I didn't tell you because I didn't think I would ever see her again, and it was painful, and made me feel guilty. Why guilty? Park asked. Because it was my fault she ever got mixed up with him anyway, Eli snapped. Because the first time I ever saw James, I became so ridiculously infatuated and believed he was everything a werewolf was supposed to be that I begged her to come with me. Begged her to break the promise we'd made to each other as children and show someone else what we could do. Because when I was finally free of my imprisonment... Eli kicked out at the fencing that clanged and shook. The entire pack was dead, and I thought she was too, and it was my fucking fault. He emphasized each word with another kick. The wobbling metal hummed long after Eli fell silent. When he spoke again, it was a whisper. Why on earth would I ever want to tell you about that? I was already enough of a monster in your eyes and mine, too. Eli, Park said, sounding like he was in almost as much pain as Eli. I never thought that. I still don't. Eli sniffed, turning his head to the side and wiping at his nose. Ideally, Cooper would just let them sniffle it out. But ideally, they wouldn't be doing a three-man reimagining of the Count of Monte Cristo, either. But she wasn't dead, was she? Cooper prompted as gently as possible. She'd wound up in the WIP. 
Yes, Eli said. Eventually. She thought I was dead, too. It was Daisy, actually, who reconnected us in the end. Daisy? Park asked a little breathlessly. Mm, they were in the same WIP group for a while. I guess after she showed up in Cape Breton this February, she put two and two together, realized we were related, and my sister found me a couple of months ago. But she was in trouble. She was the one James Finnegan was blackmailing, Cooper said. I live in the middle of the woods of Nova Scotia watching soaps all day. He never had a chance of finding me again. And even if he had, the park pack would have protected me. But Alice, my sister, she lives right here in D.C. Her partner is human. She has no pack protection. Has nowhere to turn. I knew Helena would never help. Friend of Daisy, W.I.P., part of the very group she blames for the death of her son. <sighs> I left the pack before she'd ever have the opportunity to tell me no. With the debt I owe Alice, I had no choice. So you hired us, told her when it seemed like Arthur had the phone, and she showed up at the gala to steal it? Cooper said. Why would she attack us, though? She was just scared, Eli said quickly. She saw you standing over Arthur and thought you'd killed him. She thinks you are the... He trailed off, and the silence sat awkwardly as Eli studied Cooper very carefully, warily. Finally, he shook his head. No. Well, she only saw you briefly in the dark during a very traumatic situation. Even the most discerning eyes might mistake you for something special. There was the briefest flicker of the old Eli's biting tone before his voice got even more frantic than before. I rushed over here to dissuade her from acting on such a nonsensical idea, but he has her and he'll kill her if I didn't do what he says, and I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but I can't let that happen, not again, I couldn't. The whine and creak of a door opening echoed from down the dark hallway. Eli fell silent, pulling his knees close to his chest again and seeming to shrink in on himself. Cooper heard footsteps and the erratic rumble of flimsy wheels on cement slowly approaching. Ryan Bask appeared, pushing a four-foot-long metal cart covered by a light blue sheet, same as had been draped over Neil. There were also shapes under this one, what looked like bottles and jars as opposed to a second body, thank God. Wakey, wakey, he called, clapping his hands. Oh, good, everyone's up. I was a little worried I'd use too high a dose. That's the first time I've administered through aerosol, you know. You, Cooper said, mind spinning. Oh, yes, me, Ryan agreed and pulled the sheet off. The bottom of the cart was just sliding metal doors that looked like storage, but the top level was full of what looked like veterinary supplies. Various brown plastic bottles, large syringes, shiny, sharp instruments. It was too much, Cooper said, hastily trying to pull it together and come up with any reason to get Ryan to open the cage. My partner's very sick. You don't want him to die like this. Otherwise, why keep us here? Oh, he's not dying, Ryan said cheerfully, fiddling with one of the syringes and bottles. He's just human. Cooper's heart clenched painfully, and behind him he felt Park jerk, as if he'd tried to leap up and hadn't even made it off the ground. Ryan had stopped futzing to watch them intently. Or as close as their kind can get, anyway, he added. He held up the syringe in his hand and waved it. You've heard of paralytics targeting one system of the body or another. This one specifically attacks the wolf system, just completely zones in on every cell with those particular protein markers and beats the living crud out of them. <laughs> he laughed. I gotta admit, this is the first time I've seen it work like this, though. So totally cool. This is what you used on James Finnegan and Arthur Crane, Cooper realized. This is what made them... stuck. I mean, that's how it's supposed to work. They're supposed to monster out as soon as the toxin hits the bloodstream and they feel something's wrong. 
It's like literally their number one defense system animals are so predictable. But by the time they're mid-transformation, all the little wolf cells are totally freaking paralyzed. They can't move forward, but they can't move back either. You can see it in their eyes as it's happening. They're like, huh? Does not compute. It's actually so wild to watch. Nature is crazy. A flash of irritation passed over Ryan's face. You could have seen it yourself if this one hadn't figured out what was happening right away and refused to do his thing, he said, wandering over to Eli's cage and looking in. There's something extra abnormal about him. Eli pulled himself up a little taller, stuck his chin out defiantly, and with a glimmer of his old self, puckered his lips and blew a kiss. Ryan's face turned red and his expression angry before he turned away and walked quickly back to his cart. By the time he got there and started sorting through his tools again, he seemed to have regained his composure. Still, all the great discoveries have come from making mistakes, Ryan said practically. Something about it set off a distant memory, but Cooper didn't have time to contemplate it further. Ryan was still talking. Like, look at how horrible they both look right now. They've never felt this way before because they've never felt human before. Even when they look like they're a human or when they look like they're a wolf, they're not. They're never entirely one thing or the other. Doesn't that just teach us something amazing? Is that why you're doing this? Cooper asked. Why, you murdered James, Arthur, and Neil to learn something? Ryan looked startled, then laughed. Um, no, what do you think I am, crazy or something? You killed them. What? Cooper choked. Ryan nodded earnestly. Oh, yeah. Wolf traders hated by all, getting away with it, living guilt-free, until you swept in and punished them with your unnatural powers that banished them between worlds and left your mark on their bellies so that all will know who struck them down. Don't you get it yet? You're the moon, Cooper Dayton. Ryan smiled a bit as if amused despite himself. Or that's what the wolf world is going to think anyway. When I'm done setting you up for these murders. I mean, geez louise, even these guys were looking at you spooked there for a minute. He said, gesturing at Eli and Park. What possible reason could you have for wanting to convince wolves Cooper is some... Legend, Park asked. Even if you are able to get him arrested, you can't believe you can plant enough evidence to charge him. What would getting him arrested do for me? Ryan asked, bewildered. No, no, that would ruin everything. Sorry, Cooper. You have to die tonight, buddy. But like any god worth his salt, you'll rise again. Somewhere else when you're needed most. I don't understand, Cooper said. Ryan tucked his hair behind his ears, thinking, You know what people do when they believe in gods? Half of them pray for him to make their problems go away. He pressed his palms together at his chest and said in a childlike voice, Please, Mr. Moon, the big bad wolf has hurt my pack. Here's my donation of ten grand to punish him like you punished the others. His voice returned to normal. And the other half of them blame him for their problems. He stuck his hands on his hips and spoke like an old-timey detective. Got another killing, Lou. Same distinct signature as the others. Half transformed, gut clawed open, covered in rose heads. Must be that Cooper Dayton that struck again. He really thinks he's the moon, doesn't he? Well, it wouldn't be the first occasion he's taken justice into his own hands. It was only a matter of time till he snapped, I always said. Ryan let his hands drop and a big grin split his face. We're going to clean the heck up, you and I. Well, me and your reputation, anyway. Which, like, couldn't be any more perfect for this, by the way. I mean, when I found out the wolf who mutilated you was murdered by your ex-partner and that some wolves still think you were involved, I was like, oh wow, am I being baited right now? Because this is literally too perfect. I really owe you, man. 
Ryan tilted his head. Well, you and Neil, we wouldn't be here without him. Neil, Cooper thought, and for the next couple seconds couldn't think of anything more than the violet color of dead lips that used to say his name. Is Neil Gerhardt who made you aware of wolves? Park bit out behind Cooper. Is he where you got all this nonsense about the moon? Because it's all wrong, and I'm afraid you've bought into one fairy tale too far. He sounded icily dismissive, not like Park at all, and Cooper wondered if his words rang as false to everyone else in the room. Ryan certainly didn't seem worried. If anything, he looked passively entertained, much the same way as people did at the zoo, standing and staring at an animal with vague, condescending interest. I didn't need Neil to tell me about all that, he said as if the idea was ridiculous, then shook his head. Well, that's not fair. I might have known about your secret little world, but he is the only way I found out about you, Cooper. He was so excited to meet someone who actually also believed in werewolves that it only took a month of guy's nights out and he was showing me his creepy altar. What a jackpot. Neil wasn't a wolf traitor, Cooper said softly. Yeah, no, that one's on me, Ryan shrugged. Dude had literally started to believe you were some kind of magic moon fairy and was stalking you nonstop. No way he wouldn't have noticed when you died and I took your place. Get this, he even thought you were the one who'd killed James and suspected you were going after Arthur next. I barely even had to say anything. Talk about a perfect test run. Ryan sighed heavily. <sighs> I was going to let him live longer too, but the big doofus showed up here last night rambling about how he tried to talk to you and that you'd refuse to let him in on whatever you were planning. He dragged his finger across his throat while making a rude sound, and Cooper couldn't help flinching. Aw, Ryan said, watching him. Don't look sad. Honestly, you should probably be thanking me. He also said you were keeping two werewolves as pet monsters, and how he couldn't wait to do the same thing to you soon. I swear, half the time I couldn't tell if that guy loved you or hated you. He was so... creepy. And mean but I don't need to tell you that. He made a face and went back to filling a syringe with something from a small glass bottle. Whatever. I'll figure out some way to explain it so it doesn't affect our brand. So this is just advertising to you, Park said, sounding sick. You're doing all this for money. Oh, boo freaking who Someone did something bad to make buttloads of money. Hello, journalism? Have I got a scoop for you? Ryan snorted. I've been making money off of animals my whole life. The bigger the animal, the more money they bring in. Getting zookeeper credentials opened a lot of doors for me in animal trafficking. And a lot of wallets. But when I found out there's a whole animal species walking around with their own bank accounts... He gestured vaguely at Eli and Park. Big leagues, baby. I started planning that very night. It's taken me months to get everything in place, but shoot, I'm a born entrepreneur, man. Do you want to live on the top or die at the bottom? I mean, what do the killers you usually run into do it for? Revenge? Love? Ryan laughed. Here, maybe we can make it look like that if you want. The moon is out, after all. <laughs> He yanked open the sliding metal drawers under the cart top, and a woman half fell out. Cooper only had to hear the rage in Eli's voice as he leapt to his feet and tore ineffectually at the fencing to know it was Alice. Even so, Cooper recognized the white blonde buzz cut. The blue-gray eyes half-closed, but still clearly whiteless, luminescent, and as inhuman as the rest of her half-transformed face. Both Eli and Park were snarling now. It sounded different than usual, lacking the guttural, vibrating edge Cooper would feel in his throat. There was nothing wolf-like about it. Just a noise made from muscle memory and something akin to human anguish. 
Cooper felt a wrenching sadness for this woman, for Eli, for Park. Ryan wasn't just a murderer. He'd stolen the very core of their identities. Their control over their own bodies forced them into the skin of strangers. A cold, burning anger swelled inside of him as he stared into Alice's unfocused eyes. There was nothing he wouldn't do, he thought, to get them back their souls. Alice's eyes moved to look straight at him. Cooper inhaled sharply. Ryan picked up a long electric animal prod and walked over to the cage fence, searching for what had caused the reaction, and Cooper hastened for a distraction. You must have something pretty big planned for the finale, he said. Hmm, Ryan said, apparently bored with explaining himself. Behind his ankles, Alice's fingers twitched, and her half-extended claws shrank almost imperceptibly. The paralytic was wearing off, sooner than Ryan expected, probably. It must have something to do with Eli and Alice's uncommon relationships to shifting. Their bodies must be reacting to the toxin slightly differently than the others had. They needed time, though. And with Ryan standing right there with a zapper in one hand and a syringe full of more toxin in the other, the slightest mistake could set them back to square one. At any moment, he could decide to top Alice off. Or, you know, just move on to the killing stage. I mean, it's a pretty good plan and everything, Cooper said. But don't you think you are missing a huge problem here? Ryan looked at him, interested once more. What's that? I get why I might have killed James Finnegan. He was the worst. And I get why I might have killed Arthur Crane. I even kind of think Neil's d death will help convince people it was me. Cooper said, stuttering over the word only slightly. Our relationship was rough. No one even knows how rough. Behind him, Park's hands flexed spasmodically, and his nail slightly nicked the skin under one of Cooper's fingers. It stung surprisingly bad. But you and Neil talked, talked about me, so maybe you do know, Cooper said, ignoring the pain. I guess there's motive there, too. He looked away as if embarrassed, but used the opportunity to check in on Eli, who was still standing, fingers grasping the fencing loosely. At a glance, he just looked defeated and lost in his own thoughts. But Cooper could see the way he was rocking on the balls of his feet ever so slightly. The preferred balance point for wolves. I mean, I wasn't going to say anything about it now and make you feel awkward, Ryan was saying. But yeah, he talked about a lot of cruddy stuff. I told you, you're better off without him. Thank you, Cooper said. But now you have a problem. These people here? I don't want any of them to die. The opposite. And you're going to have a really hard time convincing anyone differently. Ryan frowned. Okay, I still feel like you don't really understand the power of a myth. It sounds totally dopey to me and you because we're not wolves and weren't saturated in that stuff. But when human sinners are punished and someone says it's God's will or karma or whatever, even total atheists don't say no freaking way, you're out of your mind. They keep their traps shut. Alice's mouth was moving slightly now. Not like she was trying to speak, but like the teeth hidden just behind her lips were moving around of their own free will. More time, more time, more time. But these aren't sinners, Cooper protested. It won't make sense. Ryan laughed. Um, the twins were literally the heart of Robin Hood's merry band of thieves, and this one, he said, gesturing to Park with the electric prod. He's totally the bad guy. Wolves are almost as afraid of him as I'm going to make them afraid of you. You know how huge that's going to be? The moon taking out the shepherd? I mean, we are talking alien versus predator shizzle right here. You are about to explode onto the scene. Our cred is going to rock it. Considering everything else going on, up to and including their imminent brutal murders, maybe it shouldn't have shocked him to hear Ryan call Park that, but it did. How do you know about the shepherd? 
who told you all of this? Cooper blurted out because he couldn't help wondering. Not because he thought he was going to get an answer. Still, Ryan hesitated and an almost pitying expression crossed his face. Three can keep a secret if two of them are dead. Maybe I'm not the only one who recognizes a good opportunity when I see it. He said absently and checked his watch. Almost time. I need you guys displayed for maximum effect right when the zoo opens. He unlatched the cage door. But you're talking about letting humans see, Cooper protested, feeling Park start pulling desperately at the cuffs between them as Ryan stepped inside. More time, more time, more time. Yeah, it will be a big story sure to get lots of national attention, and then the wolves will reframe it like they always do. I mean, the day after Halloween, I'm practically handing them a cover story on a silver platter. But those in the know will still know. They won't be able to convince them. He stepped closer, holding the electric animal prod up, and pointed at Park. Don't bite me now, Ryan warned. You're really not up to causing the kind of damage you're used to, and you can't imagine how much pain this thing will cause to your human body. You might even have a heart attack, or bite your own tongue off, trust me, totally not worth it. It suddenly reminded Cooper of his and Park's first case together. The cage. The electric prod, only this time his position had changed. He wasn't on the outside with the humans lying and pretending. He was inside the cage. With the wolves. If this was really it and it had to end, this was exactly where he wanted to be. Fighting for and beside people he loved. Proud of the direction his life had taken of the ways he'd changed and been changed. Cooper flexed his hands and found Park doing the same. They intertwined fingers as best they could and squeezed. Once. Twice. On the third squeeze, Cooper pressed against Park's back and felt him do the same. Using opposing force, they were able to make their way to standing. Or semi-standing, at least. Cooper's legs were so numb from sitting he was propped up more on the belief that they still existed beneath him than any actual feeling that proved it. Ryan was looking at them, amused and vaguely impressed. Okay, that was pretty cool. I almost feel bad I have to kill you now, but... He raised the prod and turned it on, the crackling ringing through the air. Don't worry. Legends never really die. His head suddenly snapped to the side and he stumbled over, revealing Alice standing behind, still half-transformed, barely able to stand. Ryan was already getting up, face twisted in rage, gripping his prod as he turned toward her. Bend! Cooper shouted, throwing himself up and backward at the same time Park bent over at the waist without question. Cooper landed on Park's back, using the momentum to swing his legs up a bit and then kicked out as hard as he could at Ryan's back, sending him stumbling toward the howdy door where Eli shoved his narrow, thumbless hand through a fence hole and stabbed Ryan in the shoulder with his claws. Ryan screamed, ripping off of Eli with a sick squelch, but still managed to hold on to the prod. He raised it over his head, bellowing, and Cooper tensed as he ran toward a wobbly-looking Alice as if he were about to beat her to death rather than electrocute her. A gunshot rang out and Ryan froze. Arms still in the air, face twisted in shock, there was a horrible clicking sound from deep inside his open throat, and a thin dribble of blood suddenly ran down his chin. Ryan collapsed to his knees, prod falling to the ground beside him. His eyes spun wildly, as if confused, and his gaze landed on the small window over their heads. For just one moment, as he stared, his pupils were obscured by the reflection of the full moon. Then Ryan collapsed forward with a thump. Nico Hirano walked toward them, out of the shadows of the long hall, gun still raised. Cooper immediately looked to Alice, who was still bent over unnaturally, face nowhere near human passing. Don't hurt her, Cooper said quickly. Please, I can explain. He cut off as Hirano hurried into the cage with them and gathered Alice in her arms just as she began to collapse. Shh, 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 Hirano murmured as Alice let out a low, gurgling howl. I've got you. I've got you now. It's okay. 
Do you try to close your mouth, Cooper? Eli said, still entangled with the fence, but somehow making it look like a chic 90s photo shoot and not the aftermath of a horrific near-death experience. You're losing heroic appeal at a speed heretofore unknown to man, and I'm not in the mood for any more long-winded explanations. Chapter 13 Dawn was breaking over the city by the time the scene was cleared. Their statements given, and Cooper and Park were free to go home. All Cooper wanted to do was crawl into bed with Park and spend the next 72 hours alternating between sleep and watching his living, healing fiancé breathe. But there were still a few loose threads to tie up. Cooper watched Gerano and her partner Alice cling to one another as they spoke to Cola about 30 feet away. Eli sat on a bench, knees pulled up to his chest next to Park, who was wrapped in a thick blanket. He was still suffering the effects of the toxin the most— but all three of them were working it naturally out of their systems and would be perfectly fine in a couple of hours. Fully functioning werewolves with no lasting damage. Physically, anyway. Abruptly, Alice pulled away from Hirano, who seemed reluctant to let her go, and walked toward him. Hello, he said when she stopped a couple feet away and rocked from foot to foot in silence. In many ways, it felt like the last few days had been leading to this moment, and he resisted the urge to add something theatrical like, ah, so we meet at last, while twirling his imaginary mustache. How are you feeling? Alice eyed him critically for a moment, then glanced back at Hirano, who was blatantly watching them over Cola's shoulder. Would you believe me if I said I've lived through worse? She said eventually. Cooper shrugged because, yeah, he would. Life was, if nothing else, unfair, and from what he knew, Eli and Alice's seemed harder than some. Worse than feeling human? He added lightly. Your brother doesn't seem to think that's possible. Alice huffed, as if amused despite herself. My brother's first word was a whine. She sobered quickly. I'm sorry your friend is dead. What could he say to that? He wasn't my friend. I wish I'd realized that a long time ago. Cooper sighed. Yeah. She drifted closer. Out of fur, she and Eli had little in common besides the color of their eyes. She seemed to be constantly in motion, shifting her weight from left to right, stepping closer and then back again, fidgeting and twisting in place like she was suddenly looking for unseen danger hinted at in the wind. Even her facial expressions were on high-speed rotation. Amusement, fear, sadness, suspicion, and more, all flitting across her features as if every minor, passing thought garnered a reaction and she had no practice or interest in hiding it. Is Miss Hirano all right? Cooper asked when Alice didn't seem inclined to say anything else. I will take care of Nico, she said firmly. Something like pride and satisfaction passed over her face. She's a powerful mate and has proven why I should have told her who James was the moment he was hired. Because she's armed? Cooper wondered, but instead asked, Why didn't you? Alice sighed. I thought I was protecting Nico. Really, I was protecting myself from having to tell the truth of my past. I have a lot of making up to do. Hours of begging, she added with a sly, predatory look. Hmm, Cooper said neutrally, because, okay, get it, felt like crossing a line. He could very easily picture this woman stumbling over an injured Hirano in the forests of the Yukon, perhaps fighting off the wolves that attacked her, nursing her back to health in some remote cabin, all while being rather blatantly and unapologetically inhuman herself. He could only imagine what that experience had been like for Hirano, though they clearly seemed to adore one another now. He glanced over at his own powerful mate, still swaddled in his blanket while quite obviously squabbling with Eli, and bit back a smile. To each their own. Nico told me she recognized the shepherd the day you and he found James, Alice said, interrupting Cooper's soft thoughts. When I found my Eli again, he'd shown us photos of his life with his northern pack and said the shepherd had taken a strange mate, but we had no idea... Who you really were. 
Strange mates. Cooper thought, amused, and made a note to bring that up with Eli later. I want you to know I won't tell. Excuse me? Cooper asked, confused and wondering if he'd missed something. I won't tell the WIP what you are. Of course, you're exactly who they've been looking for all these years. The one who will change packs as we know them and lead us to a new era. But if you don't want anyone to know yet... She shrugged. I owe you my life and will keep your secret. Oh, you mean because I'm supposed to be the... No. Cooper explained quickly. Uncomfortable. What Ryan Basque was saying in there about me being the the moon or whatever, none of that is actually true. His plan was just to use me as a scapegoat of sorts. Alice tilted her head in a very canine gesture. The human killer was a fool who thought he could play with powers he neither understood nor respected to make money, and was put down for his arrogance. Whatever his plan might have been is irrelevant. I felt the pull of the moon myself. Twice. Cooper felt a chill stiffen his spine. Whether from the contemptuous and slightly spooky way Alice spoke of Ryan, or the sudden unexpected steadiness of her gaze, he wasn't sure. Well, maybe so, but I didn't, you know, pull on you, he said finally. Alice huffed again. Call it what you will, but I felt the weight of your power in the room of carcasses when you took hold of my throat and then protected your mate. I felt it again right here in the zoo when I'd given up all hope of fighting off the poison in time. She extended her arms in front of her, and Cooper was surprised and a little enthralled by the inhuman shapes of her hands. Digits stubbed to the first knuckle, long black claws and no visible thumbs. We would have died if you hadn't pulled our wolves to waking. He shook his head tearing his eyes away from the way her finger bones were growing long like plants in search of sunlight. You saved yourselves, you and Eli's abilities, and Miss Hirano. All I did was kick the bastard while he was down. Alice scrunched her nose in perplexed-looking amusement, and Cooper could swear the whole damn thing moved a fraction down her face. When it smoothed again, she looked like a vaguely related but entirely different person. Your mate was so weak under the paralytic's hold, he couldn't slip on a banana peel. But your word still called forth his claws. Her lightly glowing eyes flicked pointedly to the blood on the back of Cooper's hand, and the long but shallow cut where Cooper had accidentally gouged him, a distinct crescent shape running directly under his wedding ring. You don't need to hide from me. Like I said, I will keep your secrets. I'm not. A squeaking, rattling sound broke the still dawn air, and Cooper looked toward the building they'd been caged in to see a stretcher with a full black body bag being wheeled out the front door, where the medical bay was, where he'd directed the agents to find Neil. Cooper's breath caught. He had the sudden urge to run over there and open the bag so he could see his ex's face one last time. Not because of any unrealized love or grief or closure, but because in a way he'd already begun to forget what Neil looked like. There were too many conflicting memories, too many secrets come to light that cast long, distorting shadows. Was the man in that bag the brilliant senior agent with the salt and pepper hair who had pulled Cooper into an empty hallway and hugged him tight when first assignment nerves made his body shake? Was it the lover, who'd traced cruel apologies on his wet skin more painful than anything they'd said or done while fighting? The mistake he kept making who'd found him in the Bureau's fourth-floor bathroom, fucked him in a stall, and made him promise not to leave. Not this time. Not again. The stranger who'd come looking for Cooper glimpsed him slipping down the rabbit hole, tried to follow, and lost his head. Ryan was right. Neil was perfect for manipulating. Newly isolated after losing the only job he'd had for 30 years, already full of resentful hatred and obsession, one man with all the data, the other able to look at the same horrifying room of pictures that Cooper had and see a business plan, an opportunity. Cooper would have liked to know what had nudged their paths together and got them talking about wolves, how Ryan had become aware of wolves in the first place, not from Neil, so he'd claimed, and in this Cooper was inclined to believe him. 
Ryan had said Neil was excited to meet someone who also believed. He'd also said this plan took months to put together. He'd started as soon as he became aware. In fact, a lot of things seemed to have fallen in place a few months ago. James's employment. The collaboration with Wild Nature. Literally too perfect. Those were the exact words Ryan had used, and Cooper agreed. He frowned, thinking, until a second stretcher and body bag emerged from the back of the building in that long hall of cages. He lied about the moon, Alice said distantly, watching Ryan's body being taken away. And the moon saw to it that he would not tell tales again. Cooper eyed her a tad uneasily. That did not sound like someone whom he was going to be able to convince was wrong about him. Alice seemed fascinating, but unnerving, too. He felt distinctly aware he knew very little about the WIP. When Cola had invited him into the trust, she'd said the agents wouldn't just be from the ruling packs anymore, but so far that hadn't seemed to pan out. The only WIP member he'd ever met was Daisy, and he'd rather foolishly been thinking of them in terms of human equivalents. Anarchists, perhaps, fighting for the dissolution of what was to Cooper's outsider eyes the more wolf-like traditions of packs and alphas. But mere minutes of conversation with Alice was starting to tell him that being less wolf-like than the packs didn't necessarily mean they were more human-acting either. It would be a mistake to think of werewolves as nothing more than a neat brew of both. His eyes found Park again. Eli mentioned you know Daisy Bedillion. Cooper said, hoping to move the conversation away from any more moon talk. Yes, we met the same time she lost her mate. She became something of a mother to me. He couldn't help but wince, which Alice clearly saw and could guess the direction of his thoughts. She worries about her children too, you know. But they're Park Pack. Daisy is WIP. Some relationships work best as a memory. Oliver isn't Park Pack. Cooper said quietly. He wasn't sure if this was overstepping or even the healthiest path to take, but God, would it really hurt to send one single email? There's nothing stopping her from contacting him. He wants her to contact him. But he's still a pack wolf, isn't he? She said impatiently, barely making it a question. Cooper frowned. He's... As opposed to what, I don't understand what you're saying. WIP, pack, rebels... Our world has always been divided into these three under one name or another. Or, that's how it's been until now, she added, giving Cooper a sudden contemplative look he didn't quite like. Oliver's a pack wolf, Cooper said firmly. It's what he wanted to be anyway, and Cooper would make sure he got it. Alice just shrugged. Many wolves have watched and waited to see what direction the shepherd would go on his own, unleashed. If they were to discover he was in contact with Daisy, many might assume he was WIP as well and consider his choice made. So what, she ignored him to keep him safe? Cooper asked skeptically. Or did she just think she was protecting him and was really protecting herself from telling the truth? He added, throwing Alice's own words back at her. Hmm... Alice eyed him. Perhaps I'll tell her that. Whatever her reason, she'll be relieved to hear her child has the protection of the moon now. I don't want Daisy to know that part, Cooper said hurriedly, and Alice grinned, flashing a mouthful of very animal-like teeth. As you wish, moon, she said primly. When he shot her a deeply annoyed look, Alice let out a sort of barking yelp of pure amusement and delight. As mercurial as the legends say, just remember this is not a secret you can hide forever. Wolves have watched the shepherd for years. Now they'll watch you. It is only a matter of time before they see it for themselves, and then... She shrugged. The WIP will answer your call whenever the moon chooses to rise. Don't wait by the phone, Cooper said. I'm a late riser. Perhaps drawn by the sound of Alice's laughter, Hirano extricated herself from Cola, and Cooper couldn't help but feel a bit relieved as she joined them. Everything all right? She asked, shooting him a wary look. 
Alice just buried her face in Hirano's shoulder and made a purring sort of rumble while Hirano's arm wrapped around her waist. We're fine, Cooper said hastily, just in case Alice was thinking of making any more astronomical observations. Are you okay? I'm... Hirano's voice wobbled, and her gaze moved quickly to where rays of pure sunlight had crested the horizon and pierced the red-leafed trees, as if she needed the excuse of staring into the light for the tears suddenly streaming down her face. It's like waking up from a nightmare, she whispered finally. If I'd known who he was that first day he started working here, I'd have killed him myself. Her voice broke for all its ferocious words. Cooper felt his eyebrows shoot up. Who? That bastard James Finnegan, Hirano said. So you really had no idea who he was before? He didn't blackmail you to get the job? Cooper asked, feeling Alice's intense, curious gaze fall on him. Hirano shook her head. The blackmail started later. He was recommended to me by an old colleague... I wish I'd never listened. Then he would never have found you again, never have blackmailed you, dragged you into this fucking mess, none of you. I brought all of this into our lives and almost lost my reason for living. Enough now, Alice said. You're being very egotistical and it's embarrassing. Hirano laughed wetly and pressed a kiss to the top of Alice's head. The way their bodies relaxed into each other sent a wave of longing through Cooper for his own favorite person. Excuse me, I should go check on... He waved in the general direction of Park and Eli. It was, um, interesting meeting you. Wait. Alice plucked a business card, seemingly from the air, and handed it to him. In case you ever want to leave the dark. Cooper took it, noting there was no name, just a phone number, and tucked it into his pocket. Right, thanks. As he walked away, he thought about what Alice had said. Not the completely off-the-wall parts about him actually being the moon and calling up their wolves with his will alone. He scratched idly at the cut on the back of his hand. But about Daisy and how wolves had watched to see what path the shepherd would choose. Watching and waiting. How Park had known this and chosen him anyway, along with all the limitations of acceptance, community, and pack that choice might bring. As he got closer to Park and to Eli, he caught a bit of their conversation. You can't sleep in the zoo again, Park was saying. That's not a long-term plan. It's not even a short-term plan. What's going on? Cooper asked, touching Park's shoulder, which leaned into his hand. Do you truly never grow weary of asking that? Eli asked. Eli has been sleeping here for weeks. He has no pack... No home, and no plan, Park said promptly. Cooper blinked. You can't go back to Helena, or become a pack with your sister? Both Park and Eli made faces, so Cooper had probably gotten that wrong somehow. Fair enough. He wouldn't necessarily choose to roomy up with either of those people for an indeterminate length of time either. Alice remains WIP, and I can't go back to Helena. What if she makes me choose? Rejoin the pack or build a relationship with my sister? Eli shook his head. No, I'll be fine. I'm not entirely incompetent, you know. No one's saying you are, Park said sharply. But how will you find a new pack you can trust with your secret? A shadow passed over Eli's eyes. After all this, he hissed, all this hurt I've brought myself... To my sister, to the two of you, I will never forgive myself as it is. But what I will not do is risk it happening again with someone new. I will just remain pack... packless. He shifted a bit, hugging his knees tighter. Perhaps some rebels will... Park snarled shockingly loud, but Eli didn't even flinch, just changed direction. Or maybe Alice can introduce me to some WIP, and if I find that untenable, I shall cast myself on Helena's mercy... Cooper frowned, disliking the sound of that. These three paths again. He rubbed the ring on his finger thoughtfully. A gesture Park didn't particularly understand himself. Would never have been inclined to make at all if not for Cooper's happiness. He took a deep breath. 
What about joining us? Eli and Park both looked at him with stupefied expressions. Er, join our pack, I meant, not join us for... He cleared his throat. <clears throat> I mean, we can do that, right? He confirmed, looking to Park. But his face still wasn't moving. It's not like you need to live with us or anything. You didn't live with Helena, just on the property, right? He realized how that sounded and, horrified, quickly added, Not that you'd live in the yard, I just meant, obviously you can live wherever you want. More silence. This had seemed a lot simpler in his head. Cooper got the feeling he was messing up massively and was honestly surprised Eli hadn't jumped in to tease him yet. But like Park, Eli just sat there, unmoving and wide-eyed. Look, all I'm trying to say is if you want a pack, you have one. Right? He asked Park, who finally seemed to shake himself out of a daze. Yes. Yes, of course. Park said, voice moving quickly from stunned to excited. Accept him, Eli. I would... I would love to share pack with you again. Please. Eli looked down, hiding his face, and was quiet for a long moment. When he looked up, his eyes were just a tad shiny, but he had his usual sardonic expression in place and tilted his chin challengingly. I suppose, given the fact that I have no other prospects whatsoever, it's either your little gang of misfits or a miserably lonely and dangerous existence on my own, never feeling safe enough to settle down again. He dipped his head back and forth, making a huge show of thinking about it. All right, I accept my alpha. Cooper blinked, feeling... odd, for some reason. As if something deep inside him had blazed hot and fast like a flare at Eli's words and quickly settled into a distracting buzz beneath his skin. Probably just sleep deprivation and a bad case of secondhand embarrassment because that was the most awkward phrasing he'd ever heard. Still, it was all worth it for the expression on Park's face. He was beaming. There was no other word for it. Overjoyed to have this conversation he craved as a wolf. This growing family. So the wolf world would be watching? Let them. Let them see this love. If anything made Cooper powerful enough to be feared, it was knowing he'd do anything to protect this. Great. He said, welcome aboard, I guess. Now what do I do? How quickly can you learn a short piece of choreography in three lines of Latin? Eli asked. It's already done, Park said. You asked, and he answered. We're pack now. With everything he had needed to get done, timelines to double-check and people to talk to, it was mid-afternoon when Cooper finally stood beside Cola observing Freeman through the double mirror. And you're sure about this? Cola asked. Pretty sure. You always know just what to say to set my mind at ease. Cola said wryly, but nodded him on. Cooper walked into the interrogation room, and any doubt disappeared the moment he saw the surprise flicker over Freeman's face. Good afternoon, Cooper said. I was told you chose not to call your lawyer. Are you still sure you don't want him here? Freeman rolled her shoulders. I don't see any reason why I should. All right. Just let me know any time if you change your mind, he said easily. I'm here to follow up on our conversation yesterday. Oh? She asked politely. Has something changed? No, Cooper said. Well, Ryan Basque was shot and killed last night. It turns out he was our murderer. Like you said, no living legends, no unearthly powers. The slippage was just the wolves reacting to a toxin that acts primarily as a paralytic when introduced to wolf cells. The Trust has a team trying to determine the exact formula as we speak. They have a much better shot now that we have samples. Freeman smiled thinly. What good news, she said. Yes, Cooper agreed. Really, he had quite a neat little plan going. It's truly incredible how many pieces just fell into his lap. This toxin, for example, which seems a bit beyond his capabilities to develop on his own, but also Neil Gerhardt with his convenient trove of information on me. J. 
James Finnegan and Arthur Crane, the ideal victims, needed to sell his myth. Me going to the zoo at all. Everyone just pulled into this perfect storm. The wolf world is very small and tends to flock together, she said, shrugging. You're a part of that world now. It was a simple statement, clearly not intended to mean much, but still it sent a wave of yes and this and home coursing through his body. Agent Dayton, Freeman said, watching him curiously. Is something wrong? Cooper traced the scab on his hand, then adjusted his ring, considering what came next very carefully. Sorry, I was thinking... You know, Ryan said something interesting last night, and I think it's quite relevant to our conversation now. The greatest discoveries come from the greatest mistakes. It struck me as familiar, but I couldn't remember why I recognized it until later. You said that to me once. It's hardly the most unique phrase in the world, she said dismissively. Very true, Cooper said. There's no proof of connection in a shared phrase or a bad feeling, but it did remind me of you. And then Miss Hirano said something interesting this morning about not knowing who James Finnegan was when she recommended he be hired. See, I would have just thought that was part of the blackmail, but apparently an old colleague of Hirano's had put his name forward when the wolfkeeper position opened up after an unexpected tragedy. He paused. You know Nico Hirano, right? Freeman shrugged, though an undercurrent of tension made the movement jerky and forced. We were in undergrad together a long time ago. Shared a lot of the same interests. He nodded. I heard you were quite close. She thanks you in her book, you know. Of course, you should really be thanked for your contributions to the zoo's video series. Now that, they really couldn't have done without your help. Genevieve was just telling me this morning how you were the one who came up with the idea to collaborate with the National Zoo, and how extra thoughtful it was to give her some names of consultants in the area. Consultants like my sister-in-law, Dr. Odell. I had no idea you knew Genevieve. I don't, Freeman said. But she and your late husband were very close. They used to work together years ago, right? The first time I met you two, I thought he looks like a commercial actor. What exactly are the charges here? Nepotism? So I made a few professional suggestions, Freeman said dismissively, looking bored. That's all. How was I to know what Ryan Basque would do? Because the whole thing was your idea from the start. Every move and every player, Cooper said evenly, and watched her eyes darken. You told him about wolves, set him up with everything he needed to know, then turned yourself in for a nice little alibi. And I did all this why, she asked, out of the generosity of my heart. More like a long-term investment, he said. You serve a year's time while Ryan develops his little business and then do a silent takeover on your release. The trust would still be blaming a dead man and you'd be making money hand over fist. Worst comes to worst, you rat Ryan out early in exchange for that deal you were so close to getting. With a new identity, a new life from the trust themselves, you can launch a business of your own. Either way, you're walking out of here with two things for sure. The trust off your back, and a whole case study of how your toxin works to play with and fine-tune. Freeman blinked at him owlishly. Don't you think that's a tad outlandish? Actually, I think it's brilliant, Cooper said. Sprinkle some revenge against me and everyone I love on top, and there's no possible scenario where you lose. How could you? Unless we were able to trace the toxin to you. The only thing you're guilty of is... Making a few suggestions. I'm sure if this were true, I would be pretty careful to make sure you couldn't trace the toxin back to me before turning myself in, Freeman said. She seemed amused now, like she was happy that Cooper knew. Mmm, I'm sure. It must have taken some trial and error to get the formula right. That's generally how all good science works, she agreed. Dead tissue samples would only get you so far. You'd need a living test subject. Naturally, you couldn't kill a werewolf. That would defeat the purpose of setting up this alibi. Naturally, she said. A wolf wolf, though. It's not perfect, but there might be enough similarities there. Enough to establish a baseline, anyway. 
Freeman's face abruptly turned cautious. Cooper took a deep breath and leaned forward. Did you know that every time an animal dies at the zoo, they collect tissue samples for long-term storage? We were able to pull up the samples from the three wolves who died there recently. Freeman froze, not breathing. He could practically see the wheels spinning behind her wide eyes, the slow, dawning realization that she had made a mistake, that it was over. I just heard from our lab, Cooper said softly. The toxin that killed them is an exact match for the one collected from James Finnegan and Arthur Crane. Ryan, she whispered. Ryan Bask didn't even work that exhibit. Besides, the wolves were barely sick before you got there. It was probably nothing more than what, some kind of viral infection? Tainted meat? But when Hirano called you in to consult, how could you resist such a perfect opportunity? Four live wolves in a controlled environment with all the equipment you needed to run an experiment. You were the only one allowed contact with them at your own insistence. Something about limiting stress and exposure, I think Hirano said. First, they even seemed to get better. My guess is you treated the original illness. Can't have unknown variables screwing with your results. Then their condition suddenly, rapidly deteriorated one after another. Three out of four dead, and you were the only person who could possibly have done it. You destroyed the keeper's note so that no one would doubt your findings. But James Finnegan still suspected something about that story was off, didn't he? That's why he was researching natural poisons before he died. He gave Freeman a moment to respond, but she didn't. Just kept shaking her head like she couldn't believe what was happening. Like it was a dream she could shake herself out of. Killing a zoo animal is a federal crime, you know, Cooper continued. But it's nothing compared to three counts of murder. People, this time. Though, to be fair, I don't know if it was your plan to kill Neil Gerhard or if that was solely Ryan improvising. He stood. Director Cola will be by in a couple of minutes to officially charge you. Your lawyer's already on his way. No, wait, Freeman said desperately. Fine, yes, I developed the toxin and tested it on the wolves, but that doesn't prove I knew what Ryan would do with it. That doesn't prove I was behind any of this at all. No, Cooper agreed. But confessing to the development of a biological weapon with the express purpose of targeting a specific group of people is a good start. Not to mention the fact you just implied you knew Ryan Basque had possession of said weapon and didn't report it. Those are going to be far heftier charges than accomplice. Freeman stared at him for one beat. Two. Then her face twisted in rage. They'll turn on you, you know, she spat. You might have stopped me, but the word is already out, or it will be soon enough. The three factions have been jostling for control for too long to let a potential source of power live peacefully. They'll fight over you like three starving dogs over a rabbit. If I get nothing else out of this other than the satisfaction of knowing that one day this stupid curse of a legend will rip you apart, then so be it. Cooper glanced at the viewing window briefly, then turned his back to it and stepped up to the edge of the table. Placing a hand on the cool metal, he leaned over close. And if I really am the moon... He quietly murmured. Would you still think threatening me was a good idea? Freeman blinked at him, confusion flickering in her eyes. A touch of fear, too. You are human, she said. You and I both know that's nonsense. There's no such thing. Maybe not for us, Cooper agreed. But you said it yourself. I'm part of their world now and I will do whatever it takes to protect what's mine as well as any other wolf who needs me. Whatever name you want to give it, that part is true. He straightened and backed away. Sorry I can't stay, he said in a normal volume, checking the time. The courts are closing soon, and I have some business that can't wait. Goodbye, Dr. Freeman. Cooper walked out of the room without looking back. On the other side of the door stood Park and Cola waiting with her arms crossed. Nice little confession you got, she said. I was worried for a minute in the beginning, but all's well that ends well. Thanks, Cooper said dryly. What did you whisper to her at the end, though? We couldn't hear. Just talking long-term plans. 
he said easily. Cute, Cola said. But I said we couldn't hear you. We heard her threats crystal clear. Then you know she was implying you have a leak. Yes. Cola shifted her weight, then sighed slightly. I will do everything I can to clean house and keep the details of this case need to know. You have my word on that, but... But it's only a matter of time, yeah, so I've heard, Cooper said. Most of his fellow agents belonged to ruling packs and had obligations outside of the trust. Maybe all of them besides Cooper and Park. That needed to change. But it was a job for another day. And what about the other leak? He continued. Freeman couldn't have pulled this off without a hell of a lot of wolf information, science, lore, and politics for a human who supposedly can't comprehend your existence without a wolf hand to hold. Cola's expression darkened. We will be checking Dr. Freeman's hands and whose she's been holding. Thoroughly. Rebels, ruling packs, WIP. We've always been at odds on everything but this. Park agreed. If there's a traitor sharing our secrets, hoping to expose us, they must know it won't end well. Three can keep a secret if two of them are dead, Cooper thought. Ryan's intended star victims, James Finnegan, Arthur Crane, and the Shepherd, each of them infamously connected to the Rebels, WIP, and the Ruling Pact, respectively. Maybe exposure isn't the end goal, he thought out loud. Freeman certainly wasn't, not anymore. She wanted a get-out-of-jail-free card, Park said. And to develop and test a weapon to use against wolves, Cooper said. And for the rumor of the moon to get out and ignite the simmering tension between the three factions. Cola and Park both looked disturbed at that. You think a rebel or WIP wolf intentionally shared secrets? Park asked. Or a ruling pack? Cooper said. Your uncle had hopes for that once. Let's not forget where Freeman got those biological samples. Marcus was delusional, Park said flatly. Whatever noble reasons he told himself he was doing it for, at the end of the day he just wanted to take over the Park Pack. He wanted power. The ruling packs have power already. They don't need to ignite war between the factions to get it. There won't be any ignition, Cola said firmly. The trust will make sure of it. We'll find Freeman's source and determine if they're simply a fool or if there really was the intention of unsettling the balance between the three. Even if the source turns out to be a ruling pack? Cooper couldn't help but push. Even then, Cola said, The trust isn't the ruling pack's personal guard. Does Helena know that? Do you? Because when I became an agent, that wasn't what I signed up to do, Cooper warned. And it never will be. Cola narrowed her eyes at him, and then glanced briefly at Park, who had gone very still and watchful. I see. All right, Dayton, you've made your point. I can let Helena know we need to... Lockdown information pathways. Security concerns, but I can't stop every agent in the trust from reporting back to their own packs. No, but it's a start, Cooper said. Thank you. She nodded at him. He wasn't sure if he could 100% trust Cola, but if the trust was ever going to be the impartial resource wolves could turn to outside the three factions, they'd need her on their side. Cooper wanted her on their side. He respected Cola. Liked her a hell of a lot, too. But tradition and long-standing loyalties were old and rusty bonds to break. Only time would tell. Cola's phone buzzed and she checked it. Lawyer's here, she said. I'm off to collect him. You two better leave if you're going to make that appointment. Appointment? Park asked. But Cola was already bustling out of the room, holding her phone to her ear, speaking in hushed tones. He turned to Cooper. Does this have anything to do with your mysterious business at court? Don't tell me you've taken on another freelance case already. I think I'll have my hands full reconstituting the trust, Cooper said. No more freelance cases for a while, I hope. 
On that, we can agree, Fark said with a smile. Speaking of, I couldn't help but notice you're having a productive day, building a pack for me, finding a way to shield me from my grandmother. Oh, well, Cooper said. I want to make sure I come up to snuff at our next power couple check-in. How am I doing? Park's smile cracked into a sharp-toothed grin. Wonderfully. I haven't felt this optimistic in years, aside from the whole being on the brink of a civil war thing, of course. It was true. Park did look refreshed and joyful despite a long few days by anyone's definition. The paralytic was completely processed out of his body. He was back to his old werewolf self and couldn't seem to stop playing. Slipping his claws, eyes, teeth, scenting the air every five minutes, bouncing up onto the balls of his feet. Like he was so happy to be... him. More in love with himself and appreciative of who he was than Cooper had ever seen him. What about you? Park asked. You're spoiling me and I'm slacking. What do you want most in the world? I'll fetch it. Marry me, Cooper said. Please. Park laughed. Haven't we done this bit already? I mean, right now. Let's go get married. We can walk right into the courthouse. You can self-officiate in D.C., I checked. Are you serious? Park asked. We did all the wedding things already. We put on fancy suits, slow danced, fed each other's sweets. My dad almost made me cry. My brother saw your butt. We were drugged and kidnapped, Park added. Shackled together in the face of death. So get shackled to me again, metaphorically this time, Cooper frowned. That sounded more romantic in my head. I worry about your head, Park said frankly. Cooper held out his hand and Park took it. I've been so anxious about getting this wedding right, of representing humanity somehow. But that's not my world anymore, and I'm not that person. I'm your person. Park squeezed his hand and rubbed his thumb on the ring. I'm your wolf. Obviously, Cooper said. That's all that matters to me. We did want a fall wedding, Park said, and his face lit up with a mischievous smile. All right, then. Elope me, you brute. Are we telling anyone, or does your horse and carriage only fit two for speed's sake in the face of pursuit? I told Eli, as his first duty, as second in line to the Alpha, he put himself in charge of some kind of surprise party you absolutely didn't hear about from me. Also, he said to tell you you've been demoted to fourth rank. We don't do ranks, Park protested. We are not pirates. Then, fourth? Boogie took third already. You snooze, you lose. Cooper reached up and touched the ring under Park's shirt. Anyway, the party's not till later. I kinda thought this bit at the courthouse could just be us. Park's eyes flared gold. This bit. Any bit. Every bit, he said. I'm always happy to be an us with you. Cooper smiled and pressed a sweet kiss to Park's lips. In that case, it shouldn't be too hard to always be happy. Epilogue Just as any other task that involves bureaucratic paperwork, getting married was tedious, full of hoops to jump through and vaguely anticlimactic. It also made Cooper so utterly and effervescently happy, he felt like someone could stick a pin in him and he'd explode into light, glowing, weightless, unstoppable. Even self-officiating, they still had to leave the building and sign the document off courthouse property. It was windy out, and as they stood by one of D.C.'s many fountains, Faint mists of water blew over them in waves, Park's dark hair gradually collecting a silver sheen. Consider it of you to give me a preview of your graceful old age before I commit, Cooper said, reaching up and running a hand through the wet strands. 
I think I'm looking forward to your silver fox stage. Fox, Park grumbled, looking vaguely put out. Cooper laughed. Big, majestic, silver wolf stage then. Either or, I'm suddenly feeling very lucky I'll get to see it someday. Park's lips twitched into a slightly smug smile. Lucky you'll see me old, hmm? Yeah, well. Cooper mumbled and tugged gently on the hair over Park's temple where he knew biannual gray hairs were being plucked out. Someday, alarmingly soon, by the looks of things here. Park's smile only deepened, and he practically vibrated satisfaction. Do you realize the more tender a truth you think you've revealed, the more biting you become immediately after? Cooper snapped his teeth a couple of times pointedly, and Park laughed, dodged, and kissed him on the nose. I'm feeling very lucky I get to spend the rest of my life with you too, my porcupine, he whispered, and that was, well, that was okay then. They were so accustomed to the fountain mist that neither noticed when it first started to drizzle until the sky fully opened up and released an aggressive downpour. Park quickly tucked the papers under his jacket as they ran for the courthouse, laughing at nothing and everything. Somewhere within the chaos, they filed with the clerk, collected their certificate, and drove home to a small handful of people already drinking their alcohol. In the blur of congratulations, clamoring noise, and far too much attention, Cooper couldn't help wishing he and Park were back in the rain, again, just the two of them. Or hell, who was he kidding, upstairs in bed, fucking until the adrenaline and joy that were the only things keeping them upright well and truly sputtered out. But they had their whole lives to be selfishly, blissfully alone together. And despite feeling overwhelmed, Cooper was warmed, too. That people had bothered to arrive on bewilderingly short notice. Eli's charm at work, no doubt. He'd even somehow managed to gather all of Park's siblings into one video call, and the echoing laughter and soft, surprised pleasure on Park's face as they teased him were perhaps Cooper's second favorite part of the day. Santiago was there and got along like a house on fire with Sophie. Cola had brought her partner, an alarmingly hot but surprisingly goofy man, as well as three children Cooper hadn't even known she had. Eli had introduced himself to Ed as Park and Cooper's new live-in boy Friday, which would doubtless lead to an intensely awkward conversation later, but Cooper couldn't even find it in himself to be annoyed. Not today. Not when Eli had also accepted Cooper's embarrassed request to invite Boogie's old sitter Ava without blinking, and then seamlessly got her and her parents comfortably chatting with Kayla and Dean. After a couple of hours, Cooper escaped outside to the covered front porch just to get a few moments' peace. Bent over, forearms propped on the railing, he watched the steady sheets of rain pull bright, twirling leaves to the ground and wondered if it was dangerous to feel so content. It was astonishing how much his life had changed in so short a time. Where would he be a year from now? More. The thought should have been frightening. His entire life had drastically changed over a matter of months. It could drastically change again. But Cooper couldn't summon up the slightest sliver of anxiety. At this moment, on this day, it was frankly too difficult to imagine Park out of his life and every scenario with him in it too manageable. Cooper looked at the ring in his hand, ran a finger over its smooth surface. Married. Him. How ridiculous. He felt... not changed, but like he'd been seen, understood, and then cherished all the more for it, which had something of a transformative effect in itself. Behind him, the front door opened, and to his surprise, Eli slipped out onto the porch and propped his hip jauntily on the railing beside Cooper. Unless you're hiding yourself here to build suspense for a surprise musical number, this is shameful host of the party behavior. Aren't you the host of the party? Cooper asked. I'm the life of the party, Eli corrected. And never has the phrase last men alive been more apt. What are you doing outside? Hiding, 
Cooper agreed, not sure he could explain the way his emotions felt too large to fit inside his own skin. Never mind, a house already full of people. I'm worried my father is going to see me and feel inspired to give a speech. Oh, he's already informed us all he's forbidden from doing so, Eli said cheerfully. A charming little prepared monologue delivered seven different times to five different people, on the other hand. Christ, why? Cooper groaned, face in his hands. I was one of the lucky ones to be twice blessed, so I've got the good bits memorized if you want to hear. Actually, Eli cocked his head, squinting. I think I hear him going round eight with the park pack right now. Cursing, Cooper started to straighten up, but Eli stopped him with a hand on his arm. Leave it, he's fine. I'm certain they like your father more than they do you, anyway. Don't you hate it when everyone tries to flatter you on your special day? Cooper said dryly, but relaxed back over the railing. Eli just shrugged and rolled in place so that he was mimicking Cooper's pose. Don't take it personally. They're too tight-knit to bother caring much for anyone outside the family who takes up more time than a short-term acquaintance. Eli's casual tone was at odds with his tense posture, and Cooper remembered that up until a couple weeks ago, these people had been his pack. For years. Not anymore. Maybe never again. And yet still, he had called them in as a wedding gift. For his ex. Cooper hesitated, not sure what to do or say, but definitely feeling like he was supposed to do or say something. Inviting Eli into the pack had seemed like an excellent idea for Park's sake. An immediate solution to Eli's problems, too. What Cooper hadn't fully considered was what came next. Particularly now, when there was a very good chance of trouble on the horizon and Eli didn't know what he'd agreed to get involved in. Listen, about the whole, um moon thing there's something you should know oh are we doing a post case wrap-up eli said politely and here's me in the malt shop without a strawberry shake there might be some shit coming between the three factions soon cooper said freeman got her information from somewhere she just knows too much neil might neil did too he was a brilliant investigative agent but still to have gotten my AQ test that I ripped up back in Maudit Falls? To even have known to look for it? He realized maybe Eli didn't know about his AQ and glanced at him out of the corner of his eye. But Eli just looked thoughtful. So, clearly, a wolf, or wolves, plural, is involved. One of the factions feeding our secrets to humans to create unrest between the three, and because you... Attract problems like a light does moths, you'll doubtlessly be in the thick of it, I see. Cola is sure it's the Rebels or WIP, which doesn't surprise me, but Park agrees. He doesn't believe it can have come from one of the ruling packs, even after the thing with his uncle. Eli snorted. <laughs> no, well, he wouldn't. He's a pack wolf. But you're not convinced, Cooper noted, curious. And aren't you a pack wolf, too? Oh, yes, sir, Eli said, saluting him and bit his lip provocatively. Your pack wolf reporting for duty, sir. Seriously, though, I mean, you're acting like there's actually inherent differences here. Cooper paused suddenly, alarmed. Are there? Eli laughed. <laughs> Thank goodness I'll never fall in love with a human. It seems as exhausting as raising a child. No, we're not different at a biological level. But pack wolves don't see the other factions as anything but agents of chaos in the case of the WIP and violent outcasts in the case of the rebels. In their minds, these discontent fringes would do anything to get their hands on the power the ruling packs have. What Ollie doesn't understand, could never understand, is we weren't discontent. Being in the Rebel Pack appealed to a need I had. He despises everything about Rebels because of what happened to me in that specific pack. He could never understand why I don't hate them as much as he does. Not a great limitation for the soon-to-be owner of a shelter for Rebels to have, 
Cooper thought and then stopped, struck by a realization. Two soon-to-be owners, plural, because Cooper would also be responsible for the shelter and he faced the same limitation as Park. He too was genuinely shocked and confused as to why Eli didn't hate rebels after everything he'd been through. Because of course, Cooper thought of rebels and WIP the same way Eli had described the ruling packs. Discontent, violent outcasts. The same way as Park did. How could he not when Park was the source of 99% of what he knew about wolves? It was strange realizing just how much his understanding of this world was filtered through Park's eyes. How perhaps that might change now. How perhaps that was a healthy thing, and Eli's presence wasn't just good for Park, but for all three of them. Where will you go after this? Cooper asked, an idea beginning to take shape. Kicking me out already? Of course not. You are welcome to stay with us as long as you want. He reached out and tapped Eli's forearm and got an expectedly judgmental look back. I just meant, what do you want to do next? Oh, diminish, maybe. Go into the West. Might remain Galadriel if I'm really feeling freaky, you know. Or you could develop. Go south, check out this sanctuary for rebel wolves we're starting. No pressure, of course. He added hastily. But if you want to, I'm sure we'd both be grateful for your expertise. You understand, Rebels. You can appreciate this need you mentioned, and you won't push them into joining a ruling pack or whatever as if that's their only option. Eli's eyebrows were arched about as high as they could go. Or maybe not, considering what he could do with his eyebrows. Is it not their only option? You'd encourage them to remain rebels or become WIP? You're the one telling me neither deserve such a bad rep, so if that's true, why not? Why not indeed? Eli murmured, watching him. Alice is right. The WIP is going to love you. Cooper frowned. Why did she say that? I was listening to your conversation with her earlier, Eli said without a lick of shame. Trust me, it was implied. Yeah, Cooper said, eyeing his slightly pointy-looking ears. Maud it falls or not, we're going to have to settle on separate living arrangements ASAP. Afraid I'll eavesdrop in your sex life? Don't be. I'm full to the brim of Ollie's cooties already. And to think of the best man speech we could have had. What a missed opportunity. My point is... Eli continued. The moon has always been a sort of messiah figure for the WIP. They'll do whatever it takes to steal you from pack wolves and align with them instead. I'm not aligned with pack wolves, Cooper said. Eli flinched oddly. You're claiming territory. You're alpha to two pack wolves. And we're opening a sanctuary for rebel wolves, Cooper countered. And I'm going to get Park some goddamn closure with his WIP mom if it kills me, and he and I work for the Trust, which is supposed to be outside of it all. But it's not. But it can be, Cooper said. It will be. It has to. Eli studied him. Does Ollie know you have these radical inclinations? Cooper snorted. <laughs> Please. I'm too self-involved to be anything of the sort. I just don't want to pick a team. Eli ran his tongue over his teeth, like he was going to disagree, then shrugged and looked out at the yard and tree line beyond. You know, before they organized themselves as the Wolf Independence Party, WIP wolves were merely known as independents. All right, Cooper said slowly, watching Eli watch the rain. And before they modernized themselves, the independents were known as lone wolves. He glanced briefly at Cooper. You can see why Alice might think you belong with them. Cooper thought about that. God save him from the stubbornly blank-faced cryptic wolves in his life. When I said I wasn't aligned to anyone, I meant the three factions. I'm very much aligned with Oliver. And now with you, too. I promise. But 
by your own conjecture, we're entering uncertain times, Eli said. So let's not make promises we can't keep, hmm? You're a human who signed up for a lover and got a werewolf pack instead. If you find this arrangement a bit too much and it becomes necessary to part ways, I only ask for a little warning. I'd become a bit too complacent in the park pack. When I found myself suddenly facing life without them... His jaw worked for a moment. I don't ever want to be that helpless again. Cooper took a breath. There was a lot he wanted to say, but Eli was right. Promises were for children. Fair enough, if you let me know the same. You signed up for an alpha, not this moon nonsense. If it gets too much and you want to go back to the parks or the rebels or wherever, I'll help you talk to Oliver about it. Eli's expression softened to something almost grateful. Thank you, Whippet. Of course. Cooper paused. He'd only ever been introduced to him as Eli Park. Er, uh, do you still want to keep that last name? Eli shook his head. I couldn't, even if I wanted to. I have no claim to it. Do you want to use my name? Cooper asked haltingly. Eli snorted. As you plant the first seeds of sedition amongst the oldest institutions of our kind with an enormous moon-shaped target on your back, no thank you. I'll just take up the name I had before the parks. He tipped a non-existent hat. Elias Smith at your service. Elias Smith? Cooper repeated incredulously. Was Alias Smith already taken, or is that your attempt at subtlety? As he spoke, another thought came to mind. Wait, Alice Smith. They're both pseudonyms, aren't they? The same pseudonyms, no less. Eli was watching him, amused. If so, we'd fit right in. It seems to be all the rage around here. His lips twitched into a sharp little smile. The moon and the shepherd. Has a nice ring to it, actually. The moon and the shepherd went to sea in a beautiful pea-green boat. They took some honey. Eli elbowed Cooper with a wink. And plenty of money. <laughs> God, you're insufferable. On the contrary, people suffer me often, Eli said. A strange look passed over his face. There and gone again before Cooper deciphered it. But considering the three days they'd both just had, he could guess. Fuck it, Cooper thought, and brusquely leaned into Eli, pressing their shoulders and hips together. He felt Eli stiffen and almost pulled away. An apology already poised on his lips when suddenly Eli sagged back against Cooper like his strings were cut, head hanging low. Cooper grunted at the abrupt weight but braced himself and stayed unmoving. He could see the back of Eli's neck like this. Soft, pale, and vulnerable. And wondered what he was supposed to do now. If it was Park, he'd kiss it, but it was easier to comfort a sexual partner. Eli clearly needed something else. Wet wind lifted his hair, and Cooper glimpsed paler, shinier skin on his neck. A very old scar, silvery and slippery like the inside of a seashell, before Eli picked his head back up and cleared his throat. Ollie's here. We can't let him catch us making passionate love. The front door opened, and Park joined them mid-eye roll which meant he was perfectly synchronized with Cooper, busy doing the same. Of course you're both out here. You are the two most unsociable, undomesticated, Park muttered. Did you know the cat is being more cordial than either of you right now? And I know for a fact she was raised in an alley. My poor, tortured beauty, I'll rescue her from the perils of conversation post-haste, which reminds me, we'll have to come up with a visitation schedule, of course. Eli straightened and stretched leisurely, setting off a number of clacking sounds from the region of his spine. God knows I can't leave her with you two all year round. Leave her? Park asked, sounding suddenly nervous. Where are you going? To run your revolutionary resort, of course. Keep up, Ollie. Really? Oh, that's... Park's voice choked up a bit, and Eli sauntered toward him. 
out of Cooper's sight. Cooper twisted his head subtly so that he could peek behind him without fully turning around. Eli and Park weren't touching with their hands. But as Cooper watched, they sort of bumped into each other as if passing in a crowded hallway, and then Park knocked the side of his face against Eli's a couple times before they separated, as if nothing at all had happened. Cooper hurriedly looked away and stared out at the rain before he was caught staring. Don't celebrate too loudly, you two, Eli said. You have fifteen minutes before I send your delightfully stammering brother out to fetch you, and I'm not responsible for what he sees. He started to sing the last verse of that same silly Lear poem and headed back inside. Park joined Cooper on the railing. Thank you, he said after a moment. For Eli, I'm just... Thank you. Hmm. Happy? Cooper asked. Completely. Entirely. Utterly. Good. Cooper said, pleased. I want you to teach me how to touch like that. Like you and Eli do. Park looked at him, startled, then back at the empty porch where he just stood. What? We warned that wasn't... Cooper flapped his hand to stop him. I know. I'm saying I want to understand how to touch like wolves. Park's eyebrows shot up. I know you and I don't talk about it much, and if you really don't want me to do that with you, of course I won't. But I have to think about what Eli needs now, too. So I am asking you to teach me. Talk to me about wolves. I want to know. Park studied him. Head tilted and face blank with just a hint of something tentative and possibly yearning in his eyes. Very well, he said seriously. Your first lesson starts now. What do you... Park abruptly draped his body over Cooper's, heavy and encompassing over his back, the immediate warmth of it wonderful in the cool, wet air. Cooper snuggled tighter into the crook of his arm, purposefully dragging his ass back and forth over Park's crotch and heard him exhale sharply. Park gripped one of Cooper's hips, forcing him to be still, and then, after a moment's hesitation, sharply nipped the back of his neck. Ow! Cooper said, though it didn't hurt so much as send a pulse of, oh, that's interesting, straight through his balls. Stop squirming like a tart when I can't fuck you, Park said, which really just made matters worse, and they wrestled a bit until, laughed out and lazy, Cooper collapsed over the railing again. Park still on his back, the big lug. They stood like that, listening to the rain and the distant sounds of laughter inside the house for a while. Hey, Cooper realized suddenly. What about those vows you said you wrote? What about them? Well, are you saving them for your second husband, or do you think maybe I get to hear? Cooper said sarcastically and felt Park's amusement rumble against him. All right, give me a moment, he said, rubbing his nose back and forth in Cooper's hair at the back of his skull and inhaling deeply. Let's see. First there's your toes. Eight of them aren't too weird. What's next? Your Cooper kicked him in the ankle and Park spun him around so that they were face to face, pressed against the railing. You love me. Cooper blinked. What? I'm doing my vows now. For real. You love me. Isn't that backward? You already know I love you, Park said, shaking his head impatiently. So, today I promise, I vow that I know you love me too. I never doubt it. How could I when I feel it all the time? I feel it when you make me laugh, and then watch with that pleased little look on your face. I feel it when you touch me like I'm special, and when you can't touch me anymore because you're over full of sensations. But let me stay by you anyway. I feel so safe in loving you, because I know you love me too, and it's the greatest gift of my life. 
You love me, Cooper said. Obviously. And it was, wasn't it? Park pulled Cooper closer, arms around his waist. So, if you're the moon, fine. I'm the sky. If you're a human, I'm your wolf. If you're a prickly, sarcastic, awkward, independent, randy as hell, secretly good-hearted porcupine, well, then I'm Oliver Park. I can't believe I'm being slandered in my own vows. Whatever happens next, whoever we are or whoever they think we are, it doesn't matter. Because the way we love is already the stuff of legends. Cooper couldn't help smiling. Well, I guess if you say it like that, it doesn't sound like such a bad life, he said, leaning in to kiss him, and felt Park's body sigh into his like it was coming home. No. Not a bad life at all. This concludes Cry Wolf by Charlie Atara, narrated by Eric Bloomquist. Copyright 2021 by Charlie Atara. This unabridged audiobook is published by arrangement with Harlequin Books S.A. and was produced in the year 2021 by Tantor Media Incorporated, a division of recorded books which holds the copyright thereto. Please visit Tantor.com for more information on our growing library of unabridged audiobooks. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program. Thank mm-hmm. you.